Uh, first person of the day, Tata is with my family. I just take on the O. Is with my family, Junior. I stick on the stand. Good morning. Good morning. We'd like to welcome you to this public session of the TROC's hearings. And also at the same time, thank you for honoring our invitation to come. These hearings are intended to share light on our experiences of the past as well as to give the labyrinth people the TRC process the benefit of the perspectives of the witness. You have been active during our public life, in our public life during the period of 79 up to 2003 and even probably in years preceding 1979. As a politician and activist, the Commission felt that your contribution would be useful to our process of truth-telling, national reconciliation, and healing. Going out of the Accra Peace Agreement, librarians have agreed that the TRC process is a way forward to understanding the past and then laying the foundation for the future. It is against this background, sir, that you have been invited by the TRC and you are here today. Again, we say thanks for honoring the invitation of the Commission to come. I will use this time to introduce commissioners to you who are present. Following which, following which you will say a little of yourself before going into the substance of your presentation. You may choose to remain seated. Yes, my dear man. You may choose to remain seated or you can stand and use the podium right at your right. On our right is Commissioner Umu Sila, that is at your left. Commissioner Per Brambu, Commissioner Dede Donofe, and to my left, Commissioner Massa de Washington, Commissioner John Stewart, and Commissioner Gerald Coleman. I'm Jerome Wadier. Welcome again, Mr. Witness, this audience. I thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, it is indeed a, a privilege for me to sit before you for the simple fact that uh, I'm one of those who have never thought it expedient to whitewash my role in history. And I'm very happy that I have the opportunity today to explain to, of course, the Liberian people, to your commission, my participation in the unfolding events in this country from 1979 to 2003. But first, uh, a brief introduction of myself. I'm Boy Mafambule, H. Boy Mafambule Jr. Uh, my paternal grandfather is Imam Kemutifa of Grand Kikma County. My father, Abdurrahman uh, Boyma Fambule, who was later named Henry Boyma Fambule by the Episcopal uh, Church. Uh, my uh, father's people are Muslims, and a little prayer before I begin. Uh, Bismillah Rahman Rahim. On the other side, my great grandfather from Kabbalah, Grand, uh, Maryland County. Thomas Gabla Brownell, my grandfather, Natissier Brownell, former Solicitor General of Liberia, former Postmaster General, former Ambassador to Spain, my mother, Miro Brownell Fambule, after her divorce from my father, Miro Brownell. 
I was educated in Sierra Leone, in Kenya, and in the United States, lived for some time in England and in the United States of America. I want to begin with my first understanding of the political realities of this country. And you bear with me, it goes back a long time, to the year 1955. I was only six years old then. I knew that my grandfather, the late Netesia Brownell, had contested the elections with uh, former President Edwin Barclay. My grandfather was a vice presidential candidate. As a young man, I knew there was uh, anxiety around the house because my grandfather was involved. What happened subsequently was that the election's results were declared and about 48 to 72 hours I realized that my mother was crying because the news had come that my grandfather had been arrested. Not only arrested, but I learned that he had been taken through the streets of Morovia in his underclothes. And I remember vividly standing at my grandmother's window right on Lane Street there was a woman who was being led to the central prison by three, three hefty soldiers with guns on the shoulder. And this woman was walking so majestically with so much dignity that as a young boy, I could not help but admire her. I realized later on that she was the daughter or the niece of Edwin Barclay. And subsequently we heard news about the, the killing of... David Coma and his son, my grandfather of course was uh, in prison, but something that stuck in my young mind was the reaction of my father. He was then a lawyer, practicing in the law firm of uh, Beslo and Momolu Kopa, right where the Unity Party has its headquarters now. They had a little shack there as an office. And my father dashed home, took off his jacket, and took a little pistol, I remember. And my grandmother said, where are you going? He said, they're arresting our people. I realized he was a sympathizer of Barclay. He said, they're arresting our people, but we will not go down with our fight. I was only six years old. And I had great admiration for this man who was willing to live by his conviction. And I grew up in a household very religious on one side, but also very political. And I started attending school at the CDB King's Morning School. And my first introduction to partisan politics came in 1961 with the death of Patrick Lumumba. In 1960, young Lumumba had visited Liberia as a guest of Tupman. And why he was here, a lot of our people were fascinated by this young nationalist, only 34 years old, looked so dynamic, who had come talking about nationalism. And I remember people in my household were fascinated by Lumumba. But then in 1961, on my way from school, the City of King Morning School, I stopped by the barber shop, and the radio was on, and the announcement came over the air that Lumumba had been assassinated. I was a very young man, and I ran home, ran home, confused and perplexed that this noble African who had visited our territory had been assassinated. And I remember saying, when I got home, that they have killed Lumumba. And a relative of mine said, what does it matter? He was a communist. For the first time I heard the word communist as a young man. He was a communist. I did not draw the parallel that it was necessary to kill people simply because they were communists. It was in this mood that I went to Freetown with my father as a young man, attending school, but very, very privileged to have a father who had books in his library, magazines, and I decided to read. I read Nkrumah, a bit of Nkrumah. 
was very interested in the Ghanaian process. And as a very young man at the Arab Academy, Nkrumah visited Sierra Leone. And three of us, young students, junior students, a young man called Burris for Williams, another man from the Gambia called Abubakar C, and myself decided to go and see Nkrumah. We went to the parliament in Sierra Leone, and for the first time I saw Osaji for Dr. Kwame Nkrumah. We were privileged as young men to walk right behind Nkrumah, and I remember him with a flannel trousers, a sandals. And just before we got into the parliament, we were stopped. And we went back on campus hailing the fact that we had seen Nkrumah. And I became much more interested in reading about Nkrumah. Who this man was, what he represented. And I remember the dynamism with which he spoke in Sierra Leone. I saw the difference between this noble Africa, talking about the liberation of his people, and about the fight of the black man for recognition within the world society. I was 14 years old, and from then on I became a convinced Nkrumanist. A convinced Nkrumanist. I remain a convinced Nkrumanist. I believe in his philosophy of Pan-Africanism, his philosophy of the African personality, and his concept of a strong and united Africa. I went to school in Sierra Leone, traveled with my father to Kenya, just after independence. Somebody wrote that at the school in uh, Kenya, I was expelled, but he didn't explain the circumstances. As a young man of 15, 16 years old, I was already an Okromanist. And I went to a school which was predominantly white, with a sprinkling of blacks and Indians. And I was insulted by one of the white prefects. And I said to him, but you don't address me in this way. And he said to me, I can address you whichever way I want, and you keep quiet. And I said, well, the next time you say it, I'm going to insult you too. And I was taken to the headmaster. And the headmaster said to me, you come from West Africa, you are not used to this treatment. But this is the way we operate. And so I will call your father. My father came to the school, and they said to him, your son is privileged to be here. A couple of years ago, blacks did not come to the school. And I said to my father, but this is not a school, this is a racist pen. And my father said, you know, you have to leave this place, because these people will never forgive you. You must go. And they said, well, we call you here to let you know that your son can no more be on this campus. He's a bad influence on the students, because I was introducing them to the works of Nkrumah, towards colonial freedom, etc., etc., and we're discussing these issues. So I was expelled and I had to go back to Sierra Leone. In Sierra Leone, of course, I then tried to purify my, my, my politics, to understand history. And I became, of course, uh, enthused by what was happening in Africa and in the third world. At my school, I became, by some circumstances, the distributor of books from uh, Indochina, from China after the revolution, and I had this joke. I would go down to the primary school and distribute the little rare book of Shema Mao Zedong. I said I wanted to turn the young people into red guards. This didn't go down well with the authorities. This, they asked the post office to stop sending these books. And I remember quite vividly preparing for my final examination in 1968. When I had become extremely politically conscious, very sensitive to injustice. Because in my class, in the final year, there was a child from an extremely poor home, and I still remember his name, Ekunda Yoko, extremely smart, very brilliant, in physics, math, chemistry, and biology. But this guy in the final year came to school without shoes. And there was a day when the principal came into the classroom and asked us, all those who have paid the school fees stand. We all stood except Akunda Yoko. He was trembling. 
And the headmaster gave him about ten lunches. And the tears came to my eyes and I said afterwards, but what system is this where a man is beaten because his brother who works as a liberal cannot pay his school fees? And from then on I said to Akundayo, you can have my food. I'm on the boarding school. You can have my food every day. I got money. I can buy lunch. We became very friendly. By 1968, of course I had gone to the classics, understood the dynamics of liberation in Africa, understood the politics of classes and struggles. Two weeks before my final examination, I got up this morning and I noticed there's, there was a square, there is, if you like, distance uh, movement for me by people. Everybody seemed to be staring at me, but nobody could say what, what it was. I didn't take any heed. I felt that students were just very nervous because the seniors were going to take their final examination. I got a call from the principal's office. He wanted to see me. And I said to myself, what have I done again? And I walked into the office of Mr. Biller. He said to me, and how are your preparations for the exam? I said, well, I'm on top of it. I've been studying very hard. He said, so what do you hope to do after a year? I said, I want to go to the university. He said, are you certain that nothing will disturb you in your preparations for the exam? I said, no, sir, nothing will disturb me. He said, well, I just want to tell you there's a very sad story. He said, your father has been arrested. My father was then the Liberian ambassador to East Africa, based in Kenya. I said, I beg your pardon? He said, your father has been arrested. I said, for what? He said, well, the BBC only said for sedition. I said, it's good. Because I know my father was a very upright and honest man. I know he used to send back the balance of his money to J. Willow Grimes when he traveled. So he was very honest, and I admire him very much. So the principal said, your father has been arrested. I want you to continue with your education. And for me, it became a challenge of going through my finals and the rest of my father. And I hurriedly went through my examinations and decided that I would come and see my father. I came home and went to see my father in the central prison. And I got there and said, uh, what happened? He said, I don't know. I came home for the inauguration of Mr. Tupman. They arrested me and they've sent people to search my library in Nairobi. I was 17 going 18 and I said but these are very serious serious charges an ambassador who was brought down to the level of a prisoner for sedition and my father said you know you are a man now you have to understand these things I do not know whether I will leave this place alive but you have to now be very strong and I said so when do you go back to court he said, I'm back in court on Monday. But I want you to go back to Sierra Leone. I said, I want to witness your trial. To get an understanding of what this whole thing is about. Because my father was always saying to me that you must study law like your grandfather and like me. We want you to be a lawyer. I said, well, I have to go to court. I went to court that day. Of course, dressed symbolically to let those who had arrested my father realize that uh, we're still around, could not be broken. So I wore a gown, a very long gown. If you look at Tran Red's The Love of Liberty, there's a picture of me at the age of 17 plus with my gown being arrested. So I sat on the front seat with my father in the dock with his Nerere suit, his beard, and he was a lawyer, a very brilliant lawyer, defending himself, arguing his case. And then one of the security officers, one of the security officers, uh, Wellington Campbell, came in and whispered something to the judge, Africanus Dennis he was called. And while Mr. Campbell was going back, my sister was sitting by me and her friend, I don't know whether it was Cora Harris or Fanny Cole, one of them was sitting by her and they giggled. 
this security officer, Wellington Campbell, came back and said to my sister, why are you people laughing? You, you people can't do anything. We'll deal with you people. And of course, I'm a younger brother, but of course, I had to defend my sister. So he walked away and I walked behind him. I said, excuse me, sir, why were you threatening my sister? He said, shut your mouth. In fact, I will have you arrested. At the age of 18, he called, called on the, uh, the security officers, the police. And then, of course, I saw the Attorney General, who was prosecuting the case, Mr. James Pierre. He came, in, came outside, and I was taken to the Central Police Station. At the age of 18, I was thrown into the stockade. I learned later that night that my sister Miata had been taken to the central prison of Women's Wing. I stayed in the post stockade until about 6 o'clock in a room they called Interview. I was just 18 years old. At 7 that night, <clears throat> they came and opened the prison gate. They opened the door and said, you are being transferred. And said, where am I being transferred to? And said, well, we've been asked to take you to the central prison. I went to the central prison. I saw my sister standing at the gate in the women's wing and I went in. I was put in cell 11. My father was in cell 9. And he said, uh, we brought my son here. Well, what is the problem? And of course I was locked in cell 11. Uh, by 8 o'clock they released my sister. I stayed in prison for two weeks. But I had time to think and to reflect on the nature of the system. A system that will arrest children because the father was uh, involved in the struggle with the authorities. I had the occasion to read in prison. A few books were smuggling, I read. I met people in prison who had been victimized. And I had the opportunity of analyzing the society for a position of a young man. A very unjust society. And after the first week, I had the opportunity to sit with my father. And I said to him, I don't know where this is going to end. But when I leave from this prison, I intend to study very hard and there is no turning back for me. I could see my father was very nervous. After two weeks, I was released from prison. I was released at about 11 o'clock at night and my father felt terribly depressed. I remember him shouting from his prison cell, why are you taking my son this time of the night? And the guard said, we're taking him outside. I had my bundle under my arms, I was just 18 years old. It was raining heavily. I was asked to leave the prison compound and I stood on the corner of uh, UN Drive and Center Street, 11 at night. Luckily for me, the taxi—the only taxi that came by was a, a taxi my mother was running and the driver, my man dear, somebody recognized me. He screamed. I got in this taxi, went home. Of course, my mother could not believe at that time of the night I had been released. And everybody said I should leave Liberia. I left Liberia. But with the dedication that a system of this nature which distributed injustice, poverty, and dishonor was a system which was bankrupt and had to be opposed with all the fiber of my body. I got back to Sierra Leone and enrolled at Frobe College. At Frobe College I joined the uh, Pan-Africanism, Kruman and Socialist Organization. I was elected Secretary General an editor of the party's paper, The Struggle. There we concentrated on the liberation of Africa, Angola, the MPLA, South Africa, the ANC, and Okonto was Swizwe, Mozambique, Frelimo, Guinea-Bissau, PAIGC. We wanted to read the literature of Franz Fanon and the Nigerian Revolution, of Gamal Abdel Nasser and the Egyptian Revolution. We are interested in the dynamics in Latin America of Cuba and its revolution of Che Guevara. Also were interested in Vietnam, of the heroic struggle of the peasants of Vietnam in the, in the Viet Cong and the Pakalao. 
We wanted to understand why this society is too still with its false aristocracy and its bankrupt economic system. We wanted to know, we asked ourselves, because we are convinced that in order to find solution to a problem, one has to study the problem. And we identify the problem in the society. A very backward and conservative elite, conservative elite, that did not understand that in an Africa slowly growing, developing, it could not remain that it has remained, it had remained for over a hundred years. Political stasis, where the masses of the people were duped into believing that they could elect their representatives, where those who drifted from the rural areas were put into Bantu stands, native reserves, like Basa Community, Vai Town, New Crew Town, Buzi Quarter. A form of apathy, a system, a system which was brutal, but concealed under the disguise of a form of Christendom. Pretense upon pretense. Black men who had come from slavery and still thought that by wearing tear coats and bowler hat, they, any, they represented anything but caricatures. We were quite conscious of this. It was with this understanding that we decided to go for further studies. And my father was a good friend of the Egyptian ambassador. And this was 1972, and he asked the Egyptian ambassador for a scholarship that I should go to Egypt to do graduate studies. And on the form they brought, one had, one had to choose one of the services, the Army, the Air Force, or the Navy. And I signed up for the Navy. I, wanted to, I told my father, I would like to fly one of those mix. He said, don't start that here. And I said, I will go to Egypt. My mother heard the news and she panicked. And she went to her father, Neticia Brown, and said, this is trouble. Henry is sending his son to Egypt. You know, the city's boy going to take military training with his studies. So my mother, a very good Christian woman, each time she shared tears, of course, I, sometimes I listen, sometimes I don't. But she convinced me to go to the United States. And of course, we had been following the black power struggle in America. We had been following the struggle of the Solidar Brothers, George Jackson, the Black Panther, Stokely Michael, H. Ruff Brown, Hugh Newton. And so we understood that it was necessary to go into an environment in America where we could have a better grasp of the essence of the black struggle. It was then we decided to go to Howard University in the midst of the black struggle in America. And there we encountered a lot of good brothers, a lot of good writings. We're also privileged to have come in contact with one of the greatest black revolutionaries of the last century, a man called C.L. R. James from the West Indies. He was the author of the great book Black Jacobins, which dealt with Tuzan Louverture and the Haitian Revolution. And from Howard, we enrolled at George Washington University, hurriedly finished a degree we wanted to because it was time to come back home. We returned to Liberia in 1978, went to teach at the University of Liberia. Because we had this thinking, we had also been seduced by the works of Herbert Marcuse, that in an underdeveloped situation where the working class was not well developed, the students could serve as a revolutionary reservoir. So it was necessary to create a revolutionary basis within the university, what Herbert Marcuse called red basis. It was to the university that we went to conscientize the students, not with literature that they call foreign ideology, not with Marxism, but to look at their own history, to introduce them to Blyden, to introduce them to Port and other people who understood the nature of the society. So it was to the University of Liberia we went. And at the University of Liberia, we drifted into Moja, not by accident. In 1971, as the student leader at Pro Bay College, Dr. Amon Sawyer had come together with Dr. Barantar to do research for the, for the doctoral dissertations. And I managed to secure a room for them and told the cooks to give my brothers food so that they would save some money. And after the finish, the, the research went back, Brother Sawyer wrote to me to say thank you. 
I wrote back to him and said, I would like to keep in touch. So when I came home in 78, in 1978, Brother Sawyer was already at the University of Liberia, and he was associated with Moja. And I drifted into Moja. Now, some clarification must be made here. Yeah. I was convinced at the time, and I'm still convinced today, that Moja was a radical militant pan-African movement. I did not think then that it was a chorus group with a choir master. Not for once. Because we taught, we taught cadre training to our people. We introduced the young militants to literature, the necessary literature. We wanted them to understand the dynamics of the African Revolution. Some good men, some of them today, with major responsibilities in the country, great responsibilities in the country. And so, we became a member of Moja, went up into the leadership. Fast forward to 1979. In 1978, before 1979, I remember, we had done an analysis of the society. We were convinced that the objective conditions in Liberia were pointing in the direction of an eruption. This must be understood. One of the centers of political activism was Nimba County. Why Nimba County? Because there you had the, five, the, the Lamco John Venture. You had school, San Nicola High School, St. Mary's. You see, the contradiction here was that the society was conservative, it was stagnant. But because of the rapid economic development in the society, it had to open more schools, had to broaden the university, had to bring in literature, sciences for people to study. In the same time, because it was not developing very fast, it was growing in terms of the economic output from the mines and the plantation, but was not growing very fast. You had all these people drifting down to the, rural, to the, to the urban centers. Young men from high school drifting down. University students who came from very poor families in the rural areas but had to sleep in West Point, New Crew Town, Logan Town. Places where you wouldn't even feel happy if animals live there, but people do live there. And these were men who were reading at the university. You had broadened the base of education for your people, but you were keeping them in shackles, in poverty. And that was the beginning of the tragedy. The objective conditions were as such that you could not, because of the skewed nature of your economy, you could not provide for your people as rapidly as possible. You could not produce manufacturing industries. You could not do anything. You could only get rentier, rent from the mining companies and from the plantations. And you're educating boys to come back in a society. And they started asking questions. By 1979, the society was pregnant. It was infamous. Was in ferments. An oligarchy which was blind to the realities in Africa. The masses of people who had drifted down from the rural areas and had been sucked into the slums and ghettos, coming into contact with ideas from the university. Young men with fire in the guts and ideas in the head. That's a combustible combination. They were not willing to accept what the fathers and grandfathers had accepted. And so we get to 1979. And on the scene then was the PAL. The PAL, Progressive Alliance of Liberia. And I remember running into Marcus Matthews at the stadium, Anthony Tuttman Stadium. He had one bodyguard behind him, a bodyguard. I walk up to him and say, Matthews, how are things? He said, we are trying. I said, so how goes the process? He says, Liberians are not ready yet. Boy, man, I'm thinking of returning to the United States. I said, Matthews, I can feel the temple. Don't say that. The people are probably waiting for a leader. They are angry. And I gave him the example. I said, let me tell you something. 
the last graduation exercise of the University of Liberia, I was going home. And there was a young man walking on Broad Street with his gown over his shoulder. He had just graduated from the University of Liberia. I stopped my car, it was my mother's car then, and I asked him where he was going. He said, Doc, I'm going to West Point. I said, get in the car, I drove this young man to West Point. We got into West Point, and somebody threw a stone at the car. And he jumped out of the car and said, no, 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 no. He's one of our people. And the people stopped throwing stones, and I left from West Point. And I said to Matthews, you know what that signifies to me? This is a young man with a university degree, he's going to live in a slum. He's speaking to the people. We must not underestimate these people. We must not. Then the issue of the rights. The issue of the rights came up. No, it was not power that brought up this issue of the rights. It was a brilliant, brilliant, brilliant social analyst at the University of Liberia by the name of Dr. Patrick Seon. Dr. Seon had written a very brilliant paper analyzing this whole theory of rice importation, increasing prices, and he had come up with a conclusion that it would do no good to increase the price of rice, and it could only benefit a handful of people. So in March of 1979, the Movement for Justice in Africa held its fifth, I think, anniversary at the Sports Commissioner. At the Sports Commissioner. And I was the, the official speaker. And I remember my, my topic for the day was uh, the African people are their own liberators. And at the post commissioner, why I got, when I got to speaking, the next person to bring solidarity was the young guy from South Africa, Sessi Machinini, who had been the head of the student uprising in Soweto. He brought solidarity. The next person to bring solidarity was Marcus Matthews. And Matthews came and gave his solidarity for the fifth anniversary of Moja and said, well, there's going to be a demonstration against the price of rice. We will keep you people informed as we move along. Everybody, we look at each other and I could understand what Matthews was doing. It was very easy. He was a tactician. He was a tactician. And what he was saying to us in Moja was what Marx had said a long time. He produced his salsa. Here is the rose, non dance. You talking about the people who are their own liberators. You are agitating. I'm calling you out to demonstrate with me if you have the guts. Come on, let's demonstrate. And the message was clear. Now, in history, we cannot shy away from our roles. And I don't believe in groovering in before history. I don't bow down. I speak the truth. Went back to Moja headquarters. And the debate started. Here we are. A political movement. The rest riot has been, a right demonstration has been called by the opposing side which is interested in mobilizing numbers, which is interested in mobilizing numbers, we cannot stand aside. We must not stand aside. We must engage marches and its people, and we must find out what is the itinerary of the march. How do we go about this? And we were delegated. We were delegated. Myself and some of the militants of our movement, some of them, who today in this country are holding responsible position, and we are happy for that. We were delegated to engage Matthew and his people. So there was a night when we met across from the PPP headquarters, behind where you have the Minister of Gender Affairs. We met on the grave. We sat on the grave. We who had come from Oja, Matthews, Brother D. Kankala, and others who had come, and we say to them, you have called a demonstration. We want to know the itinerary of this march. What are you going to do? And Matthew said, well, we'll be at our headquarters. We'll call our people. We'll shout some slogans. If the government doesn't allow us to demonstrate, 
we go home. And then I raise the question, what if they open fire? This is an oligarchy which has panic because of the mobilization of the people. These are people who have been used to power, just accepting power. They have not seen any confrontation. They have never seen such confrontation. What happens if they begin to shoot at us? And I remember Matthew said, we got some alcohol and some ban aid. That was the end of the meeting. On our way out, I said to Brother Sawyer, this man is either a reckless gambler, or there's something he knows that we don't know. And we went home, waiting for the day of April 14. So, it will be a deception and a dishonor to our militants who perished that day for anybody to try to convince people that Boja was not part of it. I participated. I was a member of Moja, I was a member of the Central Committee, I was delegated by the leadership to interact with the PAL people that I did. And on the day of the, the day, eve, and eve, the eve of the rice riot, we had a meeting at Moja headquarters. The leader of Moja, Dr. Chipote, Dr. Amon Sawyer, Dew Macy and myself, and I was given the responsibility of going down to PAL headquarters on the day of the demonstration to make sure that our people kept within the confines of the yard. I remember Brother Sawyer saying, but if they're shooting, we can't send Burma down there. I said, but no, I've been given the responsibility by the leadership. It's my duty to go down there. It was within this framework that on April 14, 1979, at 6.45, I drove down to PP, to the, to the headquarters of PAL, parked my car on Benson Street, and walked through angry looking policemen with guns, the eyes bloodshot. I walked through them and went to the headquarters of PAL. There was D. Kankala with a few of his people. And I said, so, where do we go from here? And Carlos said, we have intelligence report that they want to arrest you people and take you people to Bella Yala. But as much is somewhere waiting for the demonstration, Oscar Kwe is waiting. You should not be on the streets. And I said, well, I came to find out where do we go? On my way back to my car, a few of the PAL militants decided to accompany me. And while walking again through the police, the young men were saying, we are ready today. Today we're going to know whether we move forward or we'll be dead bodies. And I said, please, keep quiet. Keep quiet. I could see the police guys were angry. I got in my car, went to PAL headquarters, went to Moja headquarters. On my arrival at the headquarters was Brother Amos Sawyer. I told him of my impression that there would be no demonstration, that the militants of PL were convinced that it wouldn't be beneficial to them to mobilize the masses on the streets. But we have to be very careful because there could be some provocation. He agreed with me and we decided that we would drive to his house, whether it was in Fiam Fiam or Lakwasi, I don't remember. But we drove to Brother Sawyer's house, and an hour later, we heard sirens, sirens. And we heard guns, shots. And I said, well, it must be time to leave. He said, well, we must eat something. I said, there's no time to eat. Can we get something to drink? And he sent to buy two ginger ale. And while we drank, I turned to him and said, Amos, this could be our last drink on this side of Christendom. And he laughed. He laughed. Yeah, come on, boy. I said, I'm serious. And while leaving to come back to our headquarters, we saw this uh, ambulance running on only three tires and a rim. And Amos said, let's follow this ambulance. We drove into G the JFK. 
He drove into the JFK behind the ambulance. And there they removed the first dead body. The brother had been shot in his head. And we pay homage to the memory of this brother called Brother Robert Zia. He died at the age of 19. And I remember very well, and I said this to Alaji Kroma not so long ago. I said that was the first time I noticed you because you were sitting in the ELBC van with the other people. And there was an old man in Kaki, I think he must have been the porter. And this old man was crying. But they are killing the people's children, they are killing the people's children. And Dr. Sawyer turned to a doctor he knew and said, how many dead bodies now? The man said, we have about nine wounded seriously. This is the first fatality. And we found out his name was Robert Zia. Shot through the head. We were angry. I was furious. What kind of regime is this that used dumb dumb bullets on people's children? We decided to drive back to Moja headquarters. We took the back road and just by the convent, by gender ministry, they were shooting in, in Paris headquarters. We didn't know whether they were shooting at us. But we drove, got to Newport Street, and on, at the top of Newport and Kerry Street, we ran into Jimmy Pierre Jr. and some people. Dr. Sawyer came down from the car to talk to them. Of course, I stood one side. Furious. We got to the headquarters. By that afternoon, the people had heard that people were being shot. And Albert Port has a beautiful dramatization in his, book, in his pamphlet, The Day Morovia Stood Still. And you want to realize what happened. How Mr. Port had gone to P to Par headquarters, had spoken to them not to get on the streets, had gone to Mr. Talbot in Bentor, had convinced Mr. Talbot there was no need, there was not going to be a demonstration. Mr. Talbot had agreed. And just then the Minister of Justice, Oliver Bright, had come in, had whispered some whispered something to Mr. Talbot, and Talbot said he was on his way to his, to the mansion. When he got to the mansion, when Mr. Porter at the mansion, Mr. Tobo was a changed man. They were going to discipline these upstarts. Men they referred to as Jigger Fleas. These young men who dare question the authority of the state. And then the people pulled out from the slums, from New Crew Town, from Logan Town, from West Point. They came by the thousands ready to expose the bare chest for the bullets. There was a scene of a brother who was shot in the arms. His arm was broken. His colleagues wanted to take him to the hospital. He said, no, put me in the air. And with one arm dangling in blood, he held the other arm in the black power salute. And all over Morovia, the people came out on the streets furious that bullets were being fired at them. Angry people angry people. The government panic. Panic. And I said to one of our militants, even if we had 20 guns, we'll move to the mansion and take power. We got nothing. We are, simp we are simply dead men on leave. These people are going to kill us. And so it was that after the rights riot, the rumor got around that Liberians were not involved in the rice riot. That most of the destruction or so was done by foreigners. And I could not understand the mindset of such people. Young university students who had been reading, they had seen demonstration of young people in Soweto. They had followed rebellions and revolutions around Africa. And you were saying that they could not get on the street. They were on the streets. They were Liberians. They paid the price. They died. And so is the historical itinerary. I was arrested. Arrested for the simple fact that I was lecturing at the university. And I remember the students saying to me, Dr. Fambula, there will be a rise demonstration. What is your position? And I said to them, I make enough money. My wife makes enough money. We have only a little kid. I don't need to demonstrate for rice. But if the people are going out to demonstrate, it is my duty to be at the barricades with them. So I will be on the streets. And yes, some students did go. They did demonstrate. 
I was arrested under very interesting circumstances. The word was out that I was wanted, a wanted man. And my father had come down, he was superintendent of Cape Mount. And he had gone to Mr. Talbot and said, I hear my son is wanted. I want your permission to resign from your government to defend my son for whatever charge has been leveled against him. Mr. Talbot said, you wait when the time comes, we'll deal with that. But I want you to know that your son was involved with some people to overthrow my government. My father said, I don't believe that. <laughs> my son will not be involved with the people to overthrow your government. They don't have guns. You don't know my son. You don't know him. So Mr. Talbot said to my father, bring your son to the mansion tomorrow at 11 o'clock. I want to confront him. And my father sent the word down to me. The president will see us tomorrow at 11 o'clock. And so by 10.30 I got dressed. By 10.45 my house was surrounded by NSA agent, police and security officers. Knock at the door. I opened the door. And they said, you're under arrest. I said, no. I'm waiting for my father. He's taking me to the mansion. He said, no, you're under arrest. I said, well, let's go. They searched my room. Searched my studies. Took me to the NSA. My father contacted a cousin. And said, tell my son to be very strong. I feel betrayed. I feel disappointed. But he's man enough to take whatever is coming. With that, we stay at the NSA the whole day. Brothers were brought in from Nimba, other places, young brothers. And the authorities said they would bring food. I said, I don't want to eat. You have to feed the brothers. And an argument ensued between myself and the late Charles the Sheep. And then he threatened. We deal with you people. I said, the Sheep, you stand on nothing, absolutely nothing. Without a gun in your hand, you are nobody. Without your name, you are just an entity. Oh, we'll teach you a lesson. And then the late T. Boy Nelson, homage to his memory, intervened. Don't threaten the prisoners. The next day, Mr. Tarba called my mother to the executive mansion and my grandfather, Leticia Branner. So your son is giving trouble. Don't blame me if they present his body to you people. Of course, my mother broke down. Later that night, I was transferred to the central prison. She came the next day, crying as usual. Papa don't say anything. And so, yes, we stay in prison. A few days later, we were served with an indictment charging us for treason. Treason to overthrow the government of Liberia. Be clean. True circumstantial evidence that we had conspired with forces known and unknown to destabilize the state of Liberia. They went to the house of a young militant who had just returned from Cuba where he had gone for a youth festival. They took pictures. They took little booklets, leaflets and pictures of revolutionary icons. And with the help of certain international agencies, they put together a booklet called The Foreign Threat to Destabilize Liberia. It was that booklet on which they based their assertion that we were attempting to overthrow the government. And so they took us to court on the first day. We went to court and I remember the late John Scotland walked up to me and said, and how is it? They say you are a member of PAL. I said, no, let me make a clarification. I am a member of Moja. Not Paul. He says, but how come you are the only one of the leadership arrested? Because I remember Brother Dew Mason had been arrested the same time as I was arrested, but released after 24 hours. And I, it was a, my second week in jail. He said, how come you are the only one of the leadership charged for treason, arrested with the young militants? I said to Brother John Scotland, let me tell you a story, Scott. I call him Scotty. Let me tell you a story, Scotty. I said there was a case of a black man in the south of the United States of America. He had been charged for rape. And he went to court and had a very brilliant lawyer. And this lawyer argued persuasively against the charges. 
And after the summing up, his lawyer turned to him and said, you are guilty. And this black man said, no, 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 but wait, you did so well, you argued persuasively, how is it possible for me to be guilty? He said, I say you are guilty. The jurors came in. They said the charges as well are upheld. The, this man is guilty. And the black man turned to the white man and said, But you said I was guilty. How did you know? He said, By the color of your skin. You are doomed. And I said to Scott, I'm the only one of the leadership arrested. But let me tell you something. I'm the grandson of Netisie Branel. I'm the son of uh, Abdurrahman Boyma Fambule. I'm guilty. Simply by association, I've been charged. In court, I pleaded not guilty. I was determined to go to court and put the oligarchy on trial. I will use the courtroom and I had a symbol, I had a historical symbol. As had been done by Fidel Castro at his trial, history will absolve me. I had prepared to indict the oligarchy. In terms of this plantation mentality, in terms of this bankrupt economic policy that created an enclave economy, in terms of its arrogance, I had determined, I had determined. But then there was an accident of history. The Minister of Justice Oliver Bright had gone to the home of E. Harding Smite, who was a former deputy, a former director of police. And while drinking and playing cars, he made the remark that we have that Fambule boy. You know, he's a troublesome boy. He's been arrested and we will prosecute him. And the whole place went quiet. Absolute silence. And he said, have I said something? And somebody said, the boy you're talking about is the nephew of Edith Smite. He said, how is that possible? They say, Edith Smite is the daughter of Netithia Branell. Her sister is Mary Branell. That's Boyma's mother. Mr. Bright ran from there and said to Mr. Talbot, do you know who we have in prison? Do you know the man you have appointed as chairman of the commission? Netesia Branel, Councillor Branel, that is his grandson. You expect him to sit on a commission and condemn his grandson? It is not possible. The next morning I was asked to pack my things and to come to the Minister of Justice. Got to the Minister of Justice, he said, You are wanted at the Executive Mansion. I got to the Executive Mansion, and of course, my father, grandfather, mother, aunt, and all were there in Mr. Torbo's office. I walk in. And Mr. Torbo said, young man, let me tell you something. I'm releasing you from prison. I want to give you the benefit of the doubt. Your grandfather taught me law. Yeah, he is. We have the evidence. But I gave you the benefit of the doubt. I'm releasing you. We can all walk together. Go back and teach. I said, Mr. President, in the first place, you got no evidence because no evidence exists to overthrow your government. By that time, my father was pulling down my trousers. My grandfather was trying to step on me. I said, you have no evidence. I do not relish the fact that I've been thrown into prison. Your security people have killed the children of the people. They have misled you. These people have a right, Mr. President, by the terms of the Constitution, to assemble in a peaceful manner and to ask for a redress of grievances. It's said, stated in the Constitution. So you have arrested me. I will go back to the university. I'm going to teach what I know. But I say, Mr. President, I don't understand what is foreign ideology. So I teach political science. While we're in prison, I remember, Mr. Talbot had evoked 
the defense act. Mr. Talbot had invoked the defense act of the Manor River Union that allowed Guinean troops to come. Anybody who tell you otherwise is not being historically accurate. Guinean troops had come here. Yeah. And what I said to President Secretary afterwards, when I was a young foreign minister, we joked about it in Conakry. I said, Mr. President, you remember 1979 when you sent troops to Liberia to protect Mr. Talbot? Do you know I was arrested because I was teaching you? I was teaching African political thought, and I had some of your writings and the writings of Dr. Kwame Nkrumah. We laughed about it. So Guinean troops are common Liberian territory. And this is when I understood the micro-nationalism of Liberians. Ahmed Sekoutoure had sent his troops here to protect the government until the situation stabilized. From the Ministry of uh, Information, ELBC, there were interesting commentaries on the radio of foreign troops on Liberian territory. I remember an editorial given by somebody called Mill Greaves. All over Morovia, there was a clamor for the Guineans to go. And I said to myself, I was in Sierra Leone when the Guineans intervened to help Shaka Stevens. Shaka Stevens ruled for 17 years. The Guineans helped him. If the Guineans leave, these people will be in serious trouble. And obviously, Mr. Tobo asked the Guineans to leave. After the rice riot, after the rice demonstration, rather, the Brunel Commission, the Brunel Commission came out with some proposals to democratize the system, bring down the cause of, of, of living, to engage with the people. The cabinet and to grant amnesty to all those who had been involved in the demonstration. Based on this, amnesty was granted to those in prison. The government was asked to open up the political space. President Shaka Stevens came and said to the government, you must give the masses of the people a sense of belonging. Let them feel that they belong to this country. Stop marginalizing your people. Stevens could understand because the British had craftily had craftily designed a system whereby the bulk of the people in the hinterland will always dominate politically in Sierra Leone. He too had his liberated Africans and he was saying to them, give the people a sense of belonging. But by 1979, after the Rice Riot, the country was developing in what I refer to as the vortex, the vortex of the African Revolution. In Sanicole, in 1979, September, I deliver a paper which has been published widely. The changing Liberian society within the context of the African Revolution. I dealt with the pitfalls of the society its constitution which talk about we the citizens of Liberia were originally citizens of the United States of America I said but that is not true it is not true there were people in this country before you came and I gave proposals what needs to be done to save yourself I said from, I said, from the fury of destruction it is coming all over Africa in South Africa we heard about Nkonto Waswizi, militants fighting against apartheid. In Angola, in Mozambique, in Ethiopia, a revolution led by a young man, Megistu Hale Marien. In Congo Brazzaville, a coup led by a young man who had taken a left for a turn, Marion Gwabi. Grabi. In Ghana, June 1979, we heard of a young man called Jerry John Rawlings, who has been court martial and has said to the officers, I take responsibility, leave my men, put them before the firing squad. These were all young men, junior officers. And in Liberia, people were watching television, listening to the BBC, 
young people were asking questions. And we had these people, old men sitting here, thinking that they could rule like the forefathers had ruled in 1856. So after amnesty, the PAL transformed itself into the PPP because it was demanded by the people. Moja decided to continue with our politicization our education of the people using practical examples of helping these people understand the history that we did and then later on we heard there was a midnight march a midnight march by the brothers of the PPP subsequently they were arrested and obviously we realized that the PPP people were going for recruitment. They wanted mobilization of the people. Because with the developing trend, there was a possibility that election would be held in 1982. With the pressure building in a society, with people refusing to say, so say one, so say all, we were going to have for the first time an election where people will be allowed to cast the ballot. So for us in Moja, we are very excited by the prospect of an election in the Morovia area. We had done sufficient work among the student buses. We had done good work among the populace in the slums and ghettos of Morovia. In Bimba, the Vice President of Moja, Reverend Tayo, had done some beautiful work using liberation theology as was being propagated in Latin America to conscientize his people so our calculation was that we had Mimba and Monserrado County our leader coming from the southeast Tipote we will defeat the Tui party hands down we had no doubt that we had the numbers and then the PPP move on the midnight march they were arrested and obviously as a tactical move our leadership came over a statement asking that they be tried fairly but of course we said that this whole march was infantile it was childish we could not understand what was the objective of this march we had no idea why would you walk to the executive mansion at midnight except you wanted to storm the place and seize power that is understandable but you don't go and do this core drill before people who are already nervous so in March, Moja had, I think, it's six or seven Congress, and we delegated the leadership, the responsibility of organizing the party to contest the elections of 1982. Of 1982, our desire was to move ahead with our recruitment, our mobilization. And I was then selected as, of course, member of the Central Committee responsible for mobilization and propaganda. So we were going for the elections. Certain, certain of victory. No doubt. Fast forward. 11 o'clock, April 11, 1979. I am the installation officer of the new student government headed by George K. Clear and Abraham Mitchell. The fundraiser, James T. Phillips, the lead Zamba Liberty and others. And I delivered a speech calling for boldness, fearlessness on the part of our militants to confront whatever was thrown at us. That the society was moving and we were very conscious of having victory, I said. But nobody needed to be afraid of us we had been demonized we had been called communists we had been called socialists but we were nationalists and this is our country and those who wanted to walk with us who come sit with us and understand where we were going after the installation I know we had a little reception the guys down left the reception and the late Zamba Liberty said to me, the late Zamba Liberty, let's go and sit down and talk. It was 11 o'clock. I said, no, I have 
have to go home. I just, uh, my, my wife hasn't, hasn't seen me for the whole day. And I went home. Got home about midnight. Get a child. Slum into bed. At 4.30, my wife talked to me. So the phone is ringing upstairs. I was living in my mother's house downstairs. My mother then was teaching at bomb mines. So the upstairs was vacant. There was a phone. So I said, ah, these people are troubling me. The problem is a call from America. You know we are five hours different. Don't bother these people. I went back to sleep. Fifteen minutes, she said, the phone is ringing. It's been ringing. It's persistent. Go and answer the phone. So I jumped out of bed. The fourth I did, went upstairs, picked up the phone, it was my younger brother George. He said, Boyma, there's been shooting in the Sinclair area. I said, no, 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 you know, uh, <clears throat> these soldiers are probably drunk. He said, it's been going on for about 30 minutes. I said, well, we'll wait and see. I went back downstairs. I saw my wife and said, there's shooting. But you know what you do. <clears throat> Go in the other room. I will put the mattress up. Probably these people are coming for us. I will not allow you to be harmed. This is not your country. This is my country. I put her in the other room with my son, my late son, uh, Fidel Kwame. Go with your mother. I put the mattress up. I say, I will stay here. When they kick down the door, don't come outside. By 5.30 the phone rang, I went upstairs, my brother said, they're still shooting. And I said, but we don't have arms. The PVP people are in prison. Who, who could be doing the shooting? And then it occurred to me that the army had been brought onto the streets during the rights demonstration. And then I put on my hat as a political thinker and I said, you know, whenever people resolve political grievances through the guns, it's a very short distance for historical grievances to be settled by gun. And then I thought there was a possibility that this was a coup. And I said to my wife, this could be a coup, whatever it is, if they're going for the mansion, they cannot be against us. We'll wait and see. At about 5.30, right across from my mother's house, there was a lady who I remember very well, when we were in prison, used to take food for somebody. And I realized she was a cousin of a guy called Charles Reilly. So around 5.45, I heard this woman crying. They killed the man, they killed the man. I said to my wife, that lady is the cousin of Charles, really? Who is the bodyguard of Talbot? She's crying that they killed the man. I said, the president is dead. My wife said, shut your mouth, you put yourself in trouble. I said, the man is dead. I can feel it. I said, nobody has come to the house here for me. That means the man is dead. By six o'clock, I think I, I put a little graphic scene in my book, my little novel, Behind God's Back. And I said, you know, turn the radio on. We turned the radio on. And there was no music. A few minutes later, the Liberian National Anthem. And then these people came on the air. And I heard somebody said, speak your language, speak in your language. And this man announced uh, in his uh, hot in English, the old two-party government, government of over 100 years has been overthrown, etc., etc. And when he got to the point where he said, in the cause of the people, the struggle continues, I said to my wife, the masses have moved into history where they understand the potency of this power is another thing. So the coup, all through the streets of Morovia, people were demonstrating. I saw the picture of Talbot turned upside down. The people had ransacked the two-way party headquarters. Uh, <clears throat> Madam Commissioner Bull, I guess at the time you were a member of the two-way party, right? Yes, I was national chairman of the women wing. 
end of the two-week party, but I'm still here. Yes, ma'am, I know you're still here. I'm just saying that the people ramsack your headquarters then. <laughs> Thank you. No, no, no. I have a reason. I have a reason to say this, please. I have a reason. Because you see, the TRC has been constituted to get at the truth of this matter. The question is, can there be a last word on history? Can there be a last word on history? Especially a history of ours, which is so passionate. Can anybody divorce himself or herself from the prejudices of this historical era? I continue. Please, please, please. We don't want to clap. When we want circus, we know where to find circus. And then, of course, we knew nothing. We in Moja knew nothing. We had heard nothing. But there were rumors all along. There were rumors that soldiers, there was a young police officer who had been killed in 1979. I've forgotten the name somewhere on the old road. It was said he was shot by a soldier. And I remember the night of the, of, of the night of the rice demonstration. We were all together at my brother's, at my mother's house. Brother Sawyer and all these young militants. No men today. We salute you, we salute all of you, you know yourself. And we heard shooting outside. And we ran outside. I still remember Brother Sawyer had no shirt on. This short man has got so much courage sometimes, I wonder. And he came with our shirt. And we ran outside and saw this soldier. He had his Uzi. He said, I shot in the air. We said, so what's happened? He said, you know, they've been killing the people's children, but we are not shooting at the people. We are not shooting at the people's children. The police are doing that. So when we heard the army had overthrown this government, we decided to wait. We knew nobody. We heard announcements over the radio. We monitored our radio. And then on Sunday, there was an announcement of the cabinet. When the leader of Moja was appointed as planning minister, and I was appointed as minister of education, I went to Brother Tipote and said to him, we do not know these people. This is a gamble. If this is a right-wing coup, we could be sucked into something we don't know. Before we even begin to work, let us go and meet these people. Tipote, being a deeply religious man, decided that we come to the church right here, Providence Baptist Church, and to see Reverend Timo Reeves. And we got there, the church was already crowded. It was a Sunday, people were crying, praying. He held our hands, we went into his office, said a prayer. The Reverend had no shoes on and said prayers for us. With that, we went to the executive mansion to meet these people. When we got there, the first thing I noticed was the political officer from the U.S. Embassy. And I want to deal with this issue because, frankly, we can call this era in our history political opportunism and change in Liberia. Political opportunism and change in Liberia. Many people have said that the Americans were involved. There's no conclusive evidence on that. But I will come back to our meeting with the PRC. Let me give my own historical conjecture. Let me give my own analysis. It is said that Mrs. Talbot claims she saw white hands. You know, I'm always amused at people who say they see ghosts. Because you know, if you ask 50 people if they have seen ghosts, and 49 of them say I've seen ghosts, ask them the color of clothes the ghost had on. They will say white. What leads to that is extreme fear. It's extreme fear. Because you know, when somebody is fighting, you close your eyes, you see blackness. 
So the assumption when you open your eyes is white outside. These people said these were white people. I've read a bit of the history of American involvement in such matters in Latin America, the Middle East, and Asia. The Americans don't operate in this way. They don't operate this way. The Americans will not go assassinate a president using one of the agents. This has been said. But let me assume, let me assume for a moment that Mrs. Stolberg did see white hands. Let's assume. By the time of the coup, Mr. Talbot had fixed himself into some very serious and deadly political maneuvering. Mr. Mr. Talbot had endorsed the Polisario Front. He had moved close to Algeria. Is it just possible that there were Lebanese involved? in the assassination of Talbot. Why do I say this? I remember the first consignment of AK-47 the PRC got came from the PLO of Yasser Arafat. The first consignment. And there was a man here who was very, very close to the PRC after the coup. A man by the name of Dr. Kassas who had known all of the soldiers. Is it just possible that Mr. Tolba got caught into this very violent and brutal vortex of Middle Eastern politics? And that people assisted these people to bump him off? Is it possible? We can conjecture. I know one thing, the PRC guys never, never reveal how they overthrew and I think I know the answer. I think I know the answer is simple. They had no plans. They only acted on the spur of the moment. They had been involved in the rice riot, in the rice demonstration. They had seen guns. They had opened fire. They realized the regime was weak. It only depended on the guns. And then the regime had made a mistake of arresting people like George Bowling and others like Chair Chipo, like Oscar Quer, who were all very close to some of these people. Most of them were from the Southeast. And I guess when somebody craftily released the information that Todd was on his way to Zimbabwe to attend the independence celebration as chairman of the OAU, and that instructions had been left behind to execute the PPP people, which I didn't believe, and display the body at the pavilion there, simply because people had seen palm cash being put across. But there was a ceremony the day before, or two days before. Somebody craftily leaked that information. And my conjecture is that these young men in the army, probably sitting down drinking, and doing what young men do at times, you know, with that little stuff. I think they just decided that we're going to storm heaven. Let's storm heaven. Our people cannot die, they're going to kill them. Which was not true, but it was propaganda. And so they decided that we'll hit the mansion. Unfortunately for Mr. Talbot, he didn't go to Benta, he went to the executive mansion. Case closed. The station cool. They didn't know what to do with the power that it held. Nervous, nervous, uncertain. So the first reaction was to release those in prison. Martin and his people who had been in prison. Come and help us. This is the government. Martin and others, extremely nervous. Extremely nervous. This is a coup. The president has been killed. If there's, if there's a counter coup, there will be no trial. We are dead bodies. We are dead bodies. So they get in there and say to the PRC, well, you know, we have some friends, eh? We have some friends. These are Moja people, you have to call them. So you appoint a cabinet and you call Moja in. We get to the executive mansion on the 13th, Sunday the 13th of April. And we first notice the political officer of the American Embassy with another man there. And so I turn to Chipotle, I say, you see what I see? He 
say yes. And I asked the political officer, that a young man, whether he was called Brani or somebody, I said, and what are you doing here? And he said, I'm a liaison to the new government. I'm a liaison to the new government. A liaison? They had come to make contact. A case of sheer political opportunism. Not people who will mastermind a coup, but people who take advantage of happenstance, of chance, to say, now, we can go in there. They are young men. Anybody can get to them. Based on that, the coup was consummated. The PRC announced its decree. We were appointed. And let me say something. Over the years, we have heard news, rumors, and rumors, rumors that a list was drawn up right after the coup. A list was drawn up by ourselves, by the young civilians who were there. Yes, a list was drawn up. But let me tell you what this list contained. It was the this list contained the name of every senior government official. Every senior government official of the two we party. If I remember well, I think we had the name of uh, Madame Pierre Brown Boo. We wanted to make sure where they were because we we contemplated a counter coup. So we must we wanted to make sure that these people were in places where they could not affect any change. My father's name was on the list, and I said, But excuse me, what are you going to do with my father? And Brother Tipote jokingly said, but he's a superintendent. And Matthew said, no, 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 woman from Brother Brown pay the price. So I said, Tipote, stop this joke. Remove my... Because, of course, they say my father. So we laugh about it. This list contained about 64 or 65 names. 64 or 65 names. I remember they put in, they put Dr. Augusta King. And they said, you have to go and talk to King. That he must show, he must present himself. I went to King and said, just stay in your house. This people forget tomorrow. The woman did not show up, never went to prison. The government was constituted. We realized one thing. It was all political opportunism. There we were, young man, young men, without any hold on power, not knowing who these guys were, what the agenda was, they themselves extremely nervous, conscious of the fact that they had taken power, but not understanding what to do with this power. And then, there was general anarchy. Soldiers were invading homes, shooting people, robbing, and yes, they executed a few of their colleagues. And sometime between the 21st and the 22nd of April, my source, and as a social scientist, I always dig for facts. My source tells me that a cable was intercepted. The security people had a machine at Duke of Palace Hotel. And all cables that left from the telecommunication and from French cable copies, copies were picked up by the secret communication device at the Duke of Palace Hotel. And I was told that I think on the 23rd or the 20, on the 22nd or the 23rd, a cable was intercepted by somebody I think it was George Henry or so, asking for SOS. Things are bad. Come and help us. Two days before, the PRC had heard that Benny Warner, the vice president, was in the Ivory Coast, and that President Hufe Boyne was sending troops to come and reverse the coup. There was general panic. I learned later on that on the 22nd, the PRC met at the executive mansion. And against the background of this cable that had been intercepted, the rumors of Guinea, uh, Ivorian troops coming to Liberia, they panic. And they decided that all the people who had gone before the tribunal, will be executed. They decided that. If you remember, the tribunal had not issued any verdict. It had not. It had only listened to people. What the PRC, was, what the young guys were seeing in the army was that we will execute these people so there can be no reversal. In other words, 
all of you who are with us, we have now crossed the Rubicon. This is it. Will we execute these guys? Know that we are not going back. If you are with us and you don't help us, when the counter-revolution comes, you will die too. And let me say, yeah, in this public manner, within the context, within the context of the struggle, where a year and eight days before, we have buried so many of our militants. Either we had been called to a meeting by the PRC, I doubt if anybody would have had the guts or the courage to say, don't shoot those people. Now let me say, yeah, that in so far as the execution, executions were carried out, even though we were not consulted, but in so far as we did not resign, we endorse what was happening. And so we take responsibility. And let me say, yeah, let me say, yeah. We have seen the blood and the entrance of our militants a year before. And for many of us who had gone to the literature of violence and consciousness building, we welcome this. Welcome it in the sense that it happened. We must not cry. I hear militants say they cry. Ambition should be made of stern or stuff. Ambition should be made of stern or stuff. When you join the military, when you join the military, and you know the military tries on guns, and the military, in order to constitute its power, will have to institute terror, and you become part of that. Anything the military did, while we were there, we take responsibility. As young revolutionaries, we have no regrets for history. Let me say something here. My father was brutalized in this country. Held in prison. He died a broken man. Beaten on the orders of Mr. Tottenham by General Cassidy. My family was disrupted. Nobody offered me an apology. I realized that was within the context of the revolution. My grandfather was dragged to the streets of Morovia. Nobody ever apologized to my family. I went to prison at the age of 18. Again at the age of 29. My daughter Miata was born sick because her mother fainted about three or four times when I was arrested. Nobody. When you get involved in a historical process, you must take the consequences. I believe in my conviction. My role I play in the service of my country was well thought of. From a young age, I realized that I will go down this route. If it means my life, so be it. Nobody, nobody reads the classics. Nobody reads the Chinese Revolution, the Cuban Revolution, the Vietnamese Revolution. Nobody reads revolutionary history and says, says to you, we did not understand. And ask, you ask the question, but these were illiterate soldiers. How could we have supported them? And I say to you, we were students of the Mexican Revolution. We understood the role of Emiliano Zapata and Pancho Villas. These were persons, illiterate men. They carry out a revolution. And who says illiterate people do not feel in the guts the injustice meted out to them? We had an alliance. You can call it an alliance of opportunism, but we were not going to give space to those we had overthrown. So we say here, yeah. we're quite aware. Yes, we did complain. We did complain to our colleagues that this was barbarity, just among ourselves. Me, to Brother Sawyer, to Brother Tipote, this cannot be done. But you know, in history, when you fight against an oligarchy, and that oligarchy has been overthrown, the worst thing you can do is to share crocodile tears, sit and see the reversal of the process. Because in history, those who were once overthrown, when they come back, they come back with deadly vengeance. We understood this. So the executions went on, the government went on. We were told by the PRC that 
they will get to the point, they will get to the point where they will relinquish power and go back to the barracks. This is what we have been agitating for. Democratic elections empowering the people. Now, a lot of things happened during the period. 1983 while we were in the government. I'll leave that for the commissioners. I hope they have done the research to ask me those questions. We shall reply. But I'm not, I'm not in the habit of inflicting my role in history. I'm not. Most often men and women who inflict the roles in history, invariably they don't play many meaningful roles. I leave that for others to say. A lot of things went on. Fast forward to 1983. Fast forward to 1983. Announcement comes over the air that Liberia had established diplomatic relations with Israel. I knew nothing of that. My wife comes into the room laughing. Ah, so you're going to Israel. Don't bother me. She says over the air. I said, cut that crap out. She says over the air. I get out of my bed, turn the radio on. The news headline, Liberia to establish ties with Israel. I dash to the radio station, ELBC. I ask the announcer, can I see the press release? He handed it to me. I go to Willie Gibbons, who was deputy minister of state. Who authorized this? He said, do. What discussions were carried out? None. How can you resume ties when the OAU has taken a position on this? In solidarity with the Palestinian people, we must sever ties with Israel. Simply because the Arabs are in solidarity with the black, fight, the black liberation fighters in South Africa. Not a single Arab country has diplomatic relations with apartheid South Africa. So, Gibbons, if you people want to convince Joe, convince him that we go back to the OAU and debate this issue. He says, already done. I decided to see Mr. Doe. I said to him, Mr. Head of State, this is wrong. I am the Minister of Foreign Affairs. I should have been consulted. He said, the Americans told me to do it, and so I did it. I said, is that so? I will find out. I sent for the American Ambassador William Swing. Excuse me, sir. We had to fight to get recognized by Africa and the international community after the school. Did you impress on Hell of State Doe to resume ties with Israel? The American Ambassador said, Mr. Minister, I did not. It is not true. I said, thank you, Mr. Ambassador. I went before the council to explain Doe had gone to Germany. And there you have the advisors, Bai Bala, Tamaka Jangabai, Kolopine, and others, Moses Dupu. I said, uh, what you guys have done is wrong. You should have consulted me. They said, we took the decision. I said, okay then, find yourself a new foreign minister. They said, wait for the head of state to come. I said, I certainly will. Mr. Doe got back. I went up to him. I said to him, I don't support this policy. I think you're wrong. It should have been discussed. You listen to the pros and cons. Mr. Head of State, I've done my service. You can find yourself a new foreign minister. Who parted company? Who parted company? And so after I left the PRC, I was still a major in the army. And so I couldn't leave the country. I went to Henry Zuba. Henry Duba, who was chief of staff, can you give me clearance? He said, I will work on something, because he was married to Jew, but a Jew Mason sister. He talked to them. They said they were waiting. It was 1983, July the 4th, that I left the mansion, I left the foreign ministry. And so, why waiting for my clearance to travel? I got a call from the director of the NSA, Sylvester Moses, who was my junior at Frobe College. And he said, in quote, I'm sending, I'm sending a flower for you. About 3 a.m. that morning, one of his agents came, a guy called Shafa Kew, came to see me. He said to me, Sylvester Moses wants me to ask you a question. Have you been listening to the radio of late? I say yes. 
Did you hear those say that people are engaging in human sacrifice, ritualistic killings for power? And if any, anybody is found, the person is going to execu be executed. I say, yes, what has that got to do with me? I don't believe in these backward practices. I don't. So what I, he said, no. They are orchestrating something. They're going to kill somebody and drop the body in your yard. They will get a few people to go on the witness stand and testify that you sent them. Going mad, they will execute you. Sylvester wants you to leave this place. I say, you cannot be serious. Now, for me, it's one thing to go down fighting, it's another thing to die, and Liberian people feeling that you are a boyo man, a backward, a guru who believes in this kind of nonsense. <clears throat> so I said, okay. The next morning I went to, <clears throat> to Dubai. <clears throat> I said, you know, I have to go, man. I told my wife, make way and take the children out of here. It's getting very dangerous. We took the children. I went to the Guinean ambassador and said, my wife is a foreigner. If anything should happen to me, please rescue her and take her to Sierra Leone. I then went to the Sierra Leone ambassador, Philip Faboy. My wife is your citizen. If anything should happen to me, please take her out of the country. My children are gone. Dubai sent to me, I will help you. 24 hours later, the Egyptian ambassador came to see me. He said, I got a message for you. My government has said to me, I must promise you protection. I must take you into the embassy. I said, Mr. Ambassador, I cannot go and hide in the Egyptian embassy. He said, Samuel Doe has sent a delegation to Israel to ask the Israelis whether they have any information on your dealing with the Libyans. We don't know what the Israelis will tell them. But we think you are in danger. I say, I will wait. I say, who are these people? He said, Grady Allison, Patrick Minicom, Henry Duba. Once he said Henry Duba, I said, okay, it's no problem. I know Duba will probably be a decent man, be an honest man. They went to Israel and came back. And the Israelis told them, but no, we have nothing on this young man. And the Israelis asked them, was not this the young man who in Tripoli led the walk out of the African groups or African group when Gaddafi insisted that Bukuni Wadai take the seat of the Chadian government rather than Hussein Habri? Wasn't this the young man who led the so-called moderate countries out? Anybody dealing with the Libyans will not do that. They had no alternative. I tried to go. They stopped me at the airport. I came back. I went to see Duba. He said, I will talk to him. Within a couple of days, I was called and gave him my passport. The reason they said I was using a diplomatic passport at first, which I was entitled to as a former foreign minister. I took another passport, got to the airport. When I reached the airport, there was a soldier standing up. He saluted and said, good luck, sir. God go with you. I realized there was something. I jumped on the plane and I left. 1983. I joined my family, tried to find a job in Paris. Mr. Doe heard I was in Paris. He sent his foreign minister, Ernest Eastman, to UNESCO and said that the Liberian government who frowned on Fumble had been employed. That's 84. My father suffered a stroke, seriously ill. And I said, I'll go to Morovia to see my dad. I got here to Morovia, 1984. Politics was hot in the air, the temple. But Osoya had announced that he was going to form a political party. He was arrested subsequently. There was a demonstration at the University of Liberia. And while driving before the university, I was stopped. The soldiers, I still got a knot on my head when they hit me with a gun, tore my shirt off my body, took my glasses, and I heard one of the soldiers said, Fambula, he's been against us, so we'll see. And luckily for me, Harrison Peno, of all persons, said, no, 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 what? You can't do nothing to Fambula. He and Jeffrey Batu were standing up. Say, Fambula, ain't big no trouble, little man. I left. 
left Liberia, went back to Paris. Now, we come to what you and everybody have been waiting to hear. 1985. And for the first time, I reveal certain things to you people. For the very first time. Late 1984, I'm at home in Paris. My phone rang. I pick it up. There's a, boy, there's a man called Eric Scott. Eric Scott. But Eric Scott was executed across the bridge at the, at the onset of the war. But Eric Scott says to me, General Kuyangpa wants to talk to you. He's here in America. He's asked about you. He wants to talk to you. Before then, I'd heard about the Nimba Ray. I was out of the country since September, uh, since 82, came back briefly. Since 83, came back briefly, briefly 84. He wants to talk to you. I said, what is the mission? What is the, what is the purpose of this? He said, I think you need to come here and talk to the general. I flew from Paris, went to Washington, D.C. Harry Scott and General Kuyangpa picked me up. And Kuyangpa said, you know, I'm in school. I'm in school. The situation in Liberia is deteriorating. You know, I escaped after the Nimba raid. I went to Nimba after I left the barracks. And those sent for me to be arrested. He sent General Say, who I think was superintendent. And I, did, I didn't know who was coming and I opened fire. And we killed some of those people. But I managed to escape. But we need to get back to Liberia. The elections are coming. This was, this was, yes, the elections are coming. Late 84. General Kuyangpa, Eric Scott, and myself, and I said, but just hold on. General, you have left the army. There's nothing you can do. You've been away. But let me propose something here. Let me propose something. What happens if we can convince all the political parties to come together? We convince them not to put up a single candidate. The, all the political party will come. Doe has said he's going to run. He's an army man. He has the army behind him. But we can split the army by the political party having you as a single candidate. I say, imagine what it would be. If you were to come to Sierra Leone, announce in Sierra Leone, that you are, the, you are the candidate of the combined political parties and you are going to fly in Liberia and you will contest the election against Samuel Do. I say even if you don't want the power, you can rule, take a suitable vice president, rule for a year, go back to school, turn over power. General Kuyangpa said that's a good idea. I say I can sell this, I can sell this to our friends in Sierra Leone. Money should be no problem because Doe must go. Doe does not want a free and fair election. I say, but you are the only man at this time who can create the conditions for pressure to be mounted on Doe to leave if you were to beat him in an election. The international community, the Americans, with whom you had very good relations, they will probably come to your help. It was agreed then by General Kuyongpa, by Eric Scott, that this would be a very, very good, very good political move to come and contest the elections in 1985 against Samuel Do. Before I left, I remember the call came. They said, Charles Taylor wants to talk to you. As well, he's in prison. And Taylor said, HB, can you please testify at my trial? I said, Charlie, I know nothing about your trial. I've heard that you and Do fell out some money business. I cannot come and purge you myself. What do I know about what happened? He said, well, before you leave, just come and say, this whole thing is political. I said, Taylor, I'm not sure. I cannot do that. I cannot. With that, I left Washington, D.C. Went back to Paris. All I know, we're going to get to the political parties, each and every one of them, to convince the candidates to all step down. For General Thomas Kuyangpa to become the standard bearer of a united front. I even propose it should be the, the, the Alliance of Democratic Forces, something like that. The Alliance of Democratic Forces. So, I went back. 
it must have been in April or May, May of 1985, I think, or before that. I received a call from a colleague of Kuyangpa in the United States of America. Oh, he said to me, HB, can you come down to Freetown? I'm coming with the general. I said, but we have not concluded anything. We have not concluded anything. I will be talking to our people within the country. He said, no, plans have changed. I said, I beg your pardon? He said, yes. And this man will come here and he will explain himself. He said, things have changed. We have been talking to the Americans, he said, and to the Israelis, and they have given the general the full backing to go and remove the regime so that democratic elections can take place. I said, I don't buy that. Don't resume, don't resume ties with the Israelis. Why would they want to do that? The Americans? He said, well, we're coming. We bought our tickets already. I said, I will be in Freetown. They got to Freetown. We met. I said, General, I'm all ears. The general said, you know, there cannot be elections in Liberia. Do we not allow anybody to win? And I said, but this is why we want you to go. He said, he didn't ever go. Do we not allow us to win? He has to be removed militarily. General, I was brutalized before the university. I left Liberia. I know the terror in the country. Any move against Doe will have to be decisive or the backlash will be unfathomable. Please, you must understand this. He said, we are working. What do you want from me? He said, I want an introduction to President Shaka Stevens. I said, it's done. I said, it was yesterday. I know the old man. I called my source. Went to see the old man. Old man said, welcome. What can I do for you? They explained the purpose. The woman said, you know, we don't want trouble. But Doha has been making a lot of trouble in the sub-region. If you claim to have these support, supports you have, I can help with little money, and afterwards, tell me what you want to do. Through my young son here, Dr. Fambula, we left. And all these preparations started. I realized that, yes, it was going to be a coup. My calculations were very simple. They had come to Freetown. I was in Freetown. Of course, I admired the general and supported him. If this is what they wanted to do, I was not going to allow the general to go alone. I would be by his side. I said to him, General, whatever your fate will be, it will be my fate. I will come with you. If you say that you want to confront this man, then I will take training. I want to be there. Because I believe in the process of historical changes. If there is no way to change the government democratically, and it has become a tyranny in history, this is the only way you go against tyranny. I believe that is my conviction. I will walk with you. So yes, we walk. Difficult situation. Now, I was told that there were people who were helping them from America. I only met one such person in the presence of Mr. Archie Williams. Others I didn't know. We went on and on. And then I said, I will talk to the Salonians. We probably need more help. I went to see a Colonel George Cocker. And George Cocker said to me, I'm a trained army officer. I have looked at your people. They are not military men. They have all these titles of generals. They cannot make it. I asked them for the plans. They have no plans. When you people are bought this thing, it is going to be... They will fail, he said to me. And I said, but Colonel Cocker, you are a military man. Sometime in history, people take gamble. He said, but they don't have the forces. I said, well, they said they got people in the army. And I said to him, I said, General, have you heard about the Foucault theory? The Foucault theory. He said, no. I say, is the theory perfected by the Cuban guerrillas? You can start the motor of a revolution with a handful of men. They can serve as an engine. 
These people are not going to fight from the border. They will ravage the country. They are going to go to Morovia because of the nature of our society. Everything is centralized in Morovia. They will take the power. And that will be the end of it. He said, it's not that simple. I said, but they demand that. And then, of course, there was a deadlock. The Serenos were not willing. They were not satisfied. Recruitment went on. On November 10th, on November, no, November 9th, I was home sleeping. The general came with some of the, the fellows. They said, you've gone to Ghana for some time, you left and went back to Europe, we hear you are annoyed. What's the problem? Okay, we want to leave Sierra Leone, we want some arms. The old man said, you should contact him. So I said, oh. I will talk to the old man. President Stevens had just sent a power, handed power over to President Momo. And I went to see Momo. I said, you know, these guys say they want to go into Liberia. But Colonel George Coca is saying to me that they are not ready. What can they do? He said, well, let me think over it. Let me think over it. Let me go and ask the old man. So he went and he talked to President Stevens. Stevens told him what he wanted to do. On the 10th, the general came back to me. He said, Dr. Fambula, are you developing cold feet? Everything is ready. Everything is ready. Our people, are, the more we wait, the more it would be disastrous. I went back to President Momo. I said, these guys will wait. General, they are determined to go in. Whatever happens, that's a gamble. He then said, we'll release some arms to them. They must leave our territory. With that, I shook his hand. He said, where are you going? I said, I'm going with them. He said, no, 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 you cannot. I said, I'm going with them, General. These are my people. It's my country. They say they will fight against this tyranny. I must be part of this historical process. And I saw his eyes with a tear, I mean like tears in his eyes, he shook his head. So I go. I left from there, went to George Cocker. Say yes, we'll give them whatever they want. And we traveled, traveled. We got to the border on the 11th, dressed to come in. Dress, everybody with the AK-47. We're going for battle. This is what we have been preaching. Our theoretical analysis. This tyranny will not go. We will struggle against this. And therefore, it's the price we pay in history. We got to the border, there was no vehicle. The vehicles had not come. On the morning of the, the 12th, 5 a.m. No, no, on the morning of the 11th at 5 a.m. We all dressed to go waiting for the vehicle. And then the Syrian intelligence officer came to me. Can I see you, Dr. Fambula? Yes. He said, will you turn away your gun? I said, no, I will not give you my gun. At this stage, I'm under the command of General Kuyangpa. He said, but you are still on Syrian soil. You will turn away your gun. I put my gun down. He said, I've been instructed to see that you don't cross this border. I said, who instructed you? He said, I don't have to tell you. A big argument is shown. You will not go across this border. If you attempt, I will arrest you. And then I turned to General Kuempa. I said, General, and the two men was Himembo Dennis. I say, I'm told not to go. What is your decision, General? And he said, let me talk to them. They went, discussed with the Sierra Leone security. The General came back and said, Doc, you cannot come with us. I said, General, I told you I will be with you. I don't know why you're taking this decision. But I know I want to go into Morovia. It's going to be very delicate. At that time, he was convinced that I shouldn't go. I was asked to undress, give my AK-47 to the Syrian security, took off my pistol, give my uniform. I had my red scarf on my hand because I had sustained a little fr I gave it to Brother Joe Wally. I said, well, that's it. People were very sad, but they said, this is what it is. This is what it is. You cannot go in there. So we got to the border. Information came that. Information came that the trucks had arrived. They had to then go to the they had to then go to the barrier. We stood on the banks and there was a gun battle. 
After they've done battle, the trucks were loaded and these people moved forward. But I noticed the selling security officers were all very nervous. One of them tried to light a cigarette and his hands were trembling. And so I said, excuse me, is there a problem? He didn't talk. Three of them moved towards the tree. And then they started coming back to me. And they said, Doc, let's go. And I said, is there, is there a problem? He said, these people will fail. I said, what do you mean by that? They've just crossed. He said, your chief of logistics, Jimmy Bia, is there. He was killed by accident on the bridge. You're going to get into Morovia with all a logistic man. He said, we have taken from him the diagram, the plans, all the logistics plans. We're giving it to you. They can't make it. They will get to Morovia with all a logistics man. Queen Park cannot handle it. He's the commander. You do. We drove to Freetown in auto silence. I had my radio on EL, ELBC all the way. On ELW, they were still reporting that it was successful, everything was all right, people were being arrested. When we hit the outskirts of Freetown, I called ELBC, I heard do. So I went to the safe house we had on Wilkinson Road, and there were some of the brothers there. I said, gentlemen, Gentlemen, the coup has failed. They said, no, 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 it's not possible. Uh, Doe Do is in hiding. I said, the coup has failed. Nothing. I'm going to see the Sierra authorities to see how we can rectify the situation. It is bad for Sierra for us. I left them. I came back within two hours. Of course, they had left the country. Took a plane and they left. I went back to Paris. I was lucky to receive a tip from uh, Jim Davis, who was the interpreter of the mansion. The details, the gory details of the killing of Kui and Pai and other people. It was 1985-86. I received a call. A few weeks later, I received a call from Kui and Pai's wife. She asked me whether I had seen the tip. I said, yes, I've seen the tip. And I decided that uh, one phase of the struggle had ended. I will go to Ghana, I will travel around West Africa, I will see what it was possible to do. Because President Stevens had said to me after the coup, you have to leave. Our intelligence people have information that a man called Kakula Koto has come with some assassins. And you are on the list. If they see you, they will kill you. You must go, you are still a young man. With that I left Sierra Leone. So, from 1986, we monitored the situation in West Africa. Our duty was to continue paying attention to Liberia and writing. I started writing in a newspaper called Africa Asia, under the name Stanley O'Day, giving analysis of Liberia, the problems of Seoul. And then, in late, in late 1989, in early 1989, I received a call. This was midnight. Received a call. And this person said, HB, how you do? And who is this? He said, Chale, Chale, your man, Chale. <laughs> Excuse me? He said, HB, I got to see you. This thing about Queen Pa, I got to see you. I said, Taylor, where are you? He said, I'm in Mexico. I'm, I'm beating the CIA. I'll skip. <laughs> I said, so what is it you expect me to do, Taylor? So Taylor said to me, I want to come to Sierra Leone to see you. Queen Pa was very close to me. I have heard. I said, Taylor, if you go to Sierra Leone, you are doomed. The Sierra Leone authorities don't want to see us there. They are very nervous. I have been told that the American Senate delegation headed by Vanna Waters to warn the Sierra that on no account should they allow anybody to get to the territory who is a dissident. So I'm not even going there. He said, but we must see and talk. I said, okay, I'll meet you in Accra. I got some friends in Accra. With this, 1989, I get down to Accra. So Taylor comes to Accra. So Taylor says to me, so what happened? 
I gave him an account of what had happened as I knew it. Then he said to me, But then Queen Park cannot die in vain, HB. So what do we do? I said to him, I said, Taylor, my experience with Liberians in Sierra Leone over this whole incident has so discouraged me that I have to think twice before I commit myself to any more such trouble. Because I think Liberians are very deceptive and I don't find the conviction that I expected. So he said, well, I want to stay here. I said, you can stay here, there's no problem. No problem. I will tell my friends. He stayed in, in Ghana. Then somebody went to visit Taylor called Abayami Kanga. Was talking big. The Ghanaian intelligence traced him to the American embassy. This chap was arrested. You have come around Ghana. We have noticed that you are going to certain places. You've gone to the Star Hotel. What is your mission? It was then that Abayami Kanga told them, I've come from Liberia. There's a childhood friend of mine here called Charles Taylor who escaped from prison in the United States and he's in Ghana. With this, the Ghanaian authorities arrested Taylor. His girlfriend Agnes came to me crying. I went to see the Ghanaian authorities. They said, but you didn't tell us this man was a wanted man. I said, I explained to you that he's wanted by Doe. I know you are not on good terms with Doe, but he's our friend. They said, but he's wanted in America. I said, I don't know. He said he escaped from prison. But if you send this man back, they will kill him. He means no harm. Please. With that, they promised they will release Taylor. I left Ghana, went back to England. I heard later on that Taylor was taking people across the border, was recruiting people, etc. Then he was arrested for the second time. And I was called. That Taylor was in prison. I said, well, I don't know anything about this. Whatever Taylor has done, that's his business. He will have, Taylor will pay the consequences. I don't know his game. I was later informed that his girlfriend, Agnes, had gone to Ivory Coast. They had sent her up to Burkina Faso. She had met with uh, Blaise Campori. Blaise Campori had gone down to Ghana and saw the Ghanaian authorities and said, I've come to you as brothers to ask you for one favor. Ghanaian said, what is that? Say, release Charles Taylor. He's, they say, who? Say, Charles Taylor. He said, Blaise, what do you know? Where do you know this man from? He said, oh, well, we release the man. He's our friend. Based on that, the Ghanaians release Charles Taylor to Burkina Faso, to Blaise Campore. Taylor disappeared from Ghana. I'm in London. I know nothing. I only hear later on. A little year that Charles Taylor was taken by Blaise Campori to go and see Gaddafi. And I make it clear before the war and before the Liberian people. I've never met Gaddafi. I've never shaken the hands of Gaddafi. Gaddafi does not know me if I stood before him. Yes, I've been to Libya. I've met other people. But not Gaddafi. Taylor was taken to Libya by Blaise Campori. So as a political man, in my travels in West Africa, contacting my sources, I found out that Taylor was airlifting people to Tripoli for training. But my calculation was simple. I said, in the first place, Taylor can't do anything. He can't go from Sierra Leone. Sierra Leone won't allow him. He can't move from Guinea. He has to go to the Ivory Coast. It's a long drive to Morovia. This is suicidal. I was convinced that Taylor would not do anything. I had not reckoned with one factor, and I will come to that later on. And so, Taylor went on training people. The whole of, the whole of 89, the last part of 89. And then by accident, I get a call from the Ivory Coast. A key source. He says to me, Dr. Fambule, I want us to talk. I said, talk. He said, yes, there's something happened. I said, I will come to Ivory Coast. I was in Ghana. I said, but before I come to the Ivory Coast, you say to me what it involves. Let me have an idea. He said, I don't want you to be a friend. He said, you must know something. There is a list 
The Taylor people have come with a list from the United States of America. On this list, there are 45 names. These are people they intend to eliminate if they take power. I say, is that so? He say, yes. Your name is on the list. I say, and who? who what are the other names? And he started reading the list to me. I realized these were all the names of brothers. And I said, but Taylor and others are not going to remove Doe. These people are bent on revenge. And this brother said to me, Oh, HB, don't bother. We can talk to Charlie and others. And I said to him, No, I do not gamble with my security. I will not gamble with my security. If these people have met in the United States of America, and they have put together a list of 45 people, and my name is on the list to be eliminated, I have to take the necessary precautions. I will take the necessary precautions to ensure that I protect myself and if it's a power grab, we'll make a bid for power ourselves. It was then in September of 1989 that I went to some friends in West Africa, in Ghana to be precise, and I said to them, there is a group being trained in Tripoli. The mission is to move into Liberia. But that's not what concerns me. That's for Mr. Doe and the security people. But my concern is that they have a list that they have brought from America of potential people to assassinate, to kill when they take power. These people are going in for a mission of revenge. Because I've heard before, I've heard before, that Nicholas Podia was attempting to come and Mr. Taylor and his friends leaked the information to Doe. So Taylor, Podia was expected, he was killed. And here was a list of 45 of our names. And I said, these people have now engaged in battle. And I told my friends in Ghana, please allow me to see the Libyans. I would like to talk to the Libyans. I was put in touch with the Libyan ambassador. And I said to him, you are training Liberians. Do you know the agenda? He said, no. I said, but it is against the progressive forces in our country. And the ambassador said, do you want to travel to Tripoli and talk to our people? I, I welcome the opportunity. I arrived at the Mataba. When I got to the Mataba, I met the former ambassador who was here, Mohammed Talbi. I said, Talbi, this man, Charles Taylor, how much do you people know of him? He said, well, he's a good friend of Blaise Kambori, and Blaise is our friend. He brought him here. We are training his people. I said, I'm asking for his agenda. He opened his drawer, took a few papers, handed them to me. I read through these papers. All the rhetoric, the polemics of revolution. I said, but this was not written by Taylor now. Taylor does not understand this. Somebody must have written it for Taylor. <laughs> I say, Mr. Talby, this man does not understand politics. He's a little businessman. You people must understand, it will be a disaster for our country. He said, well, he's far gone. We've trained his people. He said he's going to strike. Then I said, his list contains my name for elimination. Can you people help me there? Will you allow me to train my militants? Will you allow me to train my militants? I must beat Taylor to Morovia. I must get to Morovia before Charles Taylor. To prevent what I perceive as an, odd, an obvious slaughter of our people. And it was agreed. It was agreed by the Libyans that we must take people and train them. So we took people up to the Mataba for training. My last meeting with Charles Taylor, my last meeting with Charles Taylor was in October of 1989. Taylor had come to Libya and I was in Tripoli. Vintage Taylor, big show man. We're sitting in the dining room, he takes the hair table. He takes the, head, the, tea, the seat at the hair table. He begins to lecture people from Latin America. And the first thing he says, you know, I don't believe in all this socialist crap. I mean, capitalism is the best way. And I look at one of the brothers. 
And I said, this is the man the Libyans are supporting to go and lead revolution in Liberia. And Taylor takes offense. He said, you know, you HB, you people always talking, but we'll see, we'll see. And I said, Taylor, I can bet you, I can wager. I don't care what the Libyans do. You will self-destruct because it is not in your heart. You don't know revolution. You will fail. He said, we shall see. With that, Mr. Taylor got up, stormed up the dining room. We never talk again until today. We never talk or discuss. He stormed up the dining room. So for us now, it was a battle. Our security preventing Mr. Taylor from taking power. By all means. I was called by the Libyans. They said, we want you to join Taylor. I say, it's impossible. This man has no political creed. This man represents nothing. Are you people racist? That you will impose on the African people anybody? They say, we'll get back to you tomorrow. Within 48 hours, they call me and say, you will leave Libya. You will leave Libya with your men and go within the next 48 hours. You must leave our territory. In November of 1989, I was given 72 hours to leave with my militants from Tripoli. I never went back to Libya again until last year. So we're kicked out of Libya. So we're in West Africa. We're in West Africa. I moved to Sierra Leone. And then I heard that Taylor had invaded Liberia. He had invaded Liberia. And I said, but this is a gamble. This man is a consummate gambler. There's no way he's going to make it. And then I got a call from two people who I suspected were sitting in Taylor's house in Burkina Faso. And they said, HB, we have gone into Nimba. The war is going on, but we lack manpower. Can you send people to join us? I say, no way. No way. I will never do that. And I traveled to La Côte d'Ivoire. In Abidjan, I met somebody who was in contact with Charles Taylor. And I said, what is happening in Nimba County? He said, Taylor forces went in there. They beat them back. The refugees are streaming across. He said to me, I try to condemn this because I'm afraid. But I've been told by the Ivorian Defense Minister that President Hufe Boini has sent a message to me. And the message says that there is a saying in the tribal dialect. When the palm oil has wasted, you don't step in it and walk around the room. Simply means that shut your mouth. This thing is going on. And he said to me, they are behind Taylor. I was in Sierra Leone. I said, but he can't make it. It's a wrong calculation. He's going to fail. It's obvious. And then I heard that the Taylor people were making advancement. And I wanted to understand the chemistry. I said, well, how is it possible? How can Taylor make advancement with a hundred men? No social base. And then the word came to me that Blaise Campore had sent to Taylor 700 commandos from the poor base. Now, I had not calculated on this. I had not calculated on the fact that Blaise Campore will risk, will risk the sanction of the international community by sending 700 soldiers to assist Taylor. They had gone into Nimba. All of them in Mufti. The Iborians recently was revealed, had given them arms. Mr. Doe's back was against the wall. Who is sitting in Freetown? I was told by the Salonians, called by the Salonians, that they had received information that Fambule would never be allowed to enter Liberia. He was being watched. So I said, who are these people? They said, people who have associated with the Black Congressional Caucus. And then President Momo said to me, you are wanted by the ambassador of the United States. He wants to see you. I said, Mr. President, 
assign me one of your most senior ministers. I would like him to be there when I talk to the Americans. So I went into the American embassy with Dr. A. Karim Toure. The American ambassador, the black, black American, the political officer. They were all standing there with a few other people. And the American ambassador said, Dr. Fambola, what role do you see for yourself in the Taylor's led government? I say, I beg your pardon. He said, what role do you see for yourself in the Taylor led government? I say, I see no role for myself. If you people say Doe is evil, Taylor is equally evil. I do not believe in the better of two evils. I do not believe that. He said, what happens if Taylor should take the power? I say, we will continue to struggle. We are African people. We are not going to relent. We will resist, sir. That was the end. The meeting that was slated to last for one hour lasted for about 10 minutes. I left. I went back to President Momo. He said to me, but you got this bad PR with the Americans. They don't like you. What is the problem? I tried to explain to this simple soldier gentleman why I've been demonized. He said, well, your people are telling them that you are more, you are a more dangerous man than Charles Taylor. I gave him a class analysis. I said, well, these are the people behind Taylor. These are the connections in America. That's why they resent Fambula. So he said, I advise you, don't bother. Don't enter Liberia. And so I said, but we have to know what is happening. Mr. President, we must know what is happening. Just in that time, Guinean intelligence had picked up signals from people speaking French. And President Lassana Conte sent his foreign minister, Fashimi Toure, to Sierra Leone to go and discuss with the Salonians that Guinea was ready to invoke the defense treaty as Torba had done to send in soldiers to help Doe. So Fashimi to Rekim, because the Guinean argument was that they will not tolerate an Ivorian army occupying Liberia. So they called me. So President Momo said, you must talk to Dr. Fambola. He knows about these things. He keeps his ears open. So I met with the Guineans. And they said, the ambassador who was, he served in Liberia, Hadara. They said, look, we are picking up signals of French-speaking soldiers with the MPFA, uh, MPFL. We are convinced that they are Ivorian soldiers. I said, no, you are wrong. They are soldiers from Burkina, Burkina Faso. And all of them said, Blaze, just like that, Blaze. I said, they are from Burkina Faso. But it would be a serious mistake to go into Liberia because Blaze has... to Taylor. Were you to enter into Liberia, you'll have to fight. It was against this background that President Momo decided to contact President Jarawa of the Gambia and to say to President Jarawa, we have a problem on our hands, a major problem on our hands. The Guineans want to enter Liberia. The Ivorians and the Bokinabis have committed themselves to Charles Taylor. This could be a fight of a regional dimension that will engulf so many countries in the sub-Africa, in the sub-region. So we have to then think, we have to then think of a formula to go in and separate these people. So many of them are dying. It was against this background that it decided to put together the ECOMOC forces. But before then, a very interesting thing had taken place. And I learned this later on from somebody who was very close to Do. President Babagenda had sent about a thousand soldiers on a Nigerian frigate, a ship, to come to assist Samuel Do. And they were arguing 
had seen the mansion, whether it was possible to land the soldiers at the free port of Morovia. And this chap who explained to me called Sally Thompson, he says, possible, we are in control of the port. The Nigerians were something like about 30 nautical miles. Communications were caught between the Martian and Nigerian ship. And so the Nigerians sailed forward straight to Sierra Leone because Mr. Prince Johnson had taken over the port. Against this background, Echo Morg decided that they would put together a force or ECOWAS to come into Liberia and separate the war factions. Now, I was very much interested. I was very much interested in what was happening. Luckily for me, the executive secretary of ECOWAS was Abbas Bundu, a good friend of mine. So President Momo sent him to talk to Taylor and to talk to Doe. Abbas Bundu came into Liberia. He met with Taylor, he met with Doe. So I was very interested in finding out the situation on the ground. When Abbas got back to Freetown, I went to visit him. I said, what is the situation? He said to me, but Taylor is popular among the people in his areas. He said, I noticed women were putting their lapas on the ground for him to walk on. And he joked. He said, remind the men of Jesus entering Jerusalem. I said, well, you know what happened afterwards? They crucified him. We laughed. We laughed. Then I said, what about Doe? He said, I went to see Doe. He said, I went to see Doe. He said, Doe is holed up in the executive mansion. His men are heavily armed. I said, what did you say to Doe? He said, I said there was need for talk for peace. Or he had to leave the country and allow peace talk to go on. Because Taylor said he was determined that Doe will not stay in power. And Abbas Bundu said to me, but Doe said one thing. He said he would never step down for Charles Taylor. He'd rather leave the mansion with his feet, meaning dead, than give power to Taylor. He said any other person except Charles Taylor. And for me, that was an eye opener. I said to Abbas Bundu, but Taylor is, I mean, Doe is here playing the nationalistic card. He said to Abbas Bundu, I will not give power to the people I overthrew, any other person. It was against this background that I decided to then interact with certain forces in West Africa to say there will be a need for an interim government. Doe is saying that he is not going to step down for Charles Taylor. The, the killing is going on. I said, you know, in politics as in history, when two men decide to fight to the end, it's because both of them have utter contempt for each other. I said, listen to Taylor. He doesn't say President Doe. He said that boy. Listen to Doe. He says anybody but Charles Taylor. I said the Liberian people are doomed. Against this background, Nigeria not being able to send troops to Doe, the Guineans having backed down from coming into Liberia, President Jarawa determined that this conflict in Liberia does not involve several West African countries in combat, decided to meet and to put together a West African peacekeeping force. But in the interim, in the period moving up to this, they had called for a meeting in Freetown of representatives of the NPFL and political groupings. And this meeting was held at the U.S. Embassy. Obviously, I refused to attend. I was asked to go. I said, I do not see why peace talks dealing with an African civil war being held in an African country should be held in the U.S. Embassy. But the meeting was held in the U.S. Embassy. When they left from there, the ECOWAS foreign ministers traveled to Sierra Leone. And this was a very interesting development. Liberians who were in Freetown waiting, so-called political leaders, they met at a meeting and they all signed a resolution. And what did this resolution say? That the MPFL had momentum and that power should be given to the MPFL for six months and then elections will be held, that door must go. This resolution was signed by almost every political leader, 
so-called political leader, with some reverence, except in me, I oppose it. I told the Salonians, luckily for me, because I had spoken to Abbas Bundu, I said to the Salonians, I said, Doe will never accept this. He will never agree for power to be turned over. They said, but all your political leaders, I decided to block. I said, who are they? When they call a name, I said, that man got about 10 people, he nobody. They said, so and so person, I said, that man movement, they don't do anything, they're dead. Everybody, I said, these are not political leaders. Do not give power to Taylor. Let us go for an interim government. When the ECOMO forces started coming into Freetown, it was decided that we must meet in Banju, based on what Doe has said, that he would only allow an interim government, or he would only allow somebody other than Taylor to take over. It was urgent for us to then go and get an interim government. I traveled to Ghana, and I called Dr. Sawyer. I would like to see you, my brother, but come very quickly. Dr. Sawyer came to Ghana, and I said to him, I said, Amos, we're trying to put together an interim government. We've been doing some work in West Africa. Taylor must be stopped. He's a danger to this country. Will you accept to be an interim president? Brother Sawyer said to me, Boyma, I was not made by God to be a leader. I said to him, Sawyer, God does not make anybody to be a leader. History, history imposes obligation on men. This is your historical obligation. You must become an interim president. With that, Brother Sawyer went back to America. He decided to go into Banju. I traveled on the same plane with my sister, the artist, and Winston Tupman. Winston Tubman said to me, we are going for this meeting in Boima. It would be a good thing for the Liberian people to see a family supporting Tupman. I wanted to say to this man, I wanted to say to Winston Tupman, Tubman, it would be a good thing to see a Tubman supporting the family, but I didn't. My sister being an artist, not a diplomat, Mera said, but Tubman, we can't support you. We're supporting Sawyer. And that was the end of that. When we landed in Freetown, I came out. Went into the, went into the terminal. There was Bishop Francis, Bishop Dix, and a few other people on the way to Banju. They said, are you going to Banju? I said, no. They said, well, you should come. I said, why? They said, well, your name been ringing. You should come. I said, no. I have a group. The Popular Democratic Front. I have a representative. Dr. Fode Kumar, he will represent us. My sister is representing the artist. We had then decided that it would be Amos Sawyer. Based on this, they went to Banju, they elected Amos Sawyer. Sawyer came and took over. I didn't get to Liberia until March of 1991. I listened to Taylor. We saw the destruction. We heard about the killing of people in Cape Town. It was said by some people in the MPFL that I had entered Cape Town with troops, which was a lie. I never entered Cape Town with troops. I've never joined a single warring faction in this country. Not one. And all the leaders I like, I would like a single leader of any warring faction from the MPFL. So you leave more care, you leave more jail, more dead Lord, for a single one of them to stand up in the face of public opinion and say, Fambule was a member of our organization. I never. So these are rumors, rumors. And so we came here, and I was appointed as a vice to Sawyer. By 1992, I got very frustrated, very frustrated. I learned that a group of Liberians were being trained as black bearers. I traveled to Freetown and I confronted the Guinean ambassador, Ambassador Hadara. Are you training Liberians? He said, yes. I said, you shouldn't. If our people are courageous, 
There are bombs falling in Morovia. They will mobilize the people up to 20, 30,000 people. Train them as militiamen. Arm them. Let them protect the people. I don't believe in this stuff. It won't work. He said, I will inform President Conte. And because Sawyer had not consulted me, I knew nothing about that. By two, 1992, I decided to take my leave of the interim government. Went back to write and to study. By 1994, my son uh, fell ill with leukemia. I was out of the country. With him, most often coming back, going. And of course, he died in, uh, he died in 1995. I came back home in late 1995, uh, six months after burying my son, interacted with all the brothers. But there was a case, there was a case which has been mentioned by some people who are ill-informed about my meeting with Yulimo, a backtrack a bit. In 1991, Dr. Sawyer asked me to go to Freetown. And to meet the leadership of Ulimo, because the Nigerians were saying, you now need a united front against Taylor. All these different groups, you are playing into Taylor's hands. He has support. He has support from various factions, the Ivorians, the Burkina Bees. Who knows? Why are you people dividing yourself? Go and ask these people what is their agenda. And I did travel to Freetown. I met the leadership of Ulimo at the Liberian Embassy. And I said, I'm a representative of the interim government. I come from Dr. Sawyer. He wants you people to come to Morovia and to sit your case. They said, but you see, we will send, a represent we will send representation to Morovia, but we are very wary of this entire process. I came back and I told Sawyer. I told Sawyer. But then I met General Dongo Yaro. I said, General, we are having a problem. He had just left Liberia. I met him in Lagos. We are having a problem. Taylor is bringing in arms. The Bukinabis are sending more arms into Taylor. The Ivorians are working on this process of installing Taylor. Now, if you pay attention, I have not called the Americans whether they were supporting Taylor or not. I was not concerned. I met them in Freetown. I've told them my position. Dongo Yaro said to me, General Dongo Yaro, you must come together. He said, what will be your proposal? I said, I would like to see a people's militia in Liberia. You see, because the people have to defend themselves. I always believe that if we train these people like policemen, these people can drop bombs in Morovia. He said, but Nigeria can help. Call some of the people. It was then that I started contacting leaders of the various factions to come to Morovia and to sit with the interim government and talk to Sawyer and how we could build a united front against Mr. Taylor. 1992, when I found out about the Black Beret, I packed my bags, I left. I came back in 1995, November to be precise. A member of the Council of State called me. He said, well, you have come to the country. What do you intend to do? I said, I intend to sit around. He said, no, come and work with the Council of State. We are, you see, you are the only person people say, oh, you always keep away. Come to the Council of State. You can be a security advisor. Just sit down. Because he said, Fambula, you know, people think you can't work with anybody. You are uncompromising. He said, for a political person, that is wrong. I said, it's my conviction. He said, well, will you accept being a security? I said, anything security. But... If you people keep dealing with Taylor, you run into problem. And then, April of 1996, we had this confusion. The attempt to arrest Roosevelt Johnson. I met George Bowling, I met Elijah Puma, Taylor's people, and said, don't you understand Taylor's game? He feels that the AFL people are still there. Roosevelt Johnson still has a reservoir of people in the barracks. Once he destroys Roosevelt Johnson, he's coming for you people. Don't join this man. Nobody listened. But luckily for me, I was at my mother's place when there were some elements of the NPFL set ablaze the Catholic Church. 
And the boys from my place came outside with throwing water on the church. I came outside, I was identified. And one of the Ulimo boys from Alaji Kuma was there, overheard them saying, Oh, Fambula is still in town. Okay, wait for the night. So this guy got to Alaji Kuma and said to him, The people have identified Fambula. If he stays here, they're going to kill him tonight. Alaji Kuma said, Put him on the phone. I took the phone, he said, Boyma, I'm your friend. I say something to you. God does not come down to save a man's life. My people have picked up signals. These boys will eliminate you tonight. <laughs> Leave that place. I'm begging you in the name of God. And I said, well, where will I go? He said, anywhere. My people can take you. You say that you are dead. I took my mother, other relatives who were there. We left Ashman Street. A few days later, I left the country for Guinea. I came back home. I came back home. I came back home in 1997. My agenda, my agenda was still clear in 1997. Taylor, for me, was a threat to what we had been preaching for decades. The democratization of the Liberian society. The mobilization of our people, not the using of our people. The mobilization. I said we have to go after Taylor. 1997, the Nigerians called an election. I decided to contest the elections. As a symbol of defiance, I was the only presidential candidate who kicked off his election in Banga, Taylor Stronghold. I mobilized my people and went to Banga. I remember people were saying that, you know, God did the same thing. He went to the free port. He was killed. Fambula is going to Banga. You won't see him again. But I went to Banga. Had my political rally in Banga. Told the people of Bon County that Charles Taylor was a gambler. He was using your sons when he gets through maximizing his wealth. He would drop them aside. He was not a political leader. One of Taylor's lieutenants said, Later on, Fambula is lucky to go and condemn Taylor in the midst of his fighters. But I remember something very interesting happened there. A Nigerian soldier came to me afterwards. He said, I listened to you quite clearly. He said, you know what happened here today? He said, when you open, when a man stays in a dark room for a very long time, when you put the lights on, the first thing he will do is close his eyes. He said, what you said today, they're condemning you, but it was singing later on. I believe like you, so I want you to leave. We left. The elections were coming a week later. Victor Malu called us all. And he said, you must walk together. You must walk together. I remember Mr. Taylor was sitting down. This time now he was dressed like tall but in white. On my right, Madame Sarif was sitting near me. I could see she was very furious because it was like we had come to crown Taylor. So, Victor Mali was saying, no matter what happens, you must all work together, etc. President Abacha would like to see you next week. You all next week. We all travel to Abuja. Again in Abuja, it was obvious that Taylor was the man. I mean, the Nigerians gave him a special car. He was acting presidential, and it was like, what is happening here? So we went to Abacha. We all sat with Abacha, and Abacha said, Liberia, but before we took our seats, Charles Taylor made sure he positioned himself at the entrance with his walking stick and his hat. And I could understand the political drama. I could understand the political drama. And the other candidates will come in and Taylor will shake the hand. Well, hello, welcome. <laughs> when, I, when I got to the entrance, when I got to the entrance, I could see, I mean, it was like, finally Fambula is coming to recognize me. 
So I casually turned my back as if I was talking to somebody. And I walked the other way and took my seat. The Nigerians recognized that. And Abacha said to us, you have a great country. You all need to come together to build Liberia. There's no need for all this trouble, all this war. Well, I had picked up intelligence reports that the Libyans had spoken to Abacha and that they had cast the lot with Charles Taylor. Everybody spoke, all the candidates. When it was on my time to speak, I said, thank you, General Abacha. It is true Liberia is or was a great nation, so is Nigeria. I said, but General, in history, great nations are built by great men. Great men who have passion for the people, who understand the suffering. I said, General, why we fight is not because we like war, some of us. We fight now so that our children do not have to beg on their knees for the homeland that we, the fathers, want for them on their feet. That is why we struggle. We don't hate each other, we're all friends. We came back home, we had the elections, and Charles Taylor won. Or Charles Taylor was given victory. I was approached by the Nigerians. Charles Taylor wants you to walk along with him. My reply to them was that this man cannot take care of a kitchen. He cannot take care of a kitchen. You think we are playing games here? You come and take our country and give to this playboy? And I quoted for the general, General Malu. I quoted for him the 18th Bromia of Louis Bonaparte. Historical circumstances have a way of promoting non-entities to the position of significance. This is it, General. Don't play games with our people. He said, well, you won't walk with Taylor. I said, I will not walk with Taylor. I told the Americans that in Freetown. I've been opposing this man from day one. I took a bet with him that he will serve the struck. And I will go into exile. But before then, I had made a speech at the city hall. And somebody said to me, what will you do if Taylor wins? I said, I'll go to the mountains. That became the talk. And I said to them, Moses went to the mountain and got the Ten Commandments. Why are your problem if I'm going to say you will go to the mountains? <laughs> with that, with that, I left Liberia. With that, I left Liberia. In terms of developments in Liberia after that, I kept my ears open. I traveled through West Africa. I went to Guinea. I ran into some people. They said they were learned. What is your agenda? There's fighting going on. They didn't tell me anything to convince me. I met people on the west coast of Africa. So what are you guys up to? We're getting Taylor. Getting Taylor is not a political ideology. Getting Taylor is revenge. That's where you stop. What is the agenda for development? Based on that, the war went on. I monitored the wars like all of you, watching the TV, CNN, until I heard the fighting in Morovia. I heard that Taylor was leaving and there would be a meeting in Accra of the various groups. And I said to Mohammed Chambers, I met him in Abuja, aren't you going to Accra? I said, well, to do what, Chambers? <clears throat> he said, your people are meeting. I said, you have not answered my question, to do what? He said, they are going to form an interim government. I said, that has been the tragedy of Liberia. Each time there is war, you call people together, war in factions, they divide the country who will take the most lucrative parastatal, uh, the finance ministry or the bank, they enrich themselves. Other elements feel that it is a time to get money. They arm a few men, they fight. I say, if you're not careful with this process, you're going to end up where you have 70 war in factions. Some of them are only five men because they know you divide the country. I refuse to go to Ghana. I refuse to take part. Liberians went to Ghana, elected an interim government. The 
interim government was installed, Charles Taylor was taken out of here into Nigeria. I went into Nigeria for a symposium. One of the intelligence officers who was in touch with Charles Taylor in Calabar came to see me. He said, I just come in from Calabar. I met a good friend of yours. I said, ah, who? He said, Charles Taylor. He says, You're his friend. Do you want to go and see him in Calabar? I said, Colonel, Charles Taylor said he's my friend. Whether he asked to see me or what, I don't know. Go back and tell Taylor. A family say you're his friend, but he doesn't want to see you. Please tell him that for me. But I realized that Mr. Taylor had reached the end of the line. I must admit, he was my friend at one time. But I tried to study human nature. I told him in Ghana, like I told him in Tripoli for the last time we spoke, September of 1989. He didn't have what it, what it required. And I say this in your frankness. Leadership is more than just being popular or being bold. The Libyan said this to me when I said, but Taylor has not got it in him. He is not a national leader. He is just a small time businessman. The Libyan said, but he has courage. I said, but even armed robbers have courage. <laughs> Why do you think they go after police and others? They have courage. So in a nutshell, in a nutshell, my understanding of what transpired in Liberia can be summarized thus. Liberia as a nation that is extremely conservative, ruled by an oligarchy that did not realize that the country was changing right under them, the economy was growing, schools were being opened, kids were becoming enlightened, listen to the news, they were debating among themselves. Even when they were presented with the opportunity of changing at the Buchanan Congress, when the Tui Party called for a Congress of its, of its members in Buchanan, and they sat in Buchanan to readjust the position of power within the Tui Party, they still came out with the same formula of the domination by people with such names. The country belongs to everybody. And we were saying to ourselves, what will it take for these people to learn? This country's tragedy is not due to the fact that a Bacchus Matthew scheme, a Tipote scheme, somebody called Sawyer, your family, whatever, Samuel Doe. These are all subjective factors. Historical factors which are subjective, they are individuals. The objective conditions in this country after the death of Topman was leading to two things. Either a breakdown of the system because of the inability to develop comprehensively where the rural areas and the people in the rural areas will participate in the development of the country. Or serious repression. Serious repression. In other words, after Topman, the government had to be a populist democratic government, embracing the people, building on the people, decentralizing power in the rural areas. How was it possible? How could he have done that? The very political system they operate, we still operate today, is flawed from beginning to end. You take a situation and you say it is, your constitution is based on the American constitution. A country of Liberia with various ethnic groups, subgroups. You have a legislature where individuals from the legislature represent little districts. So these men come into the legislature as micro-nationalists. They represent little districts. That's all you have. This is your concept of democracy. Your people are allowed once in four or five years to put a little piece of paper in the ballot box. After the elections, three months down the road, look around you. The only thing you see, the masses in the two tattered t-shirts of the various political party. The 
life remains the same. What needs to be done in the, your political system, which the true party failed to do, was to decentralize power. Every county must be given its own local assembly, whereby the people from the various county are elected in that local assembly. Is that local assembly which then sends representatives to the national assembly in Morovia, subject to recall by two thirds? So power must reside in the rural areas. Even those who are elected, you bring a man from Cape Mount, he represents a little district. This one comes from Grand Gide, represents a little district. But you exclude the vast majority of the people. There is not a single representative of the trade union in the legislature. Not a single representative of the religious groups. Not a single representative of the teachers movement, or the labor movement, or the farmers movement. These organizations cut across tribal groupings. They are the most nationalistic. Because in the house, you have a man who is a labor leader. He represents 20,000 workers. They come from various tribes. That's how you build cohesion. You build cohesion. So you abandon the rural areas. After Tuckman, Mr. Talbot had no choice. He could either democratize, take the people with him, abandon the old oligarchy, or he could stick with the old oligarchy, gamble, and face the wrath that was coming. It was obvious for everybody to see. Mr. Talbot gambled hysterically. He went with the oligarchy. In history, when you want to walk on the trapeze, your two legs dangling, don't ask what happens to you in the middle. This was the problem. So if the TRC is here to look at the roles of individuals without considering the objective conditions in this country, then you have not understood what has happened to this society. Even if Barco's marches did not call the rice riot or the rice demonstration, a little conflict at a football match would have sparked off. Crisis, people were angry. All around them, what did they see? Some brothers have mentioned. All your symbols are the symbols of domination. All your symbols are symbols of control. Your whole history is plastered with inaccuracies. That is your problem. That's your problem. The whole structure of your past government, your Masonic craft, your established churches, your ruling families. A condition, a condition of self, masses of people living their half butcher lives in the mines on the plantations. And you maximizing wealth with your arrogance, with your deceit, with your fake Christianity, with your fake Christianity. Conservative backward, even today, your constitution, one of the most racist in the world. Your children go to America and Europe, they can become citizens. You say only people of Negro descent can be in your constitution. Backward, in the age of globalization. You live in a country multi-religious, multi-religious. Your reverend tells you that there is a Christian state, following a Christian principle. Your constitution says it is secular. You separate, you, you celebrate Christian holidays. Not a single holiday of the Muslim brothers. Not one. That is your battle. That is what the society will face. And I come here. I come here. And let me say, if you go back and read my speech, just Google on age Bomber Fambula Jr. My speeches are there. Go back and read my speech in San Nicole, the changing Liberian society, within the framework of the African Revolution. At the end of that speech, I said, Ask not, ask not who the bell are tolling for. They're tolling for you. Yet, yeah, we said today, 2008, people have fought wars. You have marginalized people. But well, you have dealt with the political issue. You have dealt with the political issue. You have now brought into being a democratic framework where we can choose who we want to choose or decide not to vote. There is a crisis. It's a crisis of identity. Why in your mentality? I ask you a question. Must your history be spattered with blood for you to make any little change? Why is it that you don't recognize that today you must now begin to build a cohesive society. Not all these things you talk about. First and foremost, this is a secular state. 
is a Christian and where the Muslims sit. There are Muslims and Christians here. Celebrate this. Otherwise, these ones who are fought in red, men who take up arms to settle political grievances, they do take up arms to, se to settle historical grievances. You are very conservative. That is your problem. Now, people say, we came, we spread foreign ideology. My name is Boy Mafambole. I've got no identity crisis. I realized who I was from the time I knew myself. I've always been Boy Mafambole. There is nothing foreign about me. We must allow for one thing in a society. People came here who decided to revenge. Do was a victim of historical circumstances. If Samuel Do hadn't done what he did, some other person would have done it. In our history, there have been men. There have been men like Tiara Briswell who died in Belayala. Men like D12. Men like Joa Nimle. You know, have they fought. They fought. They, they organized. Going back into your own history. What is this matter that you cannot understand? That because of who you are, your pretenses, your pretenses. I said to the people recently in Habel, they celebrated the uprising of Soweto. And this man got up and discussed about Soweto. People were killed. I said, but what was the significance of Soweto? What did it reveal? And then they were talking about Katakam. And I said, you know what happened in Soweto? It was not that black men decided to shoot people. It was the arrogance of race. People who feel they have the god given right because of the color to treat other people like animals. The massacre in Katakam was the arrogance of status. Men who feel that they have the god given right because of the position, the name and the status to decree the massacre of innocent people, humble masses. That is the problem in the society. Up to today, you have to leave this arrogance. This nation was built by all our people. There must be respect for all of us, irrespective of where we come from. To those who are Christians, to those who are Christians, your Bible says in Proverbs 21 13, Whosoever stoppeth his ears to the cries of the poor, he too shall cry himself, but shall not be heard. You, we go to church every Sunday. You go to church every Sunday. What is the basis of your religion? The Bible says to you. When your Lord comes again, He will say you are saved. Because when I was hungry, you gave me food. When I was naked, you gave me clothes. When I was without shelter, you gave me a place to stay. And you will say unto your Lord, Lord, when did I see thee to do all these things unto you? And you will say, in so far as, he will say, in so far as you have done that unto your brother, you have done it unto me. That is the basis of my African ecclesiastical. That is what I believe. That we have to embrace our people. There can be no second class citizen in a republic. There can be no second class and first class citizen. This is why the oligarchy was destroyed. My father served in an oligarchy, my grandfather. And I used to tease my aunt. The time will come when the royal plantation will be given back to the people. Who gave you all this land, by the voice? Who gave you all this land? Miles and miles of people's land. And you subject them to wretchedness, to poverty. Look around you. And you expect the society to remain the way it is? You expect it to remain what it is? People are learning, they're educating themselves, you're traveling. Now the responsibility is greater. It is greater. And let me say yeah. Let me say yeah. I will not bow down before history. I'm a participant in history. I accept my role based on my conviction. I remain on the left of politics because that's where the heart is. And I feel I'm not entitled to struggle. I'm not entitled to suffer. I can take care of myself. 
But the man who does not feel the injustice and the poverty of another person, he is not a human being. It's based on that that I've struggled. And whatever has happened in my life as a political man, even the death of my cadres in Sierra Leone, when Mr. Taylor realized that we're based in Sierra Leone, and he sent the late Dogolier and the late uh, Doki to come with Kekula Koto and inform the Sierra Leone people where well, thousands of Liberians were arrested and they were killed deliberately, stabbed to death in the prison of Sierra Leone. We still had hope that one day things will change. And based on that, we went into exile, we analyzed, we wrote. And you can read my writings on Mr. Taylor again and again. I feel no comfort that he's in the head. I feel no satisfaction. Because you see, the greatness of a man lies in not trampling on the foot your adversary when he's down. It's a sign of cowardice. I fear for him, I fear for his children. I don't know what he did. He's been accused. I've heard rumors that he brought this problem in Liberia by forming the RUF. This is not true. The RUF existed before Charles Taylor. That I know. Because I read the manifesto in 1987. That's not true. So, whatever he's done, I wish him the best. God speed. He can defend himself. But we come back to the case of Liberia. And somebody will say, but you were a friend of Samuel Doe, but you went against him. Let me say here, in all honesty, before all of you and before history, I value the Republic and its honor more than I value the friendship of anybody. Of anybody. This is my country. My father bled for it, went to prison. My grandfather bled for it. I went to prison. I do not claim to know anything. It is possible that in growing up and struggling, I made mistakes. We all do. We are humans. But to sit here and condemn what I took part in, I will not. The truth is that my teaching that prepared me for participation was revolutionary. It remains revolutionary. Committed to the transformation of society. Not to change. Change can come. Transformation. Transformation. You can change from one day to the next. The transformation in the minds of our people. The transformation in the mind, the mindset of the arrogant few who feel that this is the plantation. It's called a republic. We are all citizens. So you are citizen Flomo. You are citizen John. I'm citizen Fambulet. That comes from the French Revolution. It comes from the French Revolution. When you declare a republic, you re declare equal status before the law. If you don't want to declare equal status, form a monarchy. Form a monarchy. This is all our country. The basis of our crisis is that we got involved in a situation, developing very fast, economic transformation, without the right political leadership to comprehend what was happening in the country. And so the society exploded. Our duty as young revolutionaries was to understand the explosion. If you like, call it opportunism. But in history, as in politics, especially the violent politics of Liberia, what is necessary is that those who make that history must survive enough to write about that history. I thank you. God bless you.
Silence, please. We thank you very much, <clears throat> not only for sharing your experience with the Commission and the people of Liberia. You elaborated on your role during this period. You postulated on some of the root causes of our problems. You identified some solutions which the TRC can construe as recommendations to it as far as the way forward for our country is concerned. We thank you very much and at this time commissioners will ask a couple of questions so that uh, matters that were understood where could be clarified and maybe you could elaborate further on some of the issues especially those transitional issues that since the conflict ended by the signing of the agreement and the hosting of elections some time ago. Thank you very much. We will start with Commissioner Sheikh Kapuma Kone. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Family, Mr. Witness. My question to you is very short precise and concise because questions that I wanted to ask you have elaborated on them very well. I would like to ask you in the 70s there was phrases used and we continue to hear re-emergence of these phrases again in the post-war era. Taken into consideration of what you witness and experience in the past, I'm asking whether it is it was proper and it is still proper for our activists and stakeholders to impress the minds of the Liberian people where illiteracy is so high with the concept of radical change and taking one's destiny into his own hands. Is these phrases were these phrases appropriate in the 70s? Are they needed now? If yes, why? And if no, how do we go from here? Uh, thank you, Sheikh uh, Kapoor. Let me say something here. You know, in life, people do not set about simply to cause confusion or to cause chaos. This idea that uh, the majority of Liberian people are illiterate, so they don't understand radical pronouncements or analysis, is flawed by logic. What is radical in a man wanting decent health care? What is radical in a man wanting a piece of land to plant? What is radical in somebody wanting decent housing? The people who came and founded this country called Liberia took the gamble of coming by sea on boats. They had no idea that they were going to reach here. So many of them they didn't get here. Some of them perished on Bond Island in Selyum, Shabro. Others died at sea, but they came here against all odds and formed a republic. Radicalism 
is a matter of perspective. It's a matter of perspective. Illiteracy? The only way you can think that people are illiterate, except you intend to use high polluting, polluting terms from your Western education, there is nothing in economics, politics, science that the people cannot understand if you had to convey to them in their own language. The vice, the vice have a script. The Muslim brothers and sisters here have a rich tradition that comes from Timbuktu, where you had the first medical college in Africa. You, the people have languages which must be developed and not allowed to die. Mwalemu Julius Nerere, who was our, one of our greatest leaders and teachers, understood how to reach the people they call quote-unquote illiterate. That was to speak to them through the language. And so Mwalemu Julius Nerere and his party decided that Kiswahili would be the official language in Tanzania. There is no word, there is no word in English that you can find in Swahili. Water, Maji. Hello, Jambo. News, Muzuri. What he was trying to do here was to say, if we were to let our people go through Western education, it's probably going to take us 20, 30 generations to educate everybody quote unquote. So let's deal with the local languages. And so the Vai man has his Vai script. Talk to the Vai man. You think he can understand economics and politics? Talk to the crew man. Talk to the crown man, the guild man. Speak to them in the languages. And I can say something to you. The pants, the, 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 the pain of poverty, the pain of poverty does not know illiteracy or literacy. There is nothing so radical, there is nothing so radical as refusing to understand that you have a reservoir of talent, a reservoir of talent in your rural areas, among your people, provide them with the right education. This is a country, what is radical? That after 161 years, you still have the highest infant mortality rate in the world. After 161 years, you have the capital city which an American Secretary of State referred to as an appalling ghetto. And what I mean, you, you, you ask yourself the question. You've gone through generations, generations. No. The activism of the 70s was necessary to address the problems of the 70s. The activism of the 80s was necessary to address the injustice and imbalances of the 80s. So 1990, wherever there is injustice, there will be men and women who are courageous enough to stand against injustice. If that is radicalism, so be it. So long as, so long as there is arrogance, so long as there is arrogance and the marginalization of the people, there will be their sons and daughters who will demand answer in the name of justice and in the name of God. One of your presidents wrote, and I listened, I listened keenly, to a reverend minister who was dealing with the question of Bakri and was talking about the Lone Star and she said, Bakri said the Lone Star, the beautiful, is the battle hymn of the Republic and she quoted the Lone Star and I said, this reverend sister understands when she got to the main point that emphasizes the battle hymn, she stopped the one that says, rise ye sons of freedom rise defend the sacred heritage against treason and rebellion front in battle lies the hero's way that was Barclay the founding of this society was done by men and women who had nothing those who settle in the rural areas sometimes I wonder our mothers who deliver in the rural areas nothing, simply with nature they deliver and go to the farm 
There is nothing so radical as telling the people, this is your land. Injustice is being perpetrated against you. I remember my father told me a story. And he was not a radical man, he was just an honest man. When he demanded the rights to see his family, and Mr. Topman refused, and my father said, but this is unjust. If Martin Luther King Jr., if Martin Luther King Jr. had come from America and settled in Liberia, he would not look down upon the people of this country as you are doing. Mr. Topman told Cassidy to beat him, and he gave him 25. It was an ordinary soldier's wife who took a bottle of alcohol, gave it to the old man. When I asked him, he said something to me. He said, Tuckman instructed my brother to beat me. He said, no problem now. That is why you must tell me. Because this my brother who beat me. When his son understands, you understand, your brother understands. On your back rests the privilege of these people. When you stand up, it will crumble. We, have not, we are not radicals in the sense of just wanting chaos. We are men of conscience. We went to school, we could have come back home and joined the oligarchy. And joined the oligarchy. We had options. We had options. Because we identify with the people, that has made all the difference. We remain as we are. Every generation, every generation, it was Franz Fanon. Every generation must, out of relative obscurity, discover its mission, fulfill it or betray it. My generation discover our mission to change the society and give the people a sense of being to participate in the destiny of the country. Today you look in the legislature, the sons of the people are represented. We can vote, the newspaper criticize. That is the fruits of my generation's struggle. Tears, blood. Your generation must discover your own mission. But I can promise you one thing. If you stand on the side of justice, and when the final hour comes, and it has to be at the barricade, it won't be radicalism. I will still throw in my lot with the people. Thank you. Thank you. Will you? In testifying, you talk about list. And I was written of names of people for elimination. And that they was read, or the names were called over telephone. Were you later able to get a copy of this list? Or do you mind of giving us the names of some of the people that were told to you on this list? Uh, on, the, on the list sent to me of those who will participate, there's a name of the man who told me about this list. He'll be coming here. He was based in the Ivory Coast, working very closely with Charles Taylor. And he's a son, the son-in-law of the late President Talbot. I'm talking about Mr. Tony and King. He's an honest man, he will say. But I got to find out about this list. And I can tell you some of the names that are on the list. Of course, all the PRC people, Samuel Doe. Then those who had worked, civilians who had worked with the PRC. I know my name was there, I think number five or number six. There's the name of Dr. T. Potier, Dr. Sawyer, most of the young militants. Uh, the name of, of somebody like, uh, uh, Haru Moniba, there was the name of, uh, uh, what's the name, Yekasin. I mean, just name it. And what was so frightening about this list? These were all sons of the people. And unfortunately for them, they had shown this list to somebody who came from that background, regardless of the fact he had been married to Talbot's daughter. So it was a revenge mission. And we don't even have to say, yes, the list. Look at what happened during this civil war. Look at what happened. How is it possible for anybody to lead a guerrilla struggle where after two, 
three years, not a single one of your own people was executed. But one of the sons of the people, Yekesi, Lato, just name them, go down the line, Kopotia. How come? How come? Let's be honest with ourselves. When you had arrested Ernest Eastman, who was the foreign minister of Doe, he was given a green light to go, leave the country. But not so Stephen Daniel. Not so all the brothers who were caught behind rebel lines. They were eliminated. So it was clear, clear to everybody that this was a revenge mission. Unfortunately, they were leading people who had grievances, who were determined to fight. And they had allies. They had allies. And that's why we set out from 1989, to be precise, 1989 September. We set out to stop Mr. Taylor. By any means, and that's what I told the people in Freetown, you don't know what you are doing. One of those who even signed the list that power should be given to Taylor and the MPFL for six months, followed by elections, I said to a friend of his, this man's name is on the list to be eliminated. <laughs> he doesn't understand. He doesn't understand. They will come here, ask them these questions. Let them swear. I swore, I swore on the Bible and the Quran. Because they are Muslims here and I'm speaking to them too. They believe in the Quran, they are Christians. I'm speaking to them, I believe in that. I believe in that. I'm not a tale bearer. It says in your Bible, Proverbs 18, verse 8. The words of a tale bearer are like wounds. For they go deep into the innermost part of the belly. I'm not here to tell peoples. Shikha for my cousin. The Quran, the passage in the Quran. El Mutafi. It talks about dealers in fraud. Dealers in fraud. I don't come here to give historical inaccuracies. I've told you my role. I told you where I stand. There was a list. They knew there was a list. By the activities, the execution of brothers. You know very well, Moses Dopo, etc., etc. You know very well that there was a conspiracy. I was intention, our intention was to stop this conspiracy. Irrespective of the fact that these historical jet crashes had taken the name Patriotic Front. That's dishonor to the late General Kuyangwa. It was a dishonor to the late General Kuyangwa. That was his group. That was his group. No, this is a, you see, you see, if you are fighting against tyranny, then justice will not allow you to carry on such massacre. You cannot, you cannot. But because you are bent on revenge, even the God you say you worship in your pretenses, your white suits and bowler hats, your churches and Bibles, is blaspheming. When you blaspheme in the sight of God, in the sight of man, you are wrong. You blaspheme in the sight of people. It is wrong. It's blaspheme in the sight of God. It says, Vox populi, Vox Dei. The voice of the people is the voice of God. You don't masquerade. You don't masquerade. For a short time you can succeed. But these poor wretched souls that you led into damnation. They have seen through you. They will see through you. You know, I say to my children, because you know, they read the internet and a lot of things were said about me. All kinds of stuff. Pambula, even my mother. Poor woman, when they go and tell her about her son. Sometimes she believes, sometimes uh, I don't know about that boy. You know, they got a famous saying in Christendom you burn the child, you don't burn the heart. And I said to my mother, you know, it is interesting. When my father was put on trial in this country, and people were condemning him, what convinced me more than anything about the absolute, the absolute insensitivity of this oligarchy, I mean, so insensitive that you wonder what arrogance these people had. Was to take my younger brother, a baby from the BDR school, 
and asked him to join a march of students going to the mansion to condemn my father. And I said, but my brother, a baby, I was in Freetown when I heard. And then I said to myself, you see, these people will have to realize that enough is enough. You do not, you do not in a country of equal citizens arrest a man and take his children and put a child on the line to condemn the father. Where in the world, in the history of the world, have children condemned the father? But only in your Liberia. And your reverend ministers stood up in church. I remember one of them swearing in Charles Taylor. And when he was asked, I would do it again. You've got to be honest with yourselves. Be honest with yourself. Somebody asked me a long time ago, say, if you were ordered to go before the TRC, what would be one of your recommendations? And I was trying to be facetious. I was trying to be funny. I said, I will demand that before anybody holds public office, they must go through psychiatry check. There are a lot of crazy people. Crazy people. Listen to them on Sunday. Crazy. Mutilating the Bible. Mutilating the Bible. Turning it into an instrument of prophet lying through the teeth. Calling on the name of Jesus. Pretending that they have a Christian state. You do not walk towards it. Walk towards it. You blaspheme in the name of God. And then you wonder. You wonder. And Charles Taylor told you that he was a Christian. God will use him. Is God a madman to use gangsters? <laughs> So, so, peace be to the ashes of those brothers whose name were on the list. Innocent souls, they perish, not because they had committed a crime, simply because they were who they were. Stevens Daniel, Yekison, Moses Dopo, etc., etc., etc. Thank you very much. to interfere with the proceedings. We beg you please. Commissioner Sida. Thank you very much, Dr. Formula, for your presentation today. I would like to ask you a few questions in order for us to be able to correct some myths as it should light on the events that unfold during the course of our conflict. You talk about the training in Libya that you went there and you had a militant group, you were giving someone two hours to leave Libya. What happened to the militant? Well, militants are militants. Uh, some of them, after we could not leave Sierra Leone because uh, the Sierra Leone government told us that it would be difficult. And in the process, a, a plan was put in place to arrest all those in Freetown who were against the MPFL. So in Bo Kenyman, Freetown, over a thousand Liberians were arrested. My militants were arrested. Some of them were induced and they were led by Kopatia, taken from Freetown, smuggled out of Freetown by the late Kekula Koto into Vanjima, where they joined the MPFL. Others, together with the 975 Liberians, the majority of them perished in Padema Road prison. All efforts to release these brothers were hampered. 
by the Inspector General of Police, the late Bambi Kamara Selyun, and the head of the Selyun Army, Brigadier Toronka. We understood later on it was a conspiracy, they had been bribed. I confronted President Momo after he was overthrown in Sierra Leone. All he did was apologize, but over a thousand Liberians perished in Padamba Road Prison. Our militants were among those. There are a few of them who came home. Uh, they occupy responsible positions. We are very proud of such men. Uh, we feel that uh, they have much to contribute. I'm very happy to say that one of them is a leading member of the national legislature, a decent brother, a young man. And when we talk about young people taking over this country tomorrow, that young man represents one of such people. We talk about men who have political consciousness, who have education, who understand what this is all about. So, some of them, yes, survive. A few of them in the United States of America undergoing studies. Some of them are still around. They're married. Others perish. But so is the nature of the struggle. I remember I came in from Ghana, and after they arrested my people, at the airport I was told that they had picked up about 900 Liberians from Kenemar, Bo, all over, who they claim were against the MPFL. And I was arrested at the airport in Freetown. Asked to go to the police station. And they brought a Black Maria, these police vans. I'm allergic to Black Maria. As a student at Probe College, I led a student demonstration when a crewman died. And obviously, we went to the British Embassy, to the American Embassy, with a coffin representing the dead, the dead body of Kwame Nkrumah. We made speeches, and we got back to college, and there was a girl in college whose boyfriend was very close to President Stevens. And I made the comment, Stevens sends soldiers out to confront us. When the people of Zimbabwe are fighting, and they're demanding that soldiers be sent to fight against Ann Smith and his UDI. And she went and told her boyfriend, and they sent for me up to the college. They came with two black Marias. And I look at these funny vans and say, I can't get into this stuff. They say, you are wanted at the police station. I say, if I have to walk down to the police station, I will do that. I will not get into this. And then about 500 students came to say, we walk down with you. So when I saw this black Maria, in Sierra Leone, after having found out that 900 Liberians were arrested. I refused to go. Got to the police station, and Inspector General said to me, we want to put you under arrest. President Momo has said we should arrest all Liberians, you are troublemakers. I waited there for five hours, they had a cabinet meeting, and I heard it told Momo, we have arrested 900 Liberians. Bambula is waiting to be arrested, and it was one time Joseph Momo Peace be to his arches. He said, you can arrest whoever you want to arrest. A boy man is our brother. He has done nothing. He went to school here. He's married to our daughter. We can deport him, but we cannot arrest him. Probably that saved me. But like they say in history, sometimes men of destiny have charmed lives. I was probably just lucky. Lucky. And so, yes, madam, some of our militants died. Others escaped. Others are men and women with children, and to all of them, we salute them. Thank you. There's also information that some of them came and, as you said, entered NPF, but prior to that time were arrested. Do you have any information on that? Oh, yes, yes, I remember very well. I had traveled to Ghana, and of course they were all there because obviously we had been told that we could not go, we could not stop Taylor. He had support, big support. It's all coming to light. I read, just like you did, the testimony of uh, Cohen, Herman Cohen in America. And now things are beginning to fall into place. The puzzle has started to come together. So we had just decided that we'll wait when ECOMOL comes in, we'll come in and begin the process of billing, organizing for whatever elections. I went to Ghana, and when I came back, I heard that the late Kakula Koto, the late Sam Doki, the late Doug Loye had gone there and had spoken to the leader, the person I left in charge, Kopotier, to come and join them. And I was shocked. I, heard, I called a meeting. They hadn't gone yet. 
And in the meeting I said, what is all this thing about Taylor? And I said, Cooper Taylor. Taylor left you in Abidjan. When I insulted him in Tripoli and told him he was a nobody, he was a reckless hustler and a gambler, he said to me, you don't really know what you are doing. You have brought Kopachia here, he wants to be a Kuyampa. And I said, Taylor, if you can be a leader, why not Kopachia? I said, this man detests you, he doesn't like you. And Kopachia said, well, our people are dying. And I said, no, the Liberian people are dying. Stop this, stop this saying. I say, I'm traveling. I will pray you, stay here. Let's watch the situation. And before I left, he said, nobody can stop me. If I decide to go, I will go. And the second in command, John Lehman said, Doc, ask your Sicilian friends to arrest these people. I turned to him, the late John Lehman, and I said, John, you cannot stop a man who wants to destroy himself. I will not, I will not, and I repeat, I will not imprison Liberians anywhere. I will not imprison Liberians. I will not be a party to the imprisonment of Liberians anywhere. I came back from Ghana. I heard that Pekula Puto brought a plane. About 46 of these guys from Kopotier arrived, arrested, released, fought on the battle with Taylor, Kopotier, in Habel, arrested executed and I heard his last comment one of the brothers who was, was there and ran to, the, to, Ab to Abidjan and he told brother Tony and King that before Kopatia died he said you people are spilling innocent blood Mr. King Mr. The, the, the family told me that you are up to no good and he said my blood which you are sharing you will never succeed that's what he said and this poor man died, was killed for no purpose, like Jackson Doe and others killed simply because they represented what some people perceive as threat and came from the wrong group. That is the tragedy. Thank you. Now you mentioned earlier that when the PRC government took power, initially they had a list where the two Whig Party members were enlisted. And we later found out that 13 of them were executed. You talk about your father was on the list, and then you make a joke why this happened. Did anything happen to the rest of the people that we didn't hear about that were not on the firing scale? No, no. As you know, the list, as I said, I must make this very clear. The list was a list of all two we party members who we felt were at large. Okay. Including the name of the head of the Maserato women, Madam Poe Brown Boo. Our chairman. Chairman, chairman. Chairman. We wanted to know where all the two party people were. So we had a long list of about 64, 65 of them. And as we call the name, Senator this, the team. Senator that, the team. Mm -hmm. We can account for all these people. Superintendent this, the team. Superintendent that, the team. So we didn't fumble at large. They say, why well, the old man got to come? I say, you're joking. So we went along with that. <laughs> so it was not a list to eliminate people. It was a list put together to be sure that we knew where these people were. Now, for the 13 who were executed, I just said, my information was that the PRC members panic when they received this cable that had been intercepted. SOS, save our souls. And of course, the rumor that Vice President Benny Warner had slipped into the Ivory Coast. And for the PRC guys, this was a way to say, okay, even if you're coming for us, these people will not be here to take over power. And so if you look at the people who were executed, they were the first group of people, 14, who had gone before the tribunal. Unfortunately, unfortunately for the 14th person, who was, I think we said Johnny McLean, he couldn't get on the bus because the bus was crowded, I heard. And so they took tight team to the firing squad and they shut them. And of course, you know, I was sitting in my office when I heard that these people had been shot. And I remember my father busting through my office door. My cousin, Hadeen Smart, had called me. She said, they are executing people. And I said, shut your mouth. You know, the people will arrest you. That's not true. She says, what the BBC? Somebody called Anne Bolsiva 
It's relaying this life. I turned my radio on. It was there. Five minutes later, my father came through the door. What nonsense is this? What do people want? And I said, I'm just hearing it. And he said to me, now you are in it. You have to keep your notes because tomorrow the people are not going to blame Sam your door and these soldiers. They will blame you people. You have to explain. The next day he came and gave me a letter. A letter, which if you check the archives of the mansion, is there. I have a copy of my father's letter in my office, in my studies in London. Where he said to the PRC, why carry out this spectacle? These men are finished. You have broken the resolve. You have disgraced them. These guys have known power all their lives. You don't have to go through this. This barbarism will only destroy the image of whatever you want to do. My father's letter to do. To do. And then pressure came from different quarters to stop the execution. Madame, most of the 64 were never touched. As Commissioner Bull can tell you, she's here. <laughs> they were not harmed. History. I beg your pardon? You said, ma'am? Trying to write history. You were trying to write history. It's be good, it would be good to see the last word on history because it's impossible. And one of the recommendations I would like to make to the TRC, after you have gathered all the data, all the data, probably you want to ask for money and get a team of scholars from Ghana, Nigeria, somewhere to write this history. Because nobody is non-partisan. You cannot have the last word on history. There can be no absolute truth. No Liberian can divorce himself from what happened in this country. And the fact that we sit here to answer questions is because as young men, we did not take power to transform the society. Had we been victors then, there probably would have been no need for the TRC. But the TRC must look at itself. Collect the data, very good. But whatever you write tomorrow will be analyzed by future generations. Because if you were part and parcel of a party that distributed poverty, injustice, and disease. history. It's impossible. It's impossible. I've been demonized. All kinds of things have been said about. In fact, I tell you something. At the moment, as you know, I serve as National Security Advisor. And I was lucky enough to see my files going back to the 70s. And some of the things I read in my files, I found very amusing. I was supposed to be everything. A radical Marxist, a communist saboteur, an oppressor, a guerrilla fighter, a sympathizer of Fidel Castro and Che Guevara. I mean, I read all, and I realized that they even had, they even had agents in my classes who recorded me, and I read all of this, and I said, well, this is the problem. This is the problem. You come to the classroom to listen to teacher, teaching young people ideas. And in the back, you got men with guns, in shacks. Over a long period of time. We've been trying to do that. And so we have written constantly, constantly. In exile, we wrote numerous articles against the Taylor regime. In exile, we wrote numerous articles against the Doe regime under various names Stanley O'Day, Musa Keta, Giri Bossier. These are all pen names. Pen names. It was our duty to keep on exposing, exposing the regime's weaknesses. 
So we will write history ourselves. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for expanding for a few hours on how your teaching your teachings prepared you to be a revolutionary and also for expanding on those who you read about and who you mingle with like uh, Lubumba, uh, Kwame Nkrumah, Strokos, Karl Michael, Pan-Africanism, Blyden, Port and others who helped to base on that and explaining your extreme political consciousness and how the understanding of the dynamics of politics. I'm happy that you are placed in a position now to read, to have the opportunity to read what people wrote about you, the rumors, and to see how the realities of Liberia politics. Because if you are not placed in that position, you won't be able to tell the world now what goes on when you are on the opposite side, assumed to be on the opposite side, what your opponents can do. Also, you talk about, uh, at least thank you for admitting that you endorse what happened then and that uh, during the period of time, there was an alliance of opportunity who were not give space to the oppressors. That's how the PRC or young militants felt at that time. We are here, we are here to really learn the truth, whether it's good or bad. We're not here. I don't think history for Liberia now need to just talk about the individual, but just as you say, the objectives what the ideology was. You close by saying that those who make history must survive enough to write history. But sometimes those who did, in fact, those who in fact didn't, will you agree with me that those who did not even survive to write history, that these will still go down in history because history will judge them. So uh, I would like first to ask you is would it be possible to give us some of your documents that you wrote on our pseudo names and could give us some of the names you wrote on our besides Stanley, Obe, Musa, Kita? You know, would you be able to give us that? Because in those teachings, might be able to line something and to put it part of the archives. Uh, yes, ma'am. There are two. There are two ways you can do that. If you were to Google Google H. Boyma Famula Jr., I think about 10 pages will come out of the articles or so. Furthermore, the, there's a book across the landscape. My speeches and writing, selected speeches and writing. There's another book. They all Wait, are could you say what landscape? Across the landscape. Across. Selected writings of H. Boyma Famula. You can get that from Amazon.com. From Ewa, Amazon.com. If you go on Google, H. Bama Pambula Jr., is there, there's another book, Voices of Protest. Voices of Protest, which also can be acquired from Amazon.com. And also the book you can get on that, The Diplomacy of Prejudice. Liberia international politics, where I lay out as a young man my own thinking on Liberia and its politics. And then series of articles. They're all there in various archives, but the best place would be to Google H. Boyma Fambule Jr. And then oh, yeah. they all come, I think there are eight or ten pages. I was reading one quite recently, which is which has been carried on the website by Elijah Kruma. It's called The Evolution of Democracy in a Multi-Ethnic Society. Somebody send that to me. 
and a series of others, ma'am. So they're all there for the records. With You'll be buying them, but uh, I can find a few, download and then send them to you. Or you can do it yourself. I show the commission has some petty cash for such work. They should. Yes, okay. Uh, so, so far, uh, Madam says, uh, Madam wants to know whether those who die, uh, whether they too will be remembered by history, obviously. I don't like to be called Madam. Commissioner Boo or Councillor uh, Boo. Would it be a good thing to call you Partisan Boo? Sure. Sure. Because. Yes, because. Yes, I would love to be. Yes, I would love to be called Partisan Bull because, like you, uh, Dr. Famile, my teachings prepared me. The teaching in political science at the University of Liberia with Dr. Tape and the rest of them who taught me to prepare me for politics. So I did not just learn it, I also tried to experience it and participate in it. So 19, I was about the late 20s, in my late 20s, when I joined the party. So I would love to be considered partisan and also my, my training in law also allow me to participate and run a quota to my to Liberia just like you and all other good Liberians because as you said Liberia is for all of us yes so I want to be considered partisan call me partisan but for now I cannot be called partisan because my functions on the TRC makes it that I had to divorce myself of all political activities for now but I do intend with God's help, I shall continue after the TRC. Uh, yeah, uh, thank, with you, that, thank you, Commissioner. Yes. With that, you talk about, and I want to get the dates, you talk about the speech delivered to uh, Mr. Kier's uh, installation. Was that April 11, 1979 or April 11, 1980? It was, uh, yes, I think you're right. It was uh, April 11, 1980, a day before the coup. You're right about that. Yes. Okay. Also, you said that uh, when you were talking about the realities of Mrs. Torbo, whether or not they... Uh, She said uh, uh, that the pol political reality is that uh, she saw white hands and you gave the political analysis on whether or not that could have been. And you also said in your mind it, was, it could have not been the Americans because they did not or they do not operate in such manner when they want to overthrow I mean, or remove someone from power or leader. Uh, that was buttressed uh, with my question to Assistant Secretary of State Herma Cohen when we had the uh, diaspora hearings in the United States. I asked him that it was Roman that the United States government was involved with Torbo's death and he said no. So you also uh, talked about gave us a clear idea on the role of international actors in our civil crisis which gave us even further lead uh, yet I understand you to say that Mr. Sally Thompson told you that was it Papangida had put 1,000 soldiers on the ship 
to come to help Samuel Kanyan do in 1980? Did I understand that? Well, I didn't get the African leader name. Uh, <clears throat> Madam, uh, Commissioner, let yes. me start first with uh, the question of Mrs. Talbot. Yes. Is by way of historical conjecture, I'm saying it is possible she didn't see white men. It was out of fear that she probably panicked and thought she saw white men. Then I said, let's assume for the sake of argument that she did see white men. It could have been Arabs. Mr. Talbot had involved himself in the Polisario issue. The Moroccans uh, were very, very offended by that. There are serious things happen here. Yeah, leaders have been eliminated for lesser things. And so I did say, probably we have to look at other forces. Now, let me say here yeah, why I'm not convinced that the Americans were involved. You see, and I say we can, we can live at this chapter in our history political opportunism and change in a West African society. I saw the Americans there the day, of the day after the coup. I could see that they didn't, even, they didn't know these people. They had just, they had gone to establish contact, one. Number two, the first sets of arms we got were AK-47. The Liberian army had been using guns from America. Number three, Doe made a trip to Ethiopia. Samuel Doe made a trip to Ethiopia. I was Minister of Education, and I accompanied him on that trip. When we got to Ethiopia, Mengistu Hale Marian, the young leader of Ethiopia, had made, the, had made a statement that in the revolutionary process, one has to be decisive. Because I remember we had a meeting at 8 o'clock to go to a military base. And I was outside when Mengistu came with his, with his group. He arrived at 5 minutes to 8. He got out of his car, waiting. And by 8.15, Samuel Doe had not come down. So Mengistu said to one of his people, can you go and see what Mr. Doe is doing? So the security man went upstairs and came back. When he came back, he said, he's getting ready. And when Doe came down, about 35 minutes later, Mengistu said, in the revolutionary process, one has to be decisive because the revolution does not wait for anybody. And we got all got in the car and left. Now, Doe understood that differently, completely. So when we got to Liberia, I think the next thing he did was to give order for the elimination of, elimination of A.B. Toba and Vani, Vani themselves. Bitter. Bitter. But what is so interesting about that was that the Americans were trying to find out what Doe had learned, what commitment had Doe made in Ethiopia. They found nobody to come and consult. Oh, I'm, thinking, I don't drink water. I don't drink I'm trying to get rid of the poison. <laughs> You know, excuse me, excuse me. No, no, when I mean poison, at, at my age, at my age, it's good to keep out of soft drinks, and eh? the metabolism is not very fast like young children. So I drink water. were very eager to know what Doe was up to, what he had done in Ethiopia, what commitments he had made. And they saw nobody to send but a black American sister who was working at USIA, uh, you say, called Eugene Lucas. I know she was an agent, so of course she came to see me and wanted dinner. She wanted dinner. And to discuss, and I said to her, well, you know, uh, at that age, I said, I'm not in the habit of refusing dinner from pretty women, but I know who you are, and you know who I am. What is it? And she said, our embassy is keen to know. And the questions at dinner that night, the questions she asked me, 
I was convinced that the Americans were not in control. I mean, they did, not, they did not even know, they did not even know who Samuel Doe was. She asked me, was he impressed by Marxism? Was he impressed by this whole idea of the Russians? Was he convinced that Ethiopian had said, but how could he have been impressed with anything to do with socialist revolution? For most of the time, the men wore American Texas cowboy boots and cowboy hats. Joe did not go there to see a revolution. He only went for a visit. I said, tell your Americans to stop this thing. Let them stop worrying. Joe is not going anywhere. He doesn't understand. So we can only push for an election. And based on that, I think they agree. So, you know, the little I know, the little I know, after having read about the, a little bit about the Vietnamese Revolution, the Dem Brothers, after having read about the activities of the Americans in Latin America, in Asia, having read about the Iranian Revolution of Dr. Mossadegh and the movement of the British and Americans to overthrow him or the control of Iranian oil, the letter I know about the assassination of Patrice Lumumba, the various plots against Ahmed Sekou Touré, the various plots and attempts to overthrow the government of Cuba. The Americans don't act this way. They won't send a little known Samuel Doe and six or seven unknown men to go and assassinate a president in a country where they had strategic interests. No. But when it happened, they made sure they were in the position to take control of the situation and exploit exploit the situation to want to stabilize the country to protect their interests and this is why I'm yet to be convinced of the historical records that the Americans had anything to do with what happened in Liberia on April 12th I could be wrong history could prove me otherwise but so far all the records I've seen all the books I've read the letters I've read I'm not convinced and they could have taken some other person they would have taken some other person. And let me tell you what they did in Chile. That is what they did in Chile. They were not satisfied with the popular unity government of the Dr. Salvador Allende. So the first thing they did was to make sure that they could strangle the economy. They made it difficult when middle class and upper class women came on the streets of Santiago with shiny pots. Shiny pots. I was a young student in America, and I said 100 people don't knock shining pots. But they came on the streets, and after that, there was a general, General Snyder, who was very committed to democracy, who was in favor of the popular unity government of Allende. He was assassinated. General Snyder was assassinated. And then General Pinochet led the coup against Salvador Allende. Uh, this is, excuse me, this is the modus operandi of the Americans as far as I know. So why would they want to gamble with a Samuel Doe? They did not know, did not understand, did not interact with him sufficiently. You know, to make progress in any struggle, you must first understand those on the other side. And let me frighten certain people. I think it was Chemomao who said, Tell no lies, scream no is a victory. And we must not claim that we know about the Americans. We done. We done. Uh, Dr. Famile, now that you've uh, put it correctly that April 11, 1980, you gave the speech at a university what the election of George Kerr. Could you tell me, uh, let's go back to what was the nature of the, that speech because the nationalists telling them to be nationalists. Could you just give us maybe the topic and what was the nature again? Make sure. Uh, I think what it had to do some work with is something with our, our own commitment to change. It was uh, the induction of young men. And of course I had to talk to the militants of soup. And so the whole thing was to rally around the banner of nationalism and to support these brothers. And then I said that uh, we are here and we are going to struggle as much as possible. At that time, the PPP the people were in prison. 
And so I was saying that we're going to struggle. We're going to move forward. Irrespective of what has happened, we will not stop our march for freedom and democracy. Basically, I think that was a speech. But you can read it. Like I say, you can just get my book and read that. you get an understanding. Okay. Thank you. We'll take note of that. Uh, considering the conversation between you and Barkas Matthew on 1979, uh, would you would you I got the impression Barkas he said brought out for solidarity there will be a march for rice a rice demonstration had been called and he said that he engaged the people to come out that night he said you all sat on the grave he wanted to know what the itinerary was and he said we were somebody headquarter make slogan and march and you said what if they open fire and he said we will bring alcohol and banish. So you told Formula to Sawyer, this man is a reckless gambler or, no, or does not know what he's doing. So in terms of this, would you consider, how would you consider Barker's math, your man of non-violence or, or what? Uh, because, you know... I'll put it this way, I, I think to be frank with you, Matthews was one of those revolutionaries who had been trained by the system. There was a gentleness about him. I guess he realized the risk. And for a moment, I thought he believed passionately in the Constitution. He felt that I was exaggerating, that these people will not shoot. I think the whole idea about alcohol and ban aid was simply meant to say to me, Pamela, don't bring these alarming statics. And he was convinced because you see, Bacchus had this thing with Talbot. He met with them, he talked with them, etc. And he, he was convinced that they were not. They were, there's no way they were going to give orders to shoot people. He felt it was going to be one of those things where they would get, they would get uh, to his party headquarters. They will shout the slogans, and then they will disperse. And for him, that would be enough political capital. If the Taliban government backed down and did not increase the price of rice, the man who will gain the most will be Barkos Matthews. So it, Barkos was going out for numbers. He was being tactical. I mean, in this sense, he was a tactician. That this is what the people are saying out there. And Moja... You are analyzing this thing beautifully. But the people want to see some action. So when he said to us, and uh, you have in the back was, because when I met him and he said, well, we're going forward with the demonstration. When we met that night representing Moja, we said to him, so we've reached the stage. Because we were having, we were getting intelligence reports that the oligarchy was going to come to teach sense teach people sense. There was a sister I knew who was a nurse and she had phoned me at my house and said, do you know they are transferring blood from the blood bank into the main hospital? It was with this knowledge that I went to the meeting in the graveyard and that's what I asked him the question which appeared hypothetical. I didn't reveal what I heard. I said, but Bacchus, if they should start shooting and he didn't believe it and they did, they did start, people did die, and I think he was just as shocked, and that's what I asked the commissioner, to go back and read Albert Post, Albert Post's beautiful pamphlet, The Day Morovia Stood Still. It's a beautiful illustration of his own frustration in convincing the Taliban Turbo- regime not to open fire, by all means, to allow these people to assemble. And I was told by Oscar Quill, by we can't call up when I went there that morning. So here we are. Here we are. Where do we go? He said everybody's going in hiding. They will come later. At 3 o'clock, we're going to meet here, shout some slogans. We're in touch with Mr. Port and we'll disperse. They were not given the opportunity. They were not given the opportunity. And so, as the Americans say, the rest is history. Uh... Your maybe good friend was that 
Shaka Steven or President Momo, who said to you that the people say that you are worse than Taylor. I tried to find my quotation as I wrote down. Steven said, yes, Shaka Steven said to you, the people say you are more generous than Taylor. How do you, uh, uh, I need a response from you. On well, certainly, sir, it's very easy. I think what the old man was saying, based on all intelligence reports, there were a group of Liberians who were supporting Taylor. These people had access to elements of the Black Congressional Caucus. And they were saying to the Black Congressional Caucus, you see, Taylor has been to Libya. There's no problem. He's our man. We can handle him. The dangerous man is Fambula. You know, he's a communist. He's a communist. And for all my students, that would be very dangerous. He knew me as a young militant at Fulbright College. But to be told by people, especially a major power, that Fambula is dangerous, he's a socialist, he's a left wing, he's a communist. And he said, but they say you are dangerous. And I said to him, no, sir. The people who are purveying this false who, the people who are propagating this, are obviously trying to demonize me. They want the support of the Americans. They feel I can mobilize people sufficiently. They don't want me. They know my politics. Now we have been told by Mr. Coe and other people that decision was taken to support Taylor. And I was called to the American embassy and asked whether I saw a rule for myself in Taylor's government. But here is the contradiction. Here is the contradiction. If I was that dangerous and a left-wing agitator, why put me in a Taylor's government when he was right-wing? Except you wanted to eliminate me. So I saw no rule for myself. In terms of being dangerous, that is what they mean. It simply meant that I was ideologically inclined. And I tell people that. I started off by saying, I am a disciple of the late Kwame Nkrumah. I remain a disciple of Kwame Nkrumah. I remain committed to militant pan-Africanism. That is my philosophy. I follow Nerere. I follow Nkrumah. I follow, if you like, Joe Slovo, Chris Haney. I follow revolutionaries in Africa. I'm a disciple of Gamal Abdel Nasser. My last son is called Gamal Boy Mafambule. I'm a, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a sympathizer of these people. I like the politics. They educate me. It's a politics geared towards the upliftment of the masses. I have not hidden that. I will not hide that. I will be dishonest to say to the Liberian people that if you ever support me, I will keep the system as it is. I will transform the system. I told the Americans that. I believe in transformation. I have seen that it's possible in other countries. People talk about Tanzania. Nerere, when he died, Tanzania had the highest rate of literacy in the whole of Africa, 95%. Look at your country. You can drive five miles into certain areas of this country. If you have an accident, you are a dead body. There's not a single clinic. The Cubans have thousands and thousands of doctors. Are you afraid to ask the Cubans for 500 doctors to send to the rural areas? You know, one thing I've never hidden from the Americans is my politics of nationalism. I will never do that. And I guess I respect them because they know who I am. It would be a disservice to myself, to those who died and who believe in me, and I remember quite well after 1979 when I convinced myself that this struggle must continue. A little boy of 14 came to me on Broad Street. I'd just come from prison. He said, Dr. Fambula, hello. I said, how you do? He said, my brother, 18 years old, died. I said, what happened? He was shot by the police during the rights demonstration. I put my hand on his head and said, oh, I'm sorry. He said, Dr. Fambula, my brother was at that Moja rally when you said the African people are their own liberators. He believed in you. The African people were the only one? The African people are their own liberators. Are the only liberators. Are their own liberators. The African people are their own liberators, right? Yes. Why well, you do we, we repeat it because sometimes we don't understand it.
it and it's going far and wide. So people, why? Let me explain it. to you. I didn't understand. It. It's a matter. It's a matter of consciousness building. It's a matter of consciousness building. The African people will, will must realize that they have a great history of resistance. A great history of resistance. In the time of slavery, there was a rebellion of somebody called Nakhtona, the black slave. In Haiti, there was a black man called Tuzan Lovacher, who revolted against the French. All over Africa during the, the time of liberation, black people were struggling. What we tried to do at that at that, at that uh, rally was to say, don't wait for anybody to come and free you. Come up and get up. And they will not come. You as men and women with consciousness, you will have to decide to free yourself. Take your destiny into your own hand. Demand equal rights in this country. That's what we mean when we say the African people are the own liberators. It has been proven since the struggle for independence. Who liberated Guinea-Bissau? The persons, workers and intellectuals of Guinea-Bissau under Ameka Cabral. Who liberated Angola? The persons, workers, students and intellectuals of Angola under the leadership of the MPLA headed by Dr. Agostino Neto. Who liberated Mozambique? The persons, the workers and intellectual students led by Frelimo first under Eduardo Mulani and then under Samora Machel. Dr. Famule. Madam, can I just finish? It's a teaching now. <laughs> Commissioner. Yes, go ahead. Commissioner. Go ahead. I've taken my time to come before you, Commissioner. I'm a busy man at the moment. I'm presiding over the security of the state. <laughs> Let me say something. You know, I'll come in, uh, Commissioner. I had a teacher, a teacher. He was a very fantastic man. When he was lecturing, he felt that people were getting tired and bored. He would throw in a little joke. People laugh and come back to themselves. <laughs> Madam Commissioner, yes. Yes, and I know one of the traits of a teacher, if you try to your students and you see they're not getting it, you will continue to let them say it over until you show they've gotten it. Also, that's a trait of a teacher. But since you do doing security business, I'm sure there's a lot of my file too, and you'll be objective to know that you've been there and you see what in your file, so you can be objective with mine. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the next thing you said that Adlin Stevenson said with no, no gains if there's no peace there will be no gains now no you didn't say I'm, I'm quoting him now to show too that I you know read read too so but anyway <laughs> anyway you said that you, we, we all have to just dwell on 1980 Samuel Doe because we started with 1955 with the David Comer's episode and also you brought out that your grandfather the late counselor as to counselor that is he Brunel, ran as vice president to the late Edwin Barclay right yes okay it seems as though he must have lost that election and I see from your talk and then what happened to your father. We too were small too, but we remember. And I remember uh, when Doe took over, your father, the late uh, counselor, H. Bowman family sen uh, senior, delivered an oration. I think it was a 26th oration. Well, did he ever never deliver an oration or something? The first anniversary of Redemption Day. Huh? The first anniversary of Redemption Day. 
the first anniversary of Redemption Day. Oh yes, the first anniversary on Redemption Day. Uh, could you, if you remember, could you tell us? Because I know there was some salient points in that uh, 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 Redemption Day. Because also we do history, and he has his own place. So for those who are not here and who didn't remember, he too has his place in history. And also Prince Brown, the late Prince Brown, he was also accused for a, a coup plot. And they had some, uh, they had trials in which he denied it. But with your recollection, did he ever during the dual regime admit that indeed there was an attempt to overthrow, to liberate his people? Do you remember? Who, oh, my father? Prince Brown. Or no, your father? No, I don't know much about Prince Brown. But let me say this about my father. Uh, yes. I remember vividly what he said on the first anniversary of Redemption Day. He, get, he, he said that it was a galling opportunity for the first time in the history of the country when the masses of the people will now be able to choose their leaders freely and fairly. But then I remember he rewarded the PRC. He warned them that they were very young men and they must realize one thing that Samuel Doe was the trunk of the tree the members of the PRC were the branches and Abdurrahman Boy Mofambule warned them the enemies will begin to chip at the branches if you do allow them they will divide you they will chip at the branches when they have cut down all the branches, you'll be standing alone, and then they will cut the tree down. The old man warned, though I remember very well, that was what stuck in my mind. Because sometimes he spoke in parable. And then the question of my father's trial. He read wise, widely. He wrote. I remember an American journalist called Victor Dubois has a piece, the trial of H. Boy Mofambule. And he sat in the court for two weeks and listened to the old man. And he wrote, he said, I sat there and listened to a Winston Churchill, Charles de Gaulle, a Kwame Nkrumah, a Nelson Mandela, a Lenny and a Mao Zedong all roll into one. Because the old man really expressed himself. About him wanting to overthrow the two party government? No. I discussed with my father. When he came from prison, released by Tolba, sick and broken, after spending 23 hours every day in close confinement. I wanted to know, I was grown up, about his trial. And he said to me, Do you realize that I have always been critical of what was happening? I didn't hide it. I remember in his studies, he would take the seal of Liberia, and all great revolutionaries have this fantastic sense of humor. And he will write where they have the Lord of Liberty brought us here, the old man will put under the wand of money will carry you back. <laughs> and I will laugh at what about He said these buggers love money so much. That's the problem. We laugh about it. And I said, but what this whole idea of you talking about accusing you? He said, no. What these people really did, they met. Among themselves, they had said that Tottenham was growing old. He was sick. The possibility existed that there would be a change. And that the people were mobilizing for that change. He said, so elements of this old oligarchy, they look across the landscape. They say after Tupman, the people could demand that one of the sons become president after so many years. And they watched the landscape. And they singled him out. Why did they single him out? I found later on. The journalist who wrote Mrs. Talbot's book, who wrote Mrs. Talbot's book, he died not so long ago. Gordon something, a British man. I ran into this man in London at the African Center. And he was talking about his long involvement with Liberia. How he knew Tupman or so. And then 
he made a slip. He said, you know, he didn't know who I was. He said, there was a diplomat here in London, a young man, and that man was very critical of the oligarchy. In fact, I informed Topman that that man should be watched because he was dangerous. He said later on, of course, he was arrested from Nairobi. He was arrested in Nairobi, charged for treason. You know, sometime in politics, one must have unlimited endurance. I sat there, I watched this man telling me that he had elected the regime that my father, who was reading philosopher, philosophy, very critical as all young men in London, he had told the government. My father said, you know, when they look across the landscape, the person they saw was Fambula. And let me tell you something, which was very a historical coincidence. I'd come from Freetown in 1966, going to join my father in Nairobi. I ran into a young man who was a cadet at the foreign ministry, own executive mansion. This young man was a student at CWA. I had gone for my passport. He said to me, you're from Bullet Junior. I said, yes. And how is your father? I said, he's alright. What is it? He said, I read the reports of all the ambassadors. I'm very impressed with your father. His analytical reasoning. He's a very interesting man. I said, yes, and who are you? He said, I'm a cadet. I'm called Barkas Matthews. I said, thank you. This was 1966. Marcus Marches. He was a young cadet at the, uh, at the foreign ministry down there. And so my father felt that these people had zero in on him. And in order to keep the people fighting, they were going to set an example of him. They were going to set an example of him. But what they failed to calculate at that time was they would give him a platform. A platform. Not only to educate the world as to what was happening in Liberia, but to show the iniquity of a system where you would take an ambassador of your country, charge him with sedition, and within 72 hours you change that to treason, and you throw him in prison like a common criminal, and you sentence him to 20 years imprisonment, confiscation of property, hard labor. The significance of his trial was that he had already seen himself as a sacrificial lamb and he was going to use the court to put them on trial, to indict them. Read his trial, which he did. Which he did. And then as you know, Tuckman died in 71. Talbot, who was vice president, came up and said, if Ambassador Fambula is innocent, God will reveal that to me, I'll release him. But you were there with them, you should know whether he was innocent or not. A few weeks later, the old man was released. So, the old man was never involved in any plot. He was critical, yes, as an educated man, as a man who had read economics, philosophy, logic, a man who was a lawyer, a trained lawyer. He was critical. But to say he was involved in an attempt to overthrow government, that was left to small fambula. To organize with people in Moja to see how we could push this oligarchy. Which we did. And do I have regrets? Do I have regrets because the oligarchy fell? Then you don't know your history. It was my mission from the time I was 14. It became my dream from the time I slept in prison with my father. Cell 9, cell 11, it became an objective that these people had no, no reason to rule an African state in a continent searching for identity. And so, and so, Thank you. Those, who, those who feel pity for the oligarchy, those who feel pity for the oligarchy, uh -huh. write your history and sympathize with that oligarchy. <laughs> Thank you for giving us this piece of history. Thank, thank you for giving us this piece of history because the tree is never dead until the last seed is dead. So although Mr. Famila is dead, but his seed can give us this history. What year was he released?
Philippines. The OMA was released in 1971. It was December 1971. Thank you very much for participating in the TRC process, being a part of history as an actor, a part of visionary, a participant, and writing history, which we hope that whenever we call upon you privately, you'll be able to give fill in the blanks and help us. Thank you. Good afternoon, Mr. Witness. Okay. Good afternoon, Good afternoon, Commissioner. In your testimony, you answered probably all of the questions I would have asked. So I have just two short questions for you. As you speak of your experience and the experience of your your family, basically your father, uh, being arrested for treason and being demoralized under the guise of being a communist, I'm just trying to understand what was happening. Uh, politically as a country that people were being arrested and charged with 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 uh, being communist what was going on with the communist thing uh, I think two <laughs> two reasons and you see we had a repetition of this in history each time a government in this country feels that it is losing touch with the masses of the people it throws out this socialist communist car. This was during the Cold War. Dole tried to do the same thing. Tuckman did it. This was a way of winning support from the Americans, more support, more support. This man had been in office for almost two decades. Even the Americans, reading through the works of uh, Professor Gus Libanov, have started sensing that there was a need for change. And those around Mr. Tuckman knew that he could not go on living for long. But well, how do you get the Americans to support you? This was the height of the Cold War. The Americans were afraid of any nationalistic government. And so this, this whole thing was thrown out about communists trying to overthrow the system. And Ambassador Fambule was this communist agent. Even when he was reading books to educate himself, to educate himself, books that other people are using to educate themselves, he wanted to educate himself. They said he was reading books of, uh, of Lenin, of Mao. My father said, I am an ambassador of Liberia. You sent me to represent you. I have to interact with the Russian ambassador, with the Chinese ambassador, with ambassadors from other countries, the British ambassador, people who are well educated. What do I tell them if they ask me questions? I don't understand the word. I will have to read and educate myself. So it's a simple, it's a simple tactics of these governments. Tuckman, the communists were here. And so the whole thing about Pambodas try to give themselves a briefing space was that in peaceful Liberia, where the Americans had so much invested, so much interest in terms of the communication system, this and that, and there was a communist, a high profile communist an ambassador who wanted to change the system. This man could not be. The man was a, he was a Muslim. He said his prayers. Communism, the business of communism is atheism. It's materialism, dialectical materialism. He could not believe in that. I know my father prayed, he went to the mosque. How could he be a communist? But they said this, people bought that. Mr. Torba did the same thing. When people were saying, don't increase the price of rice, there was a demonstration, people were arrested. They took pamphlets of little students, little boys who had gone to Cuba for the youth festival. One of them, very brilliant young man, had brought back to Liberia the sands from Playa de Ron, the Bay of Peaks, and he was showing his colleagues, the yeah, sand from Bay of Peaks, the famous resistance of the Cuban people against the brigade coming to overthrow the regime. He brought this, they collected all these things. And the next thing we knew, there was this little pamphlet, the hammer and the sickle, communist foreign threat to decivilize Liberia. The communists were coming. 
the same ploy, the same little ploy, the same ploy that was during the Cold War, when you could fight in the Americans with all these lies, these tales. Today, Liberians are here. Chinese building them university, fix their stadium, building schools. The Chinese are good. The Liberian people say they are building these things. In those days, Omar Fambola perished in prison because he dared say that we must open up and embrace everybody. So I don't mind being called what they want to call me. Since you have not called Fambula a thief, he has not stolen money. As a young man, he served Minister of Education, Minister of Foreign Affairs. Fambula cannot be accused of exploiting the people. I'm satisfied what you call me. That's up to you. I know myself who I am. I have not told you anything about what I believe in because that will take an entire analysis. But the problem here is that this country, this country must realize that it was engaged with all nations of the world against the fundamental background that the leadership understands its interest. You cannot be afraid of people. If the Chinese come, deal with the Chinese. If they can help your people plant rice, deal with that. If they can build hospitals, if the Cubans can come, if the Americans can come. And to show off yourself, you are not niggas, you are black men and women. So why are you afraid? So the whole communist boogie was meant to frighten right-wing circles in the United States. Right-wing circles, I say. Not Democrats. Right-wing circles in certain European countries. Fascists, like those left by Franco in Spain. Those left by Mussolini in Italy, those left by Hitler in Germany, who formed the metamorphosis in apartheid, backward fascists. These are the people who always use the communist boogie. And when you had these long tailcoat, bowler hat, uh, caricatures promoting that, people believed that. At the university, we're all communists because we, we taught something different. How can you send somebody to school in the United States? He comes back with a degree and he's teaching students, students with very critical minds. I agree, some of them have fires in the stomach, ideas in the head, but they can analyze for themselves. To even condemn us that we're communists, indoctrinating students, is to disrespect the very students because they know what is good for them. And finally, most of the students who went to my classes are today so the biggest right-wing elements you can think about. Not that they didn't learn, but student politics is student politics. They get there with ideas, they toy with ideas. They graduate, they get married, they come out of universities. They are men, they have to take care of the children. That's when you know who the real revolutionaries are. Not when you are young men in the university. We all went through that. We all wore our khaki trousers, t-shirts, Che Guevara, berets, sandals, impressing people. When you graduate and have children to feed, a wife who depends on you, a household, and you remain a revolutionary, ready to pay the price, then you are a revolutionary. Uh, Dr. Famule, amongst several things, the TRC mandate has um, asked us to also recommend reforms of the various institutions, including judiciary. So my next question is aimed at actually uh, trying to help us understand what has happened with certain systems and how probably when we get to the point of making reforms, we can be uh, uh, better informed as to how we can go about it. You were exposed early on to how brutal any political system can, uh, can be. You were in prison at a very young age, um, between 18 to 19 years old and then in later years as an adult. I would just like for you to share with us some of your experiences in prison. What were the conditions in, in prison? And whether in later years when you were in prison, whether anything changed? Well, put it this way. Uh, if you like, I had indoctrinated myself to believe that in the struggle, in which I was involved, anything was possible. 
I realized that death was a certainty. It was a certainty. That's why when men wanted to fight and I believed in what they were doing, I decided to, yeah. I wanted to join them. Yeah. Uh, prison, uh, the prison system was no different from prison anywhere. It is, uh, if it's horrible, I guess it depends on what you expected in prison. You go into the villages, the peasants live on the bare floor, they sleep on the bare floor. They're exposed to the elements of nature. A prison is not meant to be a, a five-star hotel. So obviously, yes, we're giving dirty water to drink, but I expected that. We slept on the floor, but what's wrong with that? If you check your country, about 60% of the people sleep on the floor anyway. Oh, mass. No, no, no. I, yeah, prison conditions didn't change me. In front of my... Uh, the authorities were nice. They allowed, when I was a young boy of 18, when I was a man of 29, I arrested. My, my mother brought food, my relatives brought food. I had all I wanted in prison. I was allowed to read books and so. But uh, no, uh, there were harsh conditions, but then. <laughs> a brother in America, I remember, I was talking to him one day about the Black Revolution in America. And he said, you know, you said a brother of us, a brother of ours said something very interesting. Don't ever call yourself a revolutionary until you are willing to eat grass to survive. Until you are willing to eat grass to survive. So that stuck in my consciousness. At the center prison, I was put into 4B around with mosquitoes and everything. We had standing room only. But then at night, the brothers, uh, respect for the university teacher, managed to get a cabo. And they opened up the cabo and put it down and said, uh, Doc, you must sleep. I said, no, I cannot sleep. We must all stand up. So the cabo will be for all of us. So we stood up, talking to ourselves, enjoying, anticipating what was in stock for us. Then I was transferred to the, the main prison on dead roll, and they had one of our militants right where the gallows was. His room was right before the gallows. And I would walk by him and look through, and I would say, the gallows are right behind you. That means we are all dead men. I said, but they will take you first, eh? So we laugh about it as young men. And you see, frankly, as young men then, especially we who came out of Moja, we were prepared for any sacrifice. We felt that they were going to kill us. They will kill us. We were not afraid. Frankly, there was nothing like fear in our bellies. All the time we stayed in prison. But then we we're, were in the, the murder cell. We met some interesting people, talked to them about their experience. Talked to them about their experience. But by 1979, frankly, after the rice riot, the regime realized that it had blundered. And so they improved the condition of food and other things. Slightly, they improved the food. But come back to my arrest as an 18 year old doing my father's trial. I was in a room with three grown men. And this day they brought me outside. There was a son of the oligarchy who had brought in a servant. And all this servant had done, he had broken some plates. And they brought him to the prison. I was outside waiting for some relatives. I was a young man of 18. And that was my experience of the injustice of the system. And this young man, I know him and I will not call his name until the time comes. Said to the jailer, this man was disrespectful in the house. He broke some plates. My mother talked to him, he wanted to talk back. Gave him 25. In my presence, they beat this poor man. 25 latches. I went back into the cell and told my father. My father says, that's how they treat the people. That's how they treat the people. I still remember that. That was in 1968. By 1979, Prison conditions were all right. When I became Minister of Foreign Affairs, 
Some ladies came to me and said the relatives were in prison. They had spoken to the Red Cross to go and improve the prison. And I said, Madams, I'm, Madams, I'm very happy that you want to improve this prison. Because you see, I was there. Now that your relatives are there, you're going to improve it. Tomorrow, it will be good for all of us. That is why today it's good that we build good prisons for those and not just put them in prison. In prison, we must train people, give them some skills in prison. You know, sometimes I wonder the amount of medical doctors, engineers, political scientists, lawyers who sit, who rot in prison, who rot in the wasteland. Poor people's children who, if given the opportunities, are far more brilliant than we are. I taught students with my PhD. I read some of the papers. These students were more analytical than I was at that age. Brilliant people. So you're wasting all this talent by keeping your people trapped in wretchedness and poverty. You cannot. So the prison system will be improved. But in 1979, Fambule did not feel that the prison was bad because I was a political prisoner and I was convinced that being a political prisoner from the prison, I thought I would, be, would have been shot. So as long as I stay in prison, it was better than be taken to the gallows. So my calculation was, the longer I stay here, the better. But of course, that did not happen. And thanks to those on the Brownell Commission, thanks to the Liberian people, who made it known to the student masses that they will not harbor a treason trial in our execution. Thanks to them. And that is why we say, until we give out the last breath, we will continue to struggle for the upliftment of the people, their participation in the democratization of the society, so that their children, so that their children will not beg on their knees for a homeland that the fathers will have won for them on their feet. This is our dream, this is our goal. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. for coming, providing so much insight. Thank you very much for coming and providing so much insight. In your responses, you have, as my colleague mentioned, addressed most of the issues that have come up as questions. But again, for the enlightenment of the public, uh, would you bear with me as I ask you uh, a few questions which may seem like repetitive? Now, there are stories that the formation of the MPFL was done by Moja, or should I say the MPFL, the stories go, was founded by Moja in Accra, in Aburi, in Aburi, Ghana. Can you comment on this? Is there any truth to this? Uh, before, I, before I begin to answer Commissioner Stewart, I must say, I mentioned here about a young man who, whose room was by the gallows. I wanted this public manner to pay homage to Commissioner Stewart. He was a young man who was facing the gallows. I want to pay homage. <laughs> in Aburi. The meeting in Aburi was the meeting of Moja. 
to take an assessment of the situation, the political economic, and economic situation in Liberia. It was to deal with the question of what will Moja do in case of an elections which were going to be called by the military government. Since our people were all in exile, with the exception of Dr. Amos Sawyer, we asked ourselves, were we prepared to go in an alliance or were we going to go for the election and challenge door? The MPFL was nowhere around. Taylor was still, I think, either languishing in prison or somewhere. I don't know where he was. There was nothing, nothing whatsoever. We met in Aburi. We discussed the possibility of reintroducing ourselves into the system for the democratic elections. We left from there with instructions to our militants to come back home and assess the situation and to then discuss with Brother Sawyer how the party could be registered and what we wanted to achieve. This was before the banning of the LPP and the UPP. So no, Commissioner Stewart, there's absolutely no truth. And I ask you the question, why would Moja, why would Moja militants with the political consciousness Men who had gone to the literature of political struggle, why would they organize and then delegate the leadership to a Charles Taylor? How? How? There's no truth, it's not possible. We're capable of doing this. And I've said to you, we, some of us who broke away from the movement later on, decided to take that part. We were capable of leading the struggle. Why a Charles Taylor? And let me tell you something. This is why the Libyans deported some young Liberians who had gone with Joe Wally. He had sent them to Libya. They got there, and all of a sudden, they saw Charles Taylor. And they said to the Libyans, what is this man doing here? The Libyans say he's a friend of Blaise Campari who brought him. They say, no, he's nobody. He shouldn't be here. The Libyans asked them out. That's not true. That's not true. We have never, ever associated with the MPFL. I challenge all the MPFL founders who are alive, whether in America, Liberia, Ghana, Nigeria, or in The Hague. <laughs> I challenge any one of them to come and tell the Liberian people that Moja or Fambula ever associated with the MPFL. Who are political militants, we just don't follow people. We just don't follow people. That's not true. Well, not true. We never, ever, and we were never, ever associated with Mr. Taylor and his MPFL. Now, there are those who, in their attempt to understand the dynamics of uh, Liberian political history, who always lead the charge that things were all right into things were all right in Liberia until the quote-unquote progressives, progressives came around. Uh, can you comment on that? I'm sure if you take a very old chief from one of the kingdoms and ask him, how was Liberia? He'll probably say to you, why for what my forefathers told me, Liberia was all right until the coming of the Elizabeth. That's the ship that brought the settlers. You probably say that. <laughs> oh, Liberia was all right before the coming of these people. Let's go back a bit. Let's go back a bit. Elections in 1955. The execution of Dede Koba and his son. Liberia was all right. The persecution of D2. The persecution of Koli Tamba. The arrest of T.R. Briswell, his death in Belayala, Liberia was all right. The fake treason tries of so many people, including my father. The arrest of student leaders, like Emma Koma, Timo Wallace, Quinga Harris. The persecution of people, Liberia was all right. The discrimination, this is your problem. This is your problem. 
Oh, of course it was all right. It was all right for those who held power. It was all right for the oligarchy. We did not constitute West Point, which is a ghetto of horrendous poverty. We did not put our people on the plantation to work ourselves, sniffing acid for plantation for, for, for five stone. We did not create these slums and conditions of our people. We only interpreted the reality to them. In the country, with such vast economic growth, it is possible to provide low-cost housing for people. It is possible to provide quality education. It is possible to do this and do that. We had no, we had no alternative. The worst kind of human being is an educated man who is blind to reality. The worst kind of human being is the educated man who is blind to reality. You are being dishonest. So what did we do? We want, you want us to be like our fathers, brothers and uncles, who changed their names and were assimilated and kept quiet? No, no. That was a different era of history. It was a different era of history. We had come into a position where our movement was the movement for justice in Africa, Moja. We identified with liberation movements where black men were taking arms to redeem themselves, to win their liberation. And then we were reading Nkrumah, we were reading Sekutre, and you expected us to come and fold our hands and say this system where they wear Bola hat and take over and go to the Missouri craft and where they throw signs in court to convict people. You know, probably, probably these people who condemn us, these people who condemn us, it's possible that in the end they will be grateful to us. Because our sacrifice made it possible for us all to be here. Unfortunately, a lot of our people died. But for us to be here today, and that we have the opportunity to elect our representatives to talk about transforming our country, they should be grateful. Because Mr. Talbot would have left left the office, they could have been taken by Mr. Richard Henrys or Mr. X, who believe that we must create more but two stands all over the place. They could have been worse. So for God's sake, for God's sake, even if we didn't come, even if Moja didn't come here, even if Paul didn't come, Liberia would have imploded because of the developing contradictions in the society. I was at my father's shrine. I sat there. And when he talked, the students from the University of Liberia and Lapar who clapped for him, they were understanding what he was saying. Understanding. Gus, J. Gus Lubinov in his book, The Evolution of Privilege, called that the panic button. Even if we had come, are you telling me that the people will have continued to support by the poverty and ignorance a discarded, a discarded social system and a false and bankrupt aristocracy? Are you saying that to us? Probably you can only say to us that you read the situation well. You can accuse us of being political opportunists, of reading the minds of the people, of understanding the trajectory of history. That you can say. But to say if we had not come, and you really think, you really think, if Mandela did not appear, nobody would have come in South Africa. If Dr. Nato, this is the policeman theory of history. <laughs> that individuals, one individual, they can make changes. If the objective, if the objective conditions are not right, and the people are not willing to listen, you can have changes. We were only articulating, making clear what the people were already feeling, but could not say, could not articulate. So, how does a poor, hungry man understand that the exploitation going on in Lamco and Five Stone, such exploitation was being done through his sweat and blood, was only to show him the reality. To show him the reality. In any society, where wealth is so skewed, where 2-3% of the people control 64% of the wealth, that is a recipe for disaster. 
You don't need no social scientist to tell you that. It's simple. And this is all we did. Now to come back after all these years and accuse us, demonize us, that it is because of us that your peaceful society, what peaceful? Do you know how many rubber tappers were dying every year on the plantations? <laughs> Do you know how many babies were dying before they could get to the hospitals? What peaceful society do you have? It's a sign of spirit agents all over. It's a sign of the rule. 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 Please understand your history better. We did what we wanted to do in the context of our time. My generation felt that we could not live like our father's generation. And because of that, we agitated for democratic changes. Whatever happened on, 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 through that, these were unintended consequences. But so is history. History has a lot of unintended consequences. Men do not set out to change history the way they want simply because they do not have they do not have the, the ability they are not gods to say history will do this if I do this no it happened these are unintended consequences they could have come with a soldier just been frustrated because he was not paid adequately by his boss and he would probably shut it so probably we must understand our history better don't blame us. Don't blame us for what happened to your society. Blame your history. Blame your history. Your history of iniquity, of injustice, of arrogance, of brutalization, of imprisonment, of hounding of the people's children. That is your history. That was what was rectified, or the people thought they had rectified. You can't come to a country. You can't come to a country and rule for a hundred plus years and still have the highest rate of illiteracy with one of the fastest growth rate after Japan since the Second World War. You cannot. You cannot accept you keep the people in chains, keep them blind, keep them illiterate. But the contradiction was that you had to open a system, send them to schools, bring television, because you were part of the globalized world. And the people's children asked questions. The slave revolts in America were carried out by slaves who had read the Bible. Because the Bible said, if you close your ears to the cries of the poor, you too will cry. They read that. So they went against the old slave mentality. Yeah, yeah. You say to the people, you are Liberians. You have a constitution. And then you keep them in wretchedness on the plantations, etc. And you expect the sons to sit and say, I must be somebody. The only way I can promote myself is to change my name from Collie to Jones or whatever. No, no. That is an identification of oppression. Because what you are telling your people, you don't have any identity. It was not for nothing that brothers came from America and started changing the names back to the original. It was a form of protest. A form of protest. I can sympathize with those brothers. I didn't have to do it. Because my father being a conscious man, said my older sister will be called Miata Aminata. I will be called Boima, Braima, or Ibrahim. My brother will be called Bokai Abubakar. So we knew where we came from. But other brothers have seen the contradictions, so they came back. This system is not right. I do not have to be a Mr. X to be accepted. I'm educated. I do not have to join the Masonic craft to be somebody. I will go a step further and say I don't have to be a member of a particular church or marry into a particular family to be somebody. This is my country. And people must be promoted on the basis of merits. There's nobody's farm. It's not your farm. It's your country. It's my country. And the same way you are passionate about a country, I too am passionate about my country. And if you institute tyranny, as a nationalist and patriot, it's my duty to oppose you. And that we will do. Some people in the 
a term that demonization referred to us, I recycle politician, I said in a speech, insofar as injustice is recycled, we will be around, we will be recycled. Insofar there is injustice and poverty, we will be around, we will be in circle. Because we have to fight against this. If, if we must build a society of cohesion, a society of unity, we must begin to respect every man and woman, irrespective of where they come from. No matter who they are, you cannot claim any special right to the soil because your father was from a roof, you grew up. Your symbols, a young brother, a young brother said to you, look at your symbols. Look at your symbols. We've been saying it for years. Your years. You don't want to meet in the National Sovereign Conference and deal with this question of your symbol. They are symbols of domination. The symbols of domination. And so your falsified history must be rectified. And people say, but the history has not been written. It is not that it has been written, it's that you have not read the history. That is the problem. You have read the history that you want to read, that they want you to read. There is, there's a lot of history out there which deal with Liberia and the crisis in Liberia. The problem of identification, who are we? And let me say something, it's just a joke. I was saying to a brother in Nigeria, I said, you know, the war is terrible. It's terrible. But you know, there is something positive. Many of our people, especially from our so-called upper class, they have come to Ghana, Nigeria, they've gone to Syria and Guinea. I say they now realize that civilized, so-called civilized, educated women from the upper class wear African costume. They feel proud. I say, in my country, they thought would the market women wore these things. Before they stopped, they went to the national functions, burning heat, gloves, bowler hat. These people, I said to him, these people never thought they were African people. They never thought they were African people. That is your history. So examine your history. See the crisis that you develop. And your tragedy is that your fathers and forefathers, most of them were not courageous enough to confront the problems. So they threw the problems on the lap of their children. And their children inherited the problems, like Talbot and others, who inherited the problems. But whether I can tell you something, do or no do, moja or no moja, pal or no pal, PVP, the way this society is organized or was organized, it was just a matter of time. Just a matter of time. That's when we came in. Thank you. Now, against the backdrop of uh, what has been said, and I have reference to, uh, to what you referred to earlier, but Herman Cohen, former Assistant Secretary of State, against the background of what he said during the TRC hearings in the U.S., would you opine that the involvement of Burkina Faso and Cote d'Ivoire in the Liberian crisis somehow received the tacit approbation of the U.S.? Let me say, you know, the late Ahmed Sekoutoure had said to us, A.B. Torba had been killed together with Bani Sherman. After the execution of uh, Thomas Wethen, I had taken over the foreign ministry after Barker's marches. And Samuel Doe sends Podia and myself to Guinea to go and explain to Secretary that the late Wethen had killed A.B. Talbot. Our delegation got to Guinea and they took us to the Palace de Perp. Of course, I'm a secretary, white and red, he understood so much. The first thing he brought up, he said, I noticed that your students are agitating. And the late podium said, the students are troublemakers. I'm a secretary said, no. When you took power, the students were rejoicing. If today they have turned against you, 
It's positive. It's because you have changed. Students don't change. Not until they leave college. You have to examine yourself. <laughs> Bonia then said, Head of State Doe wants me to tell you that the list was sent, the Vice Head of State, executed A.B. Tolman. Uh, Secretary said to him, Secretary said, Hufe is not a man who forgives easily. He said when A.B. Tolman was arrested from the French Embassy and put in prison, Hufe Boni sent to me to ask me to intercede with Doe to free A.B. Tolman. Secretary said, I sent my Prime Minister, Lassana Biogogi, to Do. Do said to me, there was no problem. Ebito was all right. He will go, he will go to try. A couple of months later, the news got to French intelligence that Ebito had been executed. French intelligence then informed President Hufe Boigny. Hufe, Hufe Boigny again sent to President Touré. He said, I've learned that A.B. Talbot has been killed. Secretary said, I send the abogi again to head of state Doe. Head of state Doe said, it was not true. Now you have come to me to tell me to tell President Hufe Boini that A.B. Talbot was killed by the late Wesen. And Secretary said, Wesen is dead, he cannot defend himself. But I can tell you one thing. We all have to die and answer to our maker. But Hugh Boyne, knowing him as I do, he will not forgive you. And so yes, when Hugh realized that there was a group willing to overthrow Samuel Doe, and it was stated, it was stated at the hate trial, by one of the leading members of the MPFL that they were giving arms while waiting for Libyan arms they were giving arms by the Agorian Defense Ministry of course Hufe Boini knew and because of Hufe Boini's connection in Paris it is possible that he convinced the French the French were heavily involved he convinced the French that Taylor should be held we have information from our sources that the son of the President of France of, 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 of President Mitterrand was in con con contact with the Taylor people. So obviously Burkina Faso, Blaise Campori will only be courageous to send 700 to 1,000 soldiers into Liberia if he had the tacit endorsement of the French. To Hufi Boigny. Yes, now it's just possible that the French, knowing that they were going to support Mr. Taylor, Knowing the connection of Hugh Feboini to Mr. Taylor and his group, and also Blaise Campari, it is just possible, it is just possible that they could have sent a signal to the Americans that uh, we can handle this, we can handle this. And that was the problem the Nigerians had. Because the Nigerians had the potential, they had the capacity to destroy the NPFL. They were stopped at every step of the way. And they kept saying to themselves, what is happening about Liberia? Why do we find it so difficult to get a consensus, a consensus to move in with full force and stop this war? Arms were coming through the Ivory Coast. So if you like, at a particular stage, because of the involvement of Hufi Boini, because of other international actors, this whole internal rebellion became a vast international conspiracy to help the Taylor people to stop such you know, other forces who were perceived to be anti-whatever. So yes, I think and I, I must appreciate what Mr. Cohen said to you people in America. He knows, he has seen the records, but we can only conjecture that there was a desire by certain international actors to ensure that Mr. Taylor took power in Liberia, irrespective of the fact that he was coming from Libya, which was a pariah state, with all its values antithetical to the values of certain international partners or actors. So yes, I believe that sincerely. And so obviously at the end, 
Mr. Taylor was given the presidency. But like all historical mirages, Mr. Taylor ended the way he did. He ended the way he did. Because this society is complex. It's complex. To rule a society, you have to understand the actors, the various forces. Why was it possible after a few years? Learn, model, all these people popping up. You cannot take power through guns and then intend to suppress people when they have already taken guns before. This crisis here, yeah. this crisis in Liberia was a crisis of leadership. 1997, the Americans, the French, the entire international community. Through the instrumentality of Peter Boy and his people, even the Nigerians have conceded to Taylor that you are president of Liberia. You are president of Liberia. We deal with you. So why all this aggression? Why all these movements into other countries? What are you trying to prove? What are you trying to prove? So that was the tragedy. The tragedy was, as Mandela said recently, it's a want of leadership. You have been given power. Develop your country. Your opponents are in exile. And you are making you are making a joke to your supporters. When I leave from here, some of them will come walking with sticks. They will be so old. Vision 2021. The man didn't have vision for 20, uh, 2001. He talked about 2024. But this was the reality. So it was a, it was a, 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 a serious tragedy of leadership. And that's where we got to where we were. With more wars. With more wars. So yes, Mr. Sewell. The Ivorian Sewell Bond is there. But of course, we paid close attention to the tribe because we ourselves did not know certain things until we started following the tribe. And now the puzzle, the puzzle, is all coming into place. It's all coming into place. Our arrest, the killing of our militants, the killing of Liberians, all these talks in Washington. Socialism, communist, socialism, communist. Only to make way for a tailor. But like they say, history poses no problem for which there is no solution. Now, against this backdrop, would you agree with those who hold the view that Côte d'Ivoire, Burkina Faso, even the U.S., in a way, should pay reparations to Liberia for the kind of havoc that was wreaked by someone would describe as the marionette? You see, you see, my brother, uh, Commission Stewart, men who rule country, or women who rule country, will have to realize that politics is not a Sunday school party. <laughs> The Americans have their interests to protect. They will protect their interests. It's possible the saw Taylor as having momentum. The Ivorians felt that Mr. Doe was anathema. He had killed A.B. Tobber. The old man was aggrieved. Blaise Campori had to do the bearings of the old man. So these countries obviously gave support to Charles Taylor. All nations must realize as they say the fundamentals of international politics. There are no permanent friends, only permanent interests. What they did, they did against the background of the perception that Mr. Taylor would probably be better for the interests. Now, if you talk about these countries being reparation, I gave you a good example. Most people do not know that the Americans are spending over $250 million every year to keep the unmade forces here. To keep the unmade forces. The budget of unmade in Liberia is close to $800 million. The Americans are paying over, over $250 million. I think that's reparation enough. Now, it's possible some people say, pay more. But you see, nations have the interest. You must understand how you engage them. And that is why the leader must be a strategist. You must identify where there are ideas or interests of convergence. 
If you ask America to pay, and America say we not pay, are you going to invade New York or Washington? <laughs> Blaze Campari. Blaze Campari. Blaze Campari. I've never been to Burkina Faso. I was a great admirer of Thomas Sankara. And I always remember his famous quotation. A soldier with our political education is a potential bandit. That was Sankara. I've never been to Mr. Kampara's country, and I hope I never go there while he's there. Kampori has been identified by the United Nations as a, a seller of arms to UNITA in Angola, as a trafficker in diamonds, as one of the men, the one of the men who fomented digitalization in West Africa. Have you heard anybody talk about Kampari going to war crimes or so? That is the nature of international politics. Mr. Kampari has big backers, huge backers with nuclear weapons. Kampari is going nowhere. That is what I said I did not realize. This Kampari has been this, the epic center of all destabilization movements. In West Africa, in East Africa, nobody has taken him. Nobody will take him. They were even organizing ECOWAS meeting in Ouagadougou. No, it's different. You can't force them to pay reparation. La Côte d'Ivoire, they have their own crisis. They will tell you that was Hugh Feboni, that's not us. You want to name and shame them? Do so. But what, what would it benefit you? Are you going to now sell the blood of your people who have died? The over 250,000, you're going to pay, ask for payment for the blood? Ask for payment for the blood? That they were instrumental in promoting wars? No. What we do is that we strengthen our country, educate our citizens, so that tomorrow, no army, no old man, because of his relationship with people, can invade our country, even when on may leaves. It's our responsibility. I think to go groveling before these people, begging them, pay us reparation. Liberia is destroyed. So, other nations have been destroyed through wars. Angola, 30 years of wars. Other people have fought wars. Nicaragua, Vietnam. They are building their own country. The worst thing you can do to the, the memory of those who died is to say to those who were responsible, the ex external actors, pay us for the death of our people. You don't do that. Instead, what we do, we establish a massive monument and select a day in our history where every day we go and remind our children and their children that men died because of so and so reasons. And we must make sure that this will never happen again. That's what we can do. Let us not be beggars to those who laugh that because we were weak on the develop, that they could do what they wanted to do to our country. Our duty and your duty as young men and women is to ensure that your leaders strengthen your country, empower you as young people, not to be afraid, but to be able to defend yourselves at any time. So tomorrow, these borders will not be porous. If you don't do that, and you go to Mr. Kampori, you go to the Ivorians, you go to the Americans, what they will conclude is that these poor black people are now selling blood for money. It's, it's not blood diamonds, it's blood for money. The people have died, they are begging for money. We got gold, we got diamond, we got rubber, we got timber, we got iron ore. We got marine resources. People say we are rich. It is not reflected in the welfare of our people. We must be bold enough to say we will seize our resources and deposit them in the laps of our people. Our partners can walk along with us. And so the message we send to those is that when we strengthen ourselves and mobilize our people, if you dare come again, you will find a united people, angry and determined, that there will not be a repetition of this history. That's all. Thank you. Now, uh, as
as a prominent politician and a political scientist, how do you reckon the, I'm talking about the Liberian situation, how do you think uh, the politics of the Cold War impacts regional decision making vis-a-vis the resolution of the Liberian crisis? Well, you see, I think it was very easy. Now, after the Cold War, it was obvious that nobody could play the card. Nobody could play the communist card. So people like the late Ruth Boini and his partners in West Africa decided that, of course, they would support whoever they wanted to support. But when the Nigerians came in with ECHO, the whole Liberian peacekeeping took another dimension. Because under President Babaginda, the Nigerians were determined that the Nigerian army will not be humiliated in Liberia. They were determined. But they realized one thing, that if major powers were supporting Charles Taylor, there could only be one reason. And that was to humiliate the Nigerian army to such an extent that it would go back home, implode, and there would be a change. Because, you know, the Western powers had an example. It happened in Argentina. The military had taken power in Argentina. A very repressive military regime. And when the Western powers wanted to destroy the Argentinian army, its legitimacy, it simply went into the Faulkner's. When they got into the Faulkner Island, they were beaten back. When they went back home, the people said, this is an army that cannot even defend our sovereignty. So, what legitimacy do you have to rule? The army had to go back to the barracks. The Nigerians were always aware of the Argenti- Argentine example. That if they were not careful in Liberia, they would be shamed into withdrawing, and Mr. Taylor would crown his victory with the defeat of Nigeria, which would then have to deal with the problem of Nigerian citizens demanding a civilian rule. And I'm saying here, what obtained here was that the, the French, and I say, I may bold to say, the French have always been suspicious of the Nigerians in West Africa. Because for them, they felt that the Nigerians had this policy of Pak, Pak Nigeriana. Like the Americans have theirs of Pak Americana, or Pak Britannia. That the Nigerians had this whole thing of a Pak Nigerian, Nigeriana. The Nigerians were also very wary of the French. Because France was the only major country that supported the buyer France in the struggle for secession. The French was the only, France was the only country. So the Nigerians were very hesitant that with the French involvement through Hufe Boini, they had to be very careful because France would never allow the defeat of a group supported by Hufe Boini in Liberia. And it's possible, it's possible, it's just possible that Abacha got the signal and decided that Nigeria should cut its losses and leave with power given to Mr. Taylor. Yes. The regional configuration of power at that time favored Hufi Boini because he had serious backing. Serious backing. And he exploited that. You can't blame him. You can't even blame Mr. Taylor. And the whole idea of the Cold War at its end, at its end, if you were to bring up the question of communism, the Americans felt that this system was dying. Any African who toyed with the system was crazy. And I still believe, I still believe, in my heart for heart, that one reason why the Americans probably abandoned Samuel Doe was when he started dealing with Nicolae Ceausescu of Romania. The Americans felt that this was the end of the Cold War. The Soviet system was imploding. From within it was being destroyed. Ceausescu was the last remaining Stalinist communist. And he was moving around to solidify his position. It was the time that Samuel Doe brought him here, gave him a doctor degree, brought in tanks from this man. And for the Americans, Mr. Doe didn't understand the nature of the international struggle. And so yes, those who promoted Mr. Taylor and helped him had a conjunction. The whole idea of the regional grouping of power on a Hufi Boini, and also the fear of certain international actors that no, 
no pro communist or pro Russian or sympathizer of any communist will imagine in a West African country. This was the age of the American century. I think that's what Mr. Cohen was trying to say. This was the age of the American century. And so therefore, Mr. Doe fell victim to forces he did not understand that he, would, he could never comprehend. Ditto for Mr. Taylor. With the fall of communism, there was no more. He tried several times to pin this, eye, this exile as communist sympathizers. But he failed to realize with the, with the end of the Cold War, another boogeyman had emerged. And that was so-called Islamic fundamentalism, which the Americans realized. And poor Mr. Taylor, out for business, probably decided to deal with elements who came looking for diamond without him realizing that these people were members of Al-Qaeda. Al -Qaeda. And so therefore the Americans felt that, but this is a dangerous young man. We gave you power, we allow you to rule, we've been interacting with you, and you bring Al-Qaeda to Liberia. These were the people who blew up, who blew up the, the Twin Towers in America. And at the, at the head, some of the people said, yes, we knew them, we saw them. These are pictures the FBI put out. These are the people Mr. Taylor was dealing with. For the Americans, that was unforgettable. Like Doe, like Taylor, was strange. Now, as a follow-up, given what you said, what would you say were the perspectives of other players in the sub-region like Sierra Leone, Ghana, and how did such perspectives shape or help to influence the outcome, the final outcome, as we saw it, or the, the developments in the uh, sub-region, so to speak? Well, let me start with Sierra Leone. Let me start with Sierra Leone. <laughs> that I know a lot of. I had, I had revealed to the Sierra Leone authorities because I found out in Tripoli that Fodisaka was very close to Taylor. And I had spoken to the ideologue of the RUF, a fellow called Professor ha uh, Cleo Hansis. He's dead now. The one who gave me the RUF manifesto in 87. And I had told the Sierra Leoneans that there's going to be trouble, that these guys are coming called the RUF. I have a problem with them because they are dealing with this man called Taylor. So for Selyun, they had to stop whatever was developing in Liberia. So of course, Mama was predisposed to ECOMOG being formed when we realized that it would be necessary to stop any regional confrontation. The best solution would be to go in as a force. In the case of Ghana, the Nigerians felt that they would go into Liberia. They had a responsibility as a major player to stop the crisis in Liberia. And so they wanted to convince the Ghanaians to go. That the Nigerians felt that if they had come in alone, it would give the impression to the French, the Ivorians, that they were stopping the interests of certain people. So they convinced the Ghanaians that if we want to help sister African countries, we have to go as a force in there to make sure that we separate the belligerents, the fighters, bring these people to discuss. It was based on that, that President Momo offered his country as a base for the Nigerians who had gone in with the 1,004 men force when they couldn't stop in Morovia. The Ghanaian government was convinced it was necessary to come into Liberia to help. They sent forces too. The Guineans who were ready to come to those aid, but had been told that they would have to fight a war, probably with the backing against Ivory Coast and Burkina Faso, they decided to join because it was in the interest to ensure that no pro burkinabi or pro Ivorian regime took power in Liberia. And if you notice, President Daouda Jarawa of the Gambia was then the chairman of ECOWAS. Every Francophone country refused to be a part of the initial ECOMOC. The four countries, except Guinea, the four the countries who were involved, Nigeria, the superpower of West Africa, Ghana, Sierra Leone, 
Gambia and the one country which still maintains its position like secretary did that it would be non-aligned and neutral. These five countries. Iberians refused to come. Of course, Burkina Faso was not coming. The Senegalese refused to come at first. The Togolese said they were not coming. Benin said they were not coming. So the ECOWAS force was only the force of English-speaking West African country plus Guinea. Plus Guinea. And so the reality then, the reality then was that you had to now get into Liberia by hook or by crook. And once Samuel Doe sent out the message that he would turn over power to anybody except Charles Taylor. An interim government, as I said, was formed. And ECOMARC responsibility was to bring in the interim government, install the interim government, divide the belligerents, separate them, go for a peace conference, and try to resolve the Liberian crisis by taking very little casualties. But you know the history. Taylor refused, established his own government. He said he was not a gun for hire for any politician and he would fight until he got to Morovia, fighting in shore with the backing of his key supporters, the Libyans, the Ivorians, the Burkinabis, and as we have found others who felt that they could exploit the situation, they could exploit the situation. So we come back again to political opportunism, why they exploited the situation, why they did not support ECOMO. That is what the historians are still trying to understand. Had ECOMO been supported at its fullest by West Africa, the war would have been over. The war would have been over by 1991-92. But there, there were divisions within ECOMO, serious divisions. And the Nigerians who took the brunt, the expenses of making the peace by 1997, with the pressure from back home, they felt that it was enough to give power to Taylor. But that didn't end the crisis in Liberia. It was the beginning of a much more horrendous war, a much more deadly war. The consequences, you all know, as many of you were here. Now, uh, I won't say much of a follow-up, but there were some who appeared before the TRC were placing blame on those who had supported the, the ECOWAS initiative by charging that they were the cause of the problem by forming a government while a president was still sitting in power and uh, creating such a problem. Of course, uh, there are those who dismiss that. What would you say? But you see, it was very interesting because <clears throat> that's very interesting. Because we were getting intelligence reports. I mentioned the visit of Dr. Abbas Bundu to Morovia, and he was the executive secretary of ECOWAS. Dr. Bundu went behind rebel lines, Taylor lines. His impression was that Taylor was popular. The women had spread their lapel for Taylor to walk on like Jesus entering Jerusalem. And my famous quip to him was that, well, you know what happened to Jesus afterwards? He had come to Morovia. He had come to Morovia. And he had met Samuel Doe in the executive mansion. And Samuel Doe had argued that he would give power to anybody except Charles Taylor, who he condemned as a fugitive and a thief. He said that to Abbas Boone. And he said, I am ready to move from this mansion with my feet first before getting power to Taylor. So we understood this was going to be a fight to the end. Taylor on one side, over the BBC, referring to Samuel Doe, don't mind that boy. We're not stopping for that boy, that boy must come down. Doe on the other side, refusing to accept the indignity, saying to the executive sector of ECOWAS, who had been sent by the leaders of West Africa, I'd rather die here than turn power over to Taylor. And so, the idea of the interim government was the middle road. Doe is ready to go. He's ready to leave Liberia. If Taylor is interested in elections, let him stop where he is. Let's negotiate. This interim government can only hold power for, for, it, for about one year. It will go. It's a temporary solution. He refused. If Ecomark had not come in, I can say something to you. 
it will have been it will have been a total destruction of this country it would have been a war which would have engulfed the entire sub-region because if ECOMO had not come in the Guineans were determined to come in based on the ECOWAS defense accord they would have come into the, into those uh, on those sides the Nigerians would have come in on those sides the Iborians would probably have been forced to give more support to, to the Burkinabis to come in on the side this would have been a battleground fought by proxy armies of certain international actors. Our calculation was that the interim government was the only temporary solution bringing the interim government. If you control 90% of the, of the population, you control the country, then let the interim government come and then go for election in one year. They refuse. They refuse. And they attack ECOMO. The war dragged on. So for those who say, if you had not come in, that again, that again, is how policemen think. If Mr. X doesn't go here, why won't happen? It doesn't. If Mr. Taylor had agreed there and then to calculate as a political strategist and say, look, the people want me. I'm popular. In Morovia, they're saying, let the Taylors teach everything together. People are shouting, I'm over the radio. The BBC lady told me, I said, why are you always calling Taylor? He said, Taylor is radio. People like to hear him. <laughs> if you had that support, then go one step backward, two step forward. Say, I will hold on to my position. Let the interim government come. But I demand we have elections within nine months. Why did he refuse? Who told Taylor to refuse? It was very simple. Taylor too must have heard what Samuel Doe said. And Taylor's calculation was that if he allowed the interim government to establish itself, the horrors taking place behind his line would be revealed because Ecomor would go behind there. And once Ecomor revealed the horror, the masses of the poor would drift down to Morovia and election would have been lost by Taylor. That was his calculation. I am convinced beyond all reasonable doubt. That's why he formed his government, NPR something government in Bangla. <laughs> as simple as that. So to those who say if the if Ecomot had not come, I say please. If Ecomot had not come, probably we would not have had a library, we've had arches. 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 Because the Guinean scheme in Ecomok. The Nigerian scheme in Ecomok. They had the force, the potential. And probably if you say, then Doe would have been in power. Who knows? Historical conjecture again. Who knows? Now, if I should digress a bit, the late backers uh, Matthews, uh, sometime before his death, and this was right around the time when I was much talking in the air about memorializing the the uh, fighting officials, government officials who were executed and an apology from the Liberian government for the execution of those 13 individuals and in response more or less the late Bagos Matthews had declared that he would have sought uh, would have come to the TRC and would have sought to make a case for reparations for those who were killed by the security forces in 1979. Uh, would you think, would you have supported such a call? Do you think it was such, was it uh, a befitting call, more or less? But you know, <clears throat> you know, Marxist always uh, Marcus was a, Marcus was a tactician. He realized what he was doing. And this whole idea of reparation, I think he was trying to say, okay, here we are, at this point in history where we are now recognizing the Titan. And when you recognize the Titan, you are blaming me for my agitation. Let's go back to 1979. What about those who died? And let me say, I will say what the actress and singer and activist Mary Makeba said one time. She had a beautiful song praising Sekutere, and she was condemned by some people that Sekutere was a tyrant 
And Makeba said, in life as in history, we have the right to select our own heroes. We must select our own heroes. For those who feel that the Titan officials were the heroes, don't begrudge them. It's good for them. But we have our own heroes. We have our heroes. Our brothers who were killed in 1979 during the rice demonstration. Tiara Bracewell, who died in Belayala. Juan Nimle, and so many others. Koli Tamba, Raymond Horace, all these people, these are our heroes. If anybody feels that they have a right to erect monument and to build to build a, a, a law court or so and name it after a man they consider a hero, then we say to these people, this hero of yours presided over the exoneration of men who killed a guy called Barry because he took a candy from the shop and put it in his mouth. Now, if you want to call that man your hero, we have our heroes too. We have our heroes. At the moment they are not recognized, but the time will come when the history of this country is written, they are going to be recognized. So let us don't say we want reparation for anybody. I come back to this idea of asking for blood money. These are historical realities. People were killed because these people felt threatened. They had no regards in the sort of these people. But we will never endorse their, their interpretation of who the, two, who the two heroes of this country are. That's their perception. They are free to hold that perception. Let them choose the heroes. We will choose our heroes. As simple as that. Why quarrel? Why quarrel with anybody? Somebody mentioned here the case of Matilda Newport. I say to people, but when they have vacation, holidays, Matilda Newport, I don't observe holidays. Somebody said Topman birthday. I think it's buried somewhere there. They say Topman. Topman birthday, I go to work. I don't recognize him as a hero. But you can recognize him. That's up to you. If you feel he was a great president of Liberia, I never thought he was a great president of Liberia. So please, allow the people to honor their heroes. We must honor our heroes. And that is why, and that is why, And that is why, with all our political differences as militants, when Brother Bacchus Matthews died, we walked behind his casket from APD headquarters to Atonan Thomas Studio. We attended his funeral, a befitting funeral for a man that the people recognize as the hero. We were not going to listen to those who will condemn because they have a different interpretation of history. Their interpretation of history is contrary to our interpretation of history. So the question of hero must not be something that we fight over. Like they say, one man's freedom fighter is another man's terrorist. Another man terrorist is another man's freedom fighter. I know my heroes. I follow my heroes. I honor them. Others, why they're celebrating the birthday of the heroes? I don't go. I don't honor them. And what is so interesting, nobody has asked me the question of why I will not go to a law school who's been dedicated for such and such a person. Nobody dare ask me that question. I'm nobody's servant. I'm a public servant. Nobody will say to me, why didn't you leave your house and go and put, to put a flower on top of the grave? Nobody dare ask me that. And as long as you respect me, and you respect my perception of who my heroes are, you can go ahead with your masquerade. It's up to you. And so, we live and we all decide to work together for Liberia. The question of heroes a question is just like food. 
or the wives we choose. It's a matter of individual taste. The food you eat, the food I eat, I will taste. The women we marry, I will taste. As simple as that. And that's how the whole question of hero is. And what we must never allow. We must never allow those, those who were part and parcel of that which we resisted to make us feel guilty. We can never be considered victims. Finally, as we engage in the uh, TRC process, intended to uh, contribute, so to speak, to lasting peace in Liberia, from your perspective, what would you consider as potential threats to peace and stability in Liberia and in the sub-region as a whole? Uh, Commissioner Stewart, I was asked to talk on 79 to 203. And, uh, you know, it's a very tough one for me simply because whatever I say now will be interpreted as coming from the National Security Advisor. These are modern times. I think I will just be superficial as much as possible. You don't have to answer if you... No, no, I will be superficial, very superficial. I think, I think there's a question of the democratization of the space that we have here. We must find a way whereby the next political dispensation, we can decentralize power as much as possible to the rural areas. The involvement of the people in a selection of the leaders at the various levels, the electing officers like superintendent and the local parliaments. Every county has its own local parliament. We must move away from this idea that people who represent district represent an entire country. We must bring more people on board in the legislature. I mentioned having about 25 or 30 seats put aside for representatives of the workers' union, representatives of the farmers' union, representatives of the religious council, representatives of the student movement. So if we go into a legislature of 64 elected representatives, we must then have about 35 or 40 representatives cutting across all tribal groupings, represented institutions, bring people on board, more people on board. Engage the people. Our teacher, Malemu Nerere, taught us that in the third world, a leader does not just give instruction. A leader is also a teacher. You have to engage your, our people constantly. Obviously, there are people who feel serious, serious grief. There are people who feel they have been wrong. Our duty is to engage them. It's not that you will change the hearts. But we engage in them, we talk into them. Regionally, steps have been put into place by ECOWAS to handle the situation. That there can be no more eruption like the Liberian Civil War that spill over into Sierra Leone, that spill over into Guinea, that spill over into the Ivory Coast. ECOWAS has put into place mechanism to address these things. The United Nations has put in place mechanism to address these things. Locally, locally, what we probably need before our next election is to have a national sovereign conference where representatives of all the people, the chiefs, the farmers, the students, the workers, the market women, representatives, we can all sit down and discuss for a month what is the itinerary of the march. Where do we go? After elections in our country, what then do we do to get our people involved? This is necessary. Because the people who resent power the most, the people who resent power the most, are those who feel that they are marginalized without any attempt to reach out to them. In any society, not just in Liberia. It's a matter of calling people 
and discuss it. Discuss it. Because you know, we were getting worried. I for one was getting worried until people started saying, but we seem to be going back into the same thing. And they said, Fambula, we condemn you. Because of all your preaching, when it came to the last election, you didn't support a populist candidate. And I said, excuse me, running a modern state is a very complex thing. You don't play with people destiny like that. What we'll do will now empower all Liberians. I'm happy when I see the members of the legislature, brothers from among the people who are engaging the executive branch of government. This is healthy. The next election is going to be healthier because many young men will come. They now see that they can influence things in the legislature. It's going to be very competitive and we must encourage this. That is why the newspapers, I think they have 40 something for my latest count, they come out intermittently. But let the people speak, let them go over the radio, let them say what they want to say. If you are not satisfied, engage them in a debate. The idea of political tolerance is to persuade people to follow you, not to brutalize them into keeping quiet. A brutalized people who keep quiet are very dangerous people. Because whatever happens, they will stand aside and see you doing battle with those who want to get at you. The more involved the people are, the more we engage them, the better, the better. So I will say, open up the democratic space. Let the people discuss. I think the Chinese said something like, let uh, let a, let a hundred flowers blossom, let a thousand schools of thoughts contain. Let them say what they want to say over the radio, over the FM, in the Hatai Center. I spoke to the Swedish ambassador. He said, if you have one desire, what will you ask me to do? I said, I will beg you to find money and build three or four libraries in Liberia and stack them with books and documents so our people can read, so they can argue from informed perspective. So let them talk. It is their country. If they are conscious and go to the polls, if they want to gamble with the destiny, that is their responsibility. Let them answer to the children. I hope, I hope, for the sake of the Republic, my people and my children, I hope I have not gambled wrongly. So far, I do not think I've gambled wrongly. I thank you. Thank you very much. Dr. Formula, thank you very much for the elaborate and wonderful presentation that you just made to us. First of all, I was very impressed by your depth of knowledge and understanding of the struggle here in Africa for freedom, liberty, and justice for all. Secondly, I was also inspired by your passion for what you believe. And thirdly, your honesty to accept responsibility for what you did after 1980 and not pass the buck, but rather be willing to work in rebuilding and changing things for the better. I also agree with you that historically, a time had come in history where change was inevitable. Our only point of difference may be the methodology of that change. So my first question has to do with the point that do you believe that um, the methodology of change can affect the influence of the change at the end? For example, we had a change that involved a violent revolution. Whereas there have been other historical examples of revolution. We compare the Russian Revolution, which was by the French Revolution rather, which was violent and bloody, with the so-called glorious revolution of England, which was more a passive but yet focused change. So 
would you like to comment on that? I mean, could there have been another option for our Liberian change or the so-called African perspective? Especially when I look at the issue that in 1982, there was scheduled an election, which meant within about three years. And already the two-party system confronted with the global issue of um, respect for human rights, the United Nations, and all the other pressure, the battle against the communist forces, had sort of made, and then especially the death of Todman himself, had reached us to a point where it seemed that automatically that process of change could have come if it had been properly balanced and channeled with the right ideology and vision of leadership. So could you please give us a little discussion on that possibility or prospects? I follow what you're saying. You see, the methodology used in terms of violence <clears throat> was not brought about by those who were agitating for change. I'm glad you mentioned that an election was scheduled for 1982. So I go back and say, and I quote Albert Port, who is an authority on this, since we're dealing with a hypothetical situation. So what happens if the government of Talbot had listened to Albert Port? What happened is the police had not opened fire on April 14, 1979. What happened if the Talbot government had only said, let them demonstrate, let them go ahead. They are not your boys. Let give them some, if I give them the police ban, let them march to the streets of Morocco. <laughs> so what would have happened? I ask you. Those who were agitating, I made it quite plain that we had analyzed the situation. We were focusing on the election of 1982. And we had our forces in place. We knew that, and we were being very practical politicians. The leader of our movement, Dr. Tipote, was from the southeast, had rumored in Morovia. On the other side, Dr. Reverend Tyre was from Nimba County. This was an amalgamation of the Cry and the Mendemel group with a scattering of people from Morovia who believe in our politics, who felt there was a need for change. Like the young men and women who had gone to the Bikiana Congress of the Tui Party and had demanded that certain changes be made within the structure of the Tui Party to reflect the ethnic balance of this group. So what would have happened if the Tory party had listened to Albert Port and refused to have a confrontation to show that he was in power. What would have happened? It's possible that there wouldn't have been a violent change. It is possible that Mr. Talbot would have retired in 1982 after presiding over an election. And let me be bold to say, it would have been possible that Moja would have won a free and open election and the process of social transformation would have continued and there wouldn't have been any bloodshed. So you see, historical hypotheses can be, can be very fluid, they are volatile. What are we talking about here? We are not talking about young men and women who consciously say we need violence. Although some of us had read Hegel, we understood lordship and bondage. We understood, we understood the passage we had read, The Force of Violence in History by Franz Fanon, Bismarck, the politics of iron and steel, we had read all of that. But the Liberian society was not developed to that level. I think what sparked, what sparked this gamble for the winning of support was the fact that PAL was taking advantage of the possibility of mobilizing people around the rice demonstration. Moja was on his way to register a political party to begin to agitate for 1982. I think with the reality in a society, the students at the University of Liberia demanding changes at Cottonton, students asking to be heard, I think the panic came from within the two party. Men who had not been used to this kind of confrontation, which was moderate, moderate, but any stretch of the imagination. People acting within the confines of the constitution. No group had arms, Paul did not. When they transformed into PPP, they had no arms. Moja had no arms. I sit here, I can state categorically. So, what happened? Who introduced the question of armed violence into Liberian politics? 
Was it two with party? Was it two with party? And after they introduced the armed violence, they miscalculated. For the soldiers they were depending on, since, since realized that with the guns, they could go one step further. They could take power. Why they brought us in? Because they were looking for legitimacy. We are the people agitating for democratic transformation. We were the people on the line talking about opening up the democratic space. Allow the people the right to choose the leaders. My movement, Moja, has even gone to the extent of putting forward Barrow Sawyer as a mayor. A mayor or candidate. We wanted to test the system to see whether they had in place the mechanism for free and fair elections. Of course they have bought the elections. So, yes, it would have been good. It would have been good if, of course, we did not have the violent response. If we had leadership material that realized that in dealing with aggrieved people, you can use water cannons. You can use pepper spray. You don't have to use life ammunition. When you put the people's children in the mortuary and they see the dead bodies of the children, they only pray to God that your time will come. <laughs> That's all they can do. So I throw, I throw the question back to the landed commissioner. Do you think the methodology of the two-way party moving towards election, the transformation of the regional and international system, do you think, do you think that if the leadership had exercised the tolerance, the patience and the understanding, it could not have handled the demonstration and save us from the tragedy that we experience? If this was an enlightened party, if this was a party of men who were conscious of their responsibility to society, why they show of force? Why they show of force? What did you want to demonstrate? What did you want to demonstrate? The various wars you fought in this country were different wars. You were successful, yes, but this was a different time in history. So what were you trying to show? It was their desire to show that they could control power. And let me say this. I remember very well, after the Rice Riot, there was this talk again, Mr. Talbot, by certain elements of the oligarchy of the Tui party, that he was weak. He was not decisive enough. And the son of one of such men said to Dr. Zamba Liberty, my father says Torbert is weak. What we need to do is to carry out a massacre or a few of these rubble rousers, noise makers. And we can hold this thing for our children for the next 50 years. So I'm convinced that they were trying to prove a point. That this agitation for them was not confrontational. It was annoying because of the arrogance. So they would teach these upstarts a lesson. They would teach these jigger please a lesson. Sons and daughters of peasants, how dare you request to have a share in power in the republic? This was the mentality. And so go out there, shoot them, bury them. They're poor people's children. They only have money to go to funeral homes. Who's going to bother with them? So you came out and you kill people. Once you address the political issue by violence, you were yourself in the eye of the storm. And that came a year later. How do you blame us for that? How do you blame those who are agitating for the rights of the people to vote? We didn't bring the soldiers on the streets. We didn't train the soldiers. You did. You did. And that is why a leadership must be wise. A leadership is leadership is not by dressing, but only by dressing in white, waving, waving a stick in your hands. That's not leadership. It's in understanding the tempo of the society, where your people are going, what they believe in. And I am convinced, beyond all reasonable doubt, beyond all reasonable doubt, and I say this here with all sincerity, on the morning of April 14, 1979, if Mr. Talbot has said to Mr. Albert Port, I will accompany you to these people. These are children. These are little boys. What do they understand? I will accompany you. 
and I will discuss with them. And what I will do, they say they can bring rice for so and so price, I will give them $10,000. Let's bring rice, let's see. Oh, you want to demonstrate? Go ahead. Go ahead. But if your supporters behave unruly, you are going to be irresponsible. That would have been it. It would have been it. A brother said, he said, yeah, well, probably they should call us and giving us jobs. No Moja were not after jobs. We wanted power to transform the society. That's why we're fighting for the elections. So I'm saying here, yeah, it would have been a good thing for, us to, for all of us to go to our churches, to our mosques, to our schools, to our homes. And nobody gets on the streets. And there will be peace. Since history does not give people the luxury of deciding which action to take. If you blunder in history, sometimes you pay dearly for your blunder. And this was happening to the two way party. Now, if you ask me, do you regret the two way party falling from power? Is there a hungry man who ever regrets the opening of a store for free food? <laughs> Politically, 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 we'll have to do more study of the two we party. More study of the two we party. So, to the Honorable Commissioner, I say, I understand your argument about methodology. I would have rather the two we party had wiser men, or the two we party had listened to the young people at the Buchanan Congress, had carried out the necessary changes, had embraced the people of this country. And if Mr. Talbot was bold and decisive enough, he would have thrown his lot with the people and not be dragged into the depths of conservatism by the old guards who wanted no change, who were not in favor of change. So if you like, Mr. Talbot was a sacrificial lamb. In history, in history, we do not recognize good intentions practical deals are what matter, not good intentions. You can be Jesus Christ. That's uh, It's not for nothing he hasn't come back after 2,000 years. Good intentions are one thing. Practical reality is another. Mr. Talbot, for some people who says Mr. Talbot was a good man. He had good ideas, good intentions. Poor Mr. Talbot. After top man, history did not give you that luxury did not give you that luxury of keep on believing in good intentions. The people wanted transformation. If you were not about to accommodate the wishes, Mr. Talbot, you had to be a sacrificial victim, your own people. And the people will show no sympathy. And they show no sympathy. Please. Please. For the young men and women who are part of the two party, I think you have to do a serious introspection of the shortcomings that brought us to where we are today. We wanted elections. We are Democrats. Even we are revolutionary Democrats. Like those you believe in in America, the founding fathers. We are Democrats. We wanted elections. And I said to you, yeah, we were convinced that election in 82, we could have won such elections. But it was you. It was you. Who thought you could gamble with violence? You gamble. And you know what happened to gamblers? Sometimes they win, sometimes they lose. <laughs> Serious, you lost. You lost. And that explains our tragedy. Thank you. In summary, I understand that what you're telling me is that we regrettably lacked righteous leaders at that transitional point. Because just as you said, uh, why didn't Talbot or the Chui party make a change? They couldn't have. They were filled with the inertia 
of their history of 100 years of selfish rule. So the change had to come from those who were making the initiative to change. They should have had the wisdom to know better. Like you said, Mr. Mark Matthews maybe didn't have that and he was naive in just trying to approach a system with people who thought, he, where he thought they would have just, you know, naturally given up. But that was a naive approach. But others like yourself and others who have that understanding of the historical struggle somehow would have felt there should be an understanding and a clearer plan. Because if somebody else even had offered the sacrifice of Tolbert, let's say he became a sacrificial lamb, but somebody else offered that sacrifice, the transition into a peaceful Iberia would have been smooth if it had not been for the fact that you take someone from a difficult environment full of resentment and, and, and concern about being not given any hope in life and you put that person in a position of power and seat, it's not easy. So that was just my, my yeah. thought of reflection when I asked that question. But, but, but uh, Commissioner, let me, let me say something about that. And it's very interesting. We, know, we must not put on the blinkers of policemen. It was not Talbot, he was symbolic of a system. He represented an oligarchy. And what I've been trying to say to you and others is that you see me, myself, a boy my family. This was a man who was demonized. There was not a time when he was, I was even called or any of my people to say, can we discuss about the future of Liberia? We were hounded. Security people in the classroom, not to listen to our lectures, but to hear information. Now, if these people were suffering from historical inertia, they couldn't move, then probably we should ask ourselves the question, if they couldn't move, then what gave them? What gave them the audacity to feel that those who were on the street agitating could be silenced, could be silenced with guns and bayonets? It's a simple question. The people were paralyzed. So what gave them that girl? What, I mean, what boldness? You can say one thing you don't want to say. They were not naive. They were probably politically stupid or they were so arrogant, so arrogant that they felt that after a hundred years of putting down protests, they were capable of doing it. And let me say this, there were people in the society who kept preaching, I don't agree, don't even look at the political actors. The man who was right here, Reverend Tim Reeves, I listened to his sermon every Sunday from the time I came home in 78. This noble man using his religion was talking against the injustice in the society. Other religious leaders all over, all over, were preaching, listening to the people. You, Mr. Tarbo, you are a religious man yourself. You know your Bible. It's like the story I heard of a man who was deeply religious. He went swimming. Always worship God. This man went swimming. And he had a cramp. He was drowning. And then the man came with a speedboat. Say, no, get on the speedboat. Get on the speedboat. He said, no, no, no. I believe in my God. You know, Jesus walk on water. I will get out of this place. You go. He's struggling in the water. After five minutes, the helicopter, they threw down the ladder. Get on. He said, no, 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 go. I believe in my righteous God. And things will be all right. When he looked, a very strong man came out swimming. Swimming. He said, hold on to me. He said, I don't want you. My Lord will protect me. So the man got, the man drowned. And he went to heaven. He said, God, you know, I worship you all the time. I pray. I go to church. I pay my arms. I was drowning. I call on you. You never rescue me. The Lord said, I sent a boat. You drove it away. I sent a helicopter. You drove that away. I sent a strong man. Don't you understand that I have those who have themselves? Here was Mr. Talbot. A graduate of Cottington, I think. An educated man. In relationship with Ahmed Sekouture of Guinea. 
Ye was the man who was traveling around Africa, who understood what was happening in Africa. Because his government, like Topman, provided passports to African freedom fighters, like Mandela and others. Ye was a man who understood the world. He had young technocrats around him. Brilliant men, on the other side, religious leaders, saying that we are listening to the cries of the people. On one side, these so-called people you're called, they call noisemakers, agitating. And you are telling me that these people did not understand what was happening in society? No, I think they understood. They understood. But you know, there's a problem with arrogance. Arrogance makes you feel superhuman. It makes you feel that you know everything. And you know what they say. Pride goes before a fall. Pride goes before a fall. They had the opportunity. Go, young people, young people, go and read the resolution from the Basa Con Congress or the Tui Party. See what the youthful members of the Tui Party stipulated in that document. Why did they not listen? Let me tell you a simple story. We were, monitor, we were monitoring very keenly the Bikana Congress. We said the Tui Party can pull a fast one on us. They can come out with something that will take the rock from under us. All they had to do was to make Jackson Doe Secretary General, take Edward Cassidy, gave him a major position, take Jeans Babwe and all these people, put them in there, and say to the people, we have included the people's children. You cannot be on the outside and say to us, we are a little clique. We waited. We waited. And then they came with the announcement. Secretary General, Mr. X, Morovia, Monserrado County. Treasurer, Mr. X, Monserrado County. This person, Monserrado County. We look at each other. These people have just dug their own graves. They can't win no elections. <laughs> So, it was not us. We were opposition. We were opposition. We could not say to Mr. Talbot, do these things, because they won't, listen, they won't listen to us. Some of the smartest young men from the University of Liberia, very smart men, they were called to the mansion. And one of the two party members looked at these young dynamic boys. He said, you are questioning us? Who are you? And you over there, who's your father? The poor boy called some name. Somebody from Lofa. He said, look at this irresponsible Jigga flea. <laughs> you are the people who are demanding. This was the attitude. And we hope and pray that no leader or no collection of leaders will emerge in this country with such arrogance. We hope and pray. <laughs> Thank you. Well, unless we separate from Satan, that may not happen. But uh, anyway, the next question. Why do you think that the Liberian people gave power to Taylor during the time of the election, knowing his track record of what he was like, as compared to, for example, yourself who ran during that time and others? What's your thinking on that? First, let me deal with Satan. You see, man creates man creates the devil in his image, and nobody has seen Satan. But we believe in the heart, our hearts of hearts, that human being can change. Nobody is born evil or wicked. Society, society conditions people to go certain ways. 